Well, it's good to be back after however long it took me to make this video. Probably a long time considering it will have taken me 369 episodes all reviewed on an individual basis from a blind look. I was originally going to make this video about Sergeant Frog, another really long episodic anime. I even got about 5 episodes in, and I might return to it at a later date, but as I was writing for it, I thought... But what about Gintama, though? It's not like I don't want to watch Sergeant Frog. If this video goes over well in the future, I might do just that. But considering Gintama is one of the highest rated anime of all time as an episodic comedy series, I felt like I just had to check it out before anything else. Also, Gintama will probably get me more views in the algorithm, so that's what I'm going with for now. It's true I've never seen a single episode of Gintama as I'm writing this, but hopefully by the end I'll be a true fanboy. Now I know a few of you may be thinking that I'm taking this from LS Mark, but <laughs> I made my fairy tale video first, which was basically a retrospective of all the episodes there, so <laughs> in the end, he, he kind of ripped off me. Yeah, that, that, that's what I'll go with when I, well, I basically do the exact same format. Ah, uh, yeah, so anyway, yeah, I haven't seen a single episode, and every one of these reviews is going to be my blind thoughts after just seeing it. For now, all I really know is it's about a freelance samurai or something going on odd job adventures in the future? Uh, let's start with episode one. The basic idea of this episode seems to be showing a regular situation the characters get into before diving more into the weird stuff, though it's obvious the series as a whole is supposed to be hilariously dumb. I can already get a good feeling for how the characters interact, and I find them all really funny. To give some exposition, the main three characters are Gintoki, Kagura, and Shinpachi going on odd jobs to try and get money in any way possible. They live in a world where samurai are kind of outlawed thanks to aliens called the Amanto taking over the world, but as a former samurai, Gin just kind of manages. The fact they all have obvious skill but are also incredibly incompetent is funny in a similar vein to One Punch Man, though in the case of Gintoki and the gang, they actually have the ability to lose. The dynamics are well set. Gin is the cynical but straightforward type, Shinpachi is the more logical realist, and Kagura is kinda just off in her own little world half the time. Their uniting features appear to come in their general cheapskate nature and willingness to get into anything if the cash or the heart is in the right place. Also like in One Punch Man, it appears there's a much more serious story going on in the background with the secret police, the Shin Sangumi, but even even there, it's still incredibly silly, and I expect the gang will run into them a lot. Even the minor side characters introduced in this episode all have tons of personality, and I really want to see them all more. It's always nice to see characters that either don't really give a fuck or are incredibly morally gray, especially as main leads. The story was pretty simple, mostly focusing on trying to help a client to act stronger to get the deed to his house back, but I think it definitely works with the kind of series being done. Pretty good as far as first episodes go. Apparently though, this and the second part are some of the only filler episodes in the series. I don't know why you'd start a series series with filler, but at least it isn't bad filler. Weirdly, these are supposed to be bad episodes from what I've heard, but if these are supposed to be bad, I guess there's plenty of great stuff in store. Looking at the second part to this opening act, I can tell that while the first half was meant to show the funnier side of the series, the second half was meant to show the more uplifting one. I know I keep comparing it to One Punch Man, but it really is the best example, though I guess I'd be more comparing One Punch Man to Gintama since it came out years earlier, but you get my point. Actually giving an arc for the client that Gin and Co were helping in such a short amount of time was admirable, and I think the writers pulled it off pretty well. It was a simple message of bettering yourself for those you love, and remembering a painful past for a better future, and it was executed well thanks thanks to it still being plenty silly enough to not distract from the regular tone of the show. I mean, they changed the main conflict from trying to help a down-on-his-luck guy get his house back to stopping a giant earthquake machine from destroying the city, so of course it's still going to be absolutely absurd. I also just like the gags and pacing here more than in the first episode. With less character intros and more interactions, the progression felt a lot more natural. Same can be said for comedic timing, since we're antiquated with the characters now. I think from now on I'm going to start talking about two-parter episodes at the same time so it doesn't come off as weird from this point forward, but yeah, I think I'd rank it above the first episode so far. Oh right, by the way, I'm ranking all of these episodes as I go, and we'll give an overall ranking at the end of this video. A weird thing I've noticed with tons of comedy anime is that they start with an episode introducing the status quo for the show, and then transition into an origin story for the characters, and the Gintama anime is no different in this regard. Having the first manga canon episode centered around Gin and Shinpachi meeting for the first time. This episode expanded much more on Shinpachi by showing his connection to his sister, via them both being trained and subsequently trying to keep alive the dojo their father left them after he died. It's sweet seeing the lengths Shin and his sister would go to to keep their memory from the place, but it's also just a 
is satisfying to watch Shin understand that what matters most is the happiness of those he cares about, rather than the memories from something causing them pain. Gin was also incredibly funny in how he tried to shove off responsibility for his actions, but as soon as they became his client, he'd be willing to do anything to help them. I think it shows best how he can be sort of dumb and abrasive, but he also has a strong sense of loyalty to those he wants to help, and that kind of balance makes for great comedy. It also gives a reason for why Shinpachi would want to follow him in the first place. Honestly, this probably would have been a better intro, considering it only introduced three members of the cast, and therefore had more time to flesh out their personalities and leave more mystery as to who's going to enter the stage next. Whew, trying to describe the plots of episodes has already started to become difficult for me, but here goes. Shinpachi and Gin meet Kagura for the first time after she killed a few people for a gang of punch perm Yakuza that are out to get her now. Shinpachi spends the rest of the episode trying to help her get away, while Gin is on a constant search for a copy of Shonen Jump. Then he helps the two out and she comes to work with them. The best part of the episode was obviously getting to know more about Kagura as a member of the Yato clan, a band of super powerful mercenaries. The fact that she's trying to change her regular tendencies for the sake of herself was an unexpected bit of character I didn't expect from her, and that only makes the fact that her simple ways lead her to trouble all the more funny. I also enjoyed seeing more of Shinpachi's sympathetic side, as that wasn't really as well described in the two-parter opening. Gen looking for Jump Across Ido was also much funnier than I expected, as was the weird director segment in between breaks. Pretty good first episode we got that really expanded upon the lore of the world and where Gin came from. Knowing the man was some kind of war hero really puts into perspective how he must be feeling after it's all said and done. It also explains his philosophy's purpose with some insight, that being to protect the things he specifically cares about above everything else, as he's kinda lost tons of friends in battle thanks to the war. He's really matter-of-fact about the situation and understands when he's lost, unlike his old friend Katsura, who has his heart in the right place, but he goes about trying to avenge his friends in a way that won't really benefit them, just kind of being a terrorist. Knowing Gin is so matter-of-fact about the loss does really show off his main character traits, choosing to move on and care about the present rather than dwelling on the past. It's not that he doesn't care, it's just that he'd rather focus on living his best life instead of constantly trying to fight against the world he lives in. The man just wants to grill, for God's sake. Maybe an occasional fistfight on the side. The Shinsengumi were also reintroduced in this episode, and they were moderately entertaining. I'm sure the idea of Gin's past will get brought back up quite a lot in future episodes, along with possibly the idea of them being associated with terrorists, and hopefully Hopefully they'll be just as humorous and insightful to the world. Getting a bit more back to the status quo than the last few episodes, instead of introducing a new recurring character, this was another episode about helping a guy out. I mean, it starts as them running into a criminal trying to see his daughter at a concert and him taking Kagura hostage, but we all know that they could easily escape or beat his ass at any time of day. Gin and Kagura are implied to just be doing this because they want to, and while it may be their job to do basically anything for money, I was still glad that every situation where they help people wouldn't be exactly the same as the first episode. I don't know how many more unconventional methods they can have for getting clients, but considering this instance led to them having a high-speed chase for the hell of it, I wouldn't mind them keeping it up. It's also good that the show continues to remind me that it can actually pull off these kinds of action scenes well, mixed in with the comedy. I'd expect no less from Sunrise, who helped make Samurai Shampoo and Cowboy Bebop. As was the second episode, this scenario deals mostly with familial bonds and the simplicity of being there for those who care about you, and I still find it impressive how well the show can get you to care about these people that only show up once. I don't know, maybe I'm just impressed because I seem to be watching watching more and more anime where they can't really even get you to like the protagonist because they have no motivation or character. Since the guy is breaking out of prison for a promise, I would have liked if maybe they had expanded beyond he's a murderer. I don't know, I just think it could have drawn back into the plot a little more, but it's a one-off episode, so I get why they choose not to. Only other note I have is that Shinpachi's an idol worshipper. Moving on. Typical situation about the gang trying to catch a big land octopus for a ton of cash from a rich dude. Okay, saying it out loud doesn't make it sound normal, but by Gintama standards, it's pretty tame. This episode was funny, especially how Gin and the others decided to try and catch the octopus using a large jar, and it actually works. But beyond that, I just didn't find this episode too memorable. There was a good moment between Gin and the guy hiring them, having a bit of a standoff between each other's moral codes that I liked, but besides that, I'm having a bit of trouble recalling the events of the episode beyond they look for the octopus, it turns into a monster, there's a standoff of ideas between Gin and Guy, and they all kill it. This kind of merges with my recall of that one episode of El Tigre where they find lost pets, get them lost again, and then return them, which was honestly a funnier idea, so yeah, probably the least standout so far. At least the worst of it still hasn't actually been bad yet. 
first episode did not solely focus on the situation Gin is involved in from the start. Instead, we get to see more of the Shin Sengumi and how they try to keep up their public image, which isn't an easy task when they easily blow up at people and are strutting around everywhere with a camera crew. Other than them, the greater focus of the episode is their leader, Kondo, whom they all respect. That's actually a drunk stalker of Shinpachi's sister. The way he always appears in the dumbest ways never fails to make me laugh, and considering how violent Shin's sister can be when she wants to, it of course leads to some golden interactions. The episode shows Gin isn't always needed in an episode for it to be both interesting and enjoyable. He even helps out in the second act because he's so scared of being replaced as the main character. I noticed at the start of the episode that they didn't play the intro, and it was actually intentional for Gin to point out, and the level of fourth wall breaking is just the right amount of stupid to be entertaining. The second act is more about Gin fighting Kondo for Shin's sister, and that's mostly just for a gag showing he doesn't really care about being honorable if it means winning a fight, in this case tampering with a weapon he gave to Kondo to beat him easily. Usually in most shonen, cheating would be seen as dishonorable and bad, and the other characters react that way, but Gin only did it because he wanted the battle to be over painlessly, since he found the whole duel stupid. It's just another example of him doing what he thinks is honorable and helpful, even if no one else sees it the same way. The fact Kondo is supposed to be super strong as a commander only makes the fight and his desperation over Shin's sister even better. If I were gonna show Gintama to someone, I'd probably start with this. Everyone is very much in character, and almost all of the jokes hit. There was also another small section about Gin as a teacher. Not much to note beyond it being alright. As I expected, this episode was a direct follow-up to the last, having to do with the Shin Sengumi getting in an uproar over what happened to the commander, thinking Gin is just an ultra-talented swordsman that takes all their forces to beat. Gin is doing a job during all of this, but it's more about how the Shin Sengumi are so incompetent they can't find him when the guy is working in broad daylight, instead having him literally have to show them. We also got to see that the vice commander Hijikata may have known Gin before, another interesting note to add to a possible future episode. Once again, Gin protects his own version of honor by not killing with the sword given to him, instead opting to break the other, rendering it useless. It's a good example of Gin's mentality. He wants to protect those he finds precious, and he sees most battles he gets into as dumb, as he never tries to harm the one he's fighting. Instead, he opts for a way to finish the fight as soon as possible to where the other person isn't really harmed, but they also can't fight anymore. You don't see that kind of mentality often, and it's portrayed well here. I've also been noticing more and more that some episodes will start with an event that seems like it has nothing to do with the plot, but it ends up having an effect on the rest of the episode. In this case, Gin having an off-the-rails game of rock-paper-scissors to decide who works for some guy. It's also where some of the best comedy comes from, with the guy randomly making himself look better, and the guys being able to read each other's minds for no reason. Little stuff like that really helps make the show more charming and uniquely weird to me, just having a ton of one-off jokes you wouldn't expect. Well, it took 10 episodes, but the show finally introduced the big-ass dog in the opening. Kagura names it Sadaharu, and the plot of the episode is basically Shinpachi and Gin trying to get rid of it before gaining a connection with it. Kagura also has a whole backstory about a traumatic experience with her strength where she killed a rabbit, so Sadaharu is the perfect fit for her, even if a lot of the time he's just attacking her when she thinks he's playing. There's not really much I can say about Sadaharu as a character because, you know, he's a dog, but it's cute seeing the gang bond with him, especially with Gin, who went from seeing Sadaharu as nothing more than a burden, to a burden that he liked. Sadaharu was also referred to by that animal-loving prince from the episode with the land octopus as a god dog, so that'll probably come back into another event where multiple different people want to take Sadaharu away. It'll also be interesting to see how Gin and the others try to tame him when it's been shown just how wild he is. Another pretty simple concept here. Old pervert guy is on his deathbed in the same hospital as Shinpachi, and wants the gang to find his first love before he dies. Apparently it was because he felt guilty for her kindness towards him, getting her fired from the place she worked at, so he only wanted to apologize before he died broke with no one to say goodbye to. It's sad, but we don't really know that till the end of the episode. Up till then, it's a bunch of running gags about strawberry milk, memory, and disbelief that pad out the runtime. Not that it's bad padding, the show is a comedy, it just went on a bit long is all. Worst thing I can say is that some jokes went on for a while longer than necessary. The love also turned out to be Otose, the barkeeper, and those kind of twists are always enjoyable to watch. I haven't mentioned her in any previous episodes yet since she has a pretty small role, but she's cool. All I can say about her in general is that she's entertaining in her own old landlord way, and gives Gin the spirit to get out of bed in the morning, that being by always asking for rent. The short reunion of the old guy and Otose is touching for what it is, and it ends the episode on a high note. Another introductory chapter, in this case showing us Catherine, the new assistant to Otose, who turns out to be a cat burglar. Get it? 
Because she's got cat ears. But yeah, I never really thought about how Otose is actually quite a generous person until now, but she is. She lets Gin stay on the second floor of her bar without rent, and she's willing to help those she sees in need. She's harsh and old, but she's also caring and kind. We even get to see the moment Otose and Gin meet, where she allowed him to eat the offering she brought for her dead husband, as he apparently told Gin to look after her. Another good, simple episode. Like most episodes, this starts off as a pretty regular mission, having the gang go to an Amanto bar to try and find a club-going daughter of their client. However, like most episodes, it doesn't go as expected, and the girl is found out to be taking drugs, leading to the space pirates that operate the distribution of those drugs, thinking Gin and Ko are rebels like Katsura. So Shin and Kagura get taken while Gin is saved by Katsura coincidentally, and obviously, they go to save them. The highlight of this episode was probably seeing Gin have a nightmare about not being able to protect his friends from the war, showing he feels a similar thing at the thought of the new friends he's made meeting a similar fate. Katsura even recognizes this and knows just how attached Gin has really gotten to the two, leading to their prison break, which is said to get the eyes of every space pirate around to go and kill them, so I'm looking forward to seeing how that pans out. One of the most sentimental episodes so far. As far as presentation, so far, this is the most unique, deciding to have three completely unrelated stories put together in one episode. The first expanded on the somewhat moral grayness of the Shinsengumi, trying to protect an official who is most likely involved with the space pirate from last episode, who also looks down on humans. It's mostly just to show the bond of the Shinsengumi to Kondo, who helped bring them together in the first place. Pretty heartwarming, and it was really satisfying to see the official tied up. Second short is about Kagura meeting a princess and trying to have a regular day out with her, forming a bond they'll keep while apart. Again, nice and comforting. Last short is pure comedy, with Gin and Co trying to cook, which goes about as well as you'd think it would. Thankfully, though the shorts were varying lengths, none felt too overplayed from the other, and with each story having different ratios of comedy to heart, it all balances out pretty decently. Another Sadaharu focused episode, this time about training him to enter a weird pet show, with Katsura also joining in using his pet... bird... Uh, costumed man... thing... Elizabeth. I'm thankful we got more development on this front, acknowledging that Sadaharu is quite hard to tame and most of the time just does what he wants, but he also cares about Gin and the others in his own dogly way. Don't really even know if that's a word, but if it isn't, there it is, bitches. Still no development on the whole god-dog thing, and the ending felt a bit rushed with the setup of a champion that gets defeated immediately, but it's made up for with the odd charm of Elizabeth. Kinda wish we got a little bit more explanation as to why Katsura was on the weird pet show in the first place, but that's neither here nor there. I don't know what the fuck this thing is, but it sure as hell is entertaining. Pretty average other than that. Well, here's a character I didn't think would be coming back so soon. The focus here is on Hasegawa, the guy that went against the prince all the way back in episode 7, as he tries to get a job after being fired for, well, beating up the prince to stay true to his own principles. Gin gives him advice throughout the episode about what he can do, and how he shouldn't blame his sunglasses, one of the only remnants left of him, for why he can't get a job. Instead, it's later revealed that the sunglasses just represent Hasegawa's true self that he genuinely shows to others, something he doesn't do when he takes the glasses off, though it may get him more job interviews. Really, the idea of staying true to yourself and your morals, even if that keeps you from being in the place you want, if it makes you happy, is a more complex idea I don't think I've seen portrayed in media that much before. It does kinda accentuate Gin's lifestyle perfectly though, and the intended lesson itself is realistic, if not a bit bittersweet in regards to the trade-off many do have to face at some point, so I can get down with that. Once again, we're treated to the story and aftermath of another person involved with the War for Earth 20 years ago. In this case, we follow Gin helping the well-known inventor Gin Guy, who lost his son to war. Having always loved creating machines, that love and gaze faded as he made more dangerous robots to fight with, leading to the son going off to battle in place of the bots, subsequently dying. Unlike what his son would have wanted, he continued to make those types of robots to plot a revenge strike with one of Gin's old war friends. What makes it so tragic isn't that his son died because his father made weapons robots, but as Gengai tried to avenge his son, he only continued to make himself unhappy doing the exact same thing, only repeating the cycle and not truly allowing for him to move on. The same thing can be applied to Gin's old friend, who, with no real purpose, continues to try to kill and seek vengeance he's never satisfied with, having nothing to fight for. And you know your boy loves some character development for Gin when he once again has to confront his past while embracing his current morals. With Gengai's subsequent defeat, he sees just how much he really messed up for such a long time and regains his smile doing what truly makes him happy. Mixed in with the humor of Kagura and Okita of the Shin Sengumi during this, I'd consider it the best episode so far, finding the perfect balance with additional world building and more interesting characters to get to know. 
Going a bit more light than the last, heavier episode, here the gang teams up with the Shin Sengumi for the ultimate task they can never accomplish on their own. Catching a perverted Robin Hood that steals panties from girls and gives them out to people that can't get a date after he steals some from Shinpachi's sister. Sometimes a simple plot does wonders for comedy, and seeing both factions take the situation so damn seriously while failing spectacularly is just pure gold, especially with Kondo. He and Shinpachi are both straight men and the odd ones out in different ways, so watching them both get messed around with by the other as everyone explodes from misplaced landmines had me laughing harder than I have so far in this marathon. I also love how there was an entirely different plot Shinpachi was leading up to, but his sister immediately dashes all his dreams by attacking him. Kinda wish we got to see the face of the panty thief, but on a comedic level, I love every second of this because it's pure dumb fun. Also, can we just appreciate my man from the Shin Sengumi, Yamazaki, who makes an effort to play tennis even when on a moonlit rooftop in a suit of armor? Truly an inspiration to us all. Hell yeah, baby! The moment we've all been waiting for in a long-running anime. Beach episode! Or, should I say, more like half an episode of trying to get to the beach, and another half trying to fight a giant monster for a reward from some fried noodle salesman. But that doesn't fit on the sign, so I'm calling it a beach episode, damn it. Kinda glad we're getting more of Hasegawa, since him trying to tell a heartfelt story about the ocean and nobody really caring is probably the highlight of the episode for me. His stoic yet usually pathetic nature helps him bounce off Gin rather well. Besides that, the bit with the sea monster at the end is also cute, though I feel like with Sadaharu being there, he could have contributed to the episode episode in some way beyond just sort of existing with the others. Thought I'd have more to say, but nah, not all of these are gonna have that much of an in-depth analysis. It's a goddamn beach episode, and there's only so many times I can say how good or bad something is before it becomes repetitive. Alright, so I can confirm, the episodes where the Gin crew and the Shin Sengumi work together are becoming some of my favorites. In this case, Gin and Co dress up as exorcists for the Shin Sengumi after a ton of their members start falling ill for whatever reason, leading to a bunch of Scooby-Doo-esque shenanigans trying to figure out who the ghost is. With any good shonen protagonist, they also have to have a random irrational fear, so for Gin along with Hijikata, they're scared of ghosts. I don't know just how often that fear could really be used, but nonetheless, the implementation here was hilarious, with the two constantly trying to hide from the presumed ghost in the dumbest ways possible. The face game was on point for this episode, and it still amazes me just how many funny expressions the animation team can continue to come up with on a consistent basis. Don't know why, but once again, out of nowhere, here's a two-story episode with completely unrelated narratives. The first is your typical Hey Arnold plot. Some rich asshole wants to build a golf course on top of a lake belonging to a Kappa Amanto, and the guys decide to help him out since he's still waiting for a most likely dead girl to come back and swim freely with him. They could have dealt with the issue just by beating up the guy or something, but to go just one step farther, they decide to dress up as Kappas to scare them off. It's such a little difference that makes the part so much better. The second half is pure insanity. So so Gin breaks his old Japanese fan and tries to find a new one during the hot summer sun, but when he thinks he finds one, he uncovers that it's actually a giant cat toy that dispenses gold wanted by some Nazi Stroheim looking motherfucker and his Gimp assistants. Gin then saves the world and gets a broken old fan as a gift. Now this is what I want from entertainment, something so fucking insane out of such a mundane situation even I can barely comprehend it. If the first segment was good, the second one made the episode great. With this episode, I think every character in the opening has been shown, and what a way to end, having a dominatrix ninja with poor eyesight. Basically, an assassin falls through Gin's roof and tries to stay with him while laying low until she can rescue her taken comrades. She has a weird obsession with Nato and can't seem to keep her fucking glasses on for more than five seconds before losing them again. And you know the old story, it starts out as a cover, but as the guy continually tries to push her away by various means of humiliation, it leads to her only wanting to be bound by him more. I don't know why, but it's it's weird to me describing the completely serious character who doesn't seem to realize just how dumb they look most of the time. I guess that's what adds to her charm, considering we haven't really been introduced to a character like that yet. Her sometimes deadpan delivery definitely helped in the entire scene of her making up scenarios to get Gin to believe he's just doing regular wedding stuff. That scene was great. I guess she's Gin's love interest now, though it's clearly completely one-sided, but as long as her running gag of losing her glasses and Nato don't get too overplayed in future appearances, she'll hopefully stay a likable character. Character. She's clearly goofy without noticing, and as long as that isn't overplayed, I probably won't have any issues with her. But you do always gotta be careful when riding the fine line of goofy and annoying. <laughs> isn't that right, Jar Jar? 
Once again, we're faced with an old friend of Gintoki's from the Amanto War. The difference with this guy, Sakamoto, is that instead of trying to look back on the past like Katsura, or only create chaos in the present like Takasugi, Sakamoto has his eyes set on the future, and plans ahead rather than thinking solely about what's currently in front of him, leading to him having many scatterbrained moments. As an optimist, he tries to see the best in any given situation, and in the case of him leaving Earth to form a trading company, he didn't see it as much as abandoning his home or anything like that, but rather the ends to means in order to make peace with the Amanto while helping Earth. He didn't see any reason to continue the bloodshed, so he took a more philanthropic approach, and that's honorable in its own way, just as Gin tries to live his best life on Earth, considering he does really care about it. The basic plot isn't quite as important, just being about Kagura getting a ticket to space, the ship gets hijacked, and the guys all try to get help on a deserted planet. The story is more used as a device to convey the backstory and feelings of the characters, along with their approaches to life, rather than focusing on what's going on in the moment as much. Funnily enough, matching with Sakamoto personality in a subtle but efficient way. Gin and Katsura accidentally say the wrong thing to the wrong people, leading to them becoming a part of a drag bar. The main part of this story isn't as much about that, though, as it is about the relationship between the main man mom and his son. It's an unconventional relationship with those that want to mock it, but in the end, they both are able to rise above that to only really care about being true to themselves and their wills. The pet prince guy also shows up again, but he's mostly just there to provide a third act conflict for the son. I feel like these guys are gonna appear in more episodes, they have a ton of personality, and the interactions with getting Katsura addressing his girls was also fun. Okay, so at first I thought this was setting itself up to be a clip show, and I thought that I could just skip and immediately put it at the bottom of the list because clip show, but instead I got so much more than I ever could have imagined. It goes from wanting to reminisce on memories to a battle of mental fortitudes for a hot pot in front of them. The gang is supposed to be celebrating the arrival of their third core of the anime, which is like a block of 13 episodes, but instead they play a masterful battle of wits for the meat in the hot pot. No greater battle has ever been fought in Gintama, and I shudder at the thought that there may be anything greater. Getting serious, it's an alright episode, pretty middling overall. It goes on for a bit too long in my opinion. The entire bit with Catherine and Otose just kind of had me wondering why the episode was still going on for so long. Not bad, especially in comparison to a clip show, but not amazing either. Ooh, a Shinpachi-focused episode. Don't see too many of those. Specifically, he and the gang are working at a convenience store when an old friend of Shin's tries to shoplift, being in a gang that disrespects him just like kids did before Shin and his sister would come to save him. The episode is mostly about fixing your own mistakes that led to your friends being off worse. In this case, Shin having abandoned the friend in a time of need, leaving him longing for a new cause to follow, that being another permed gang, though completely separate from the one in episode 4. I like this episode. It was straight to the point, and the race to try and get Shin's friends out of the gang was compelling. Though there was a big missed opportunity here to have Sadaharu as one of the rides. How do you miss that, riders? <laughs> Why is it that right after I said how much I enjoy the Shin Sengumi slash Gin and crew episodes, the show happened to take a bit of a break from them? W whatever, it's another episode where the story actually takes precedent over the humor. The gang finds Okita at a fighting match, and he shows them an underground circuit with a guy that's killing for money, but he and the Shin Sengumi can't do anything because the person running it is a political head. The attribute that really got to me in this episode was that not only was the guy caring for orphans with his money and pretty chill, but he actually died. I wasn't expecting for that to happen with how much his character got built up and the pure lack of death in general in Gintama, but it certainly added to the narrative, and I was glad Gan and Co. avenged him afterwards. I'm also curious to see what comes of the whole shadowy political figure thing, if anything comes of it at all. The Shinsengumi deciding to help will also most likely be another plot point. Well guys, I guess it's time you all picked up the phone, cause I called it! Kondo and the boss are called in by the secret Tendo sect to talk about what happened at the arena before, and the remainder of the episode consists of the boss constantly misconstruing any and everything around him as an assassin out to get him. Sachan is also there for some reason, and with how the boss is so paranoid and serious all the time, the two of them work together really nicely, and Kondo is kinda just there for the ride and getting called a gorilla by everyone around him. Most of the main cast other than Shinpachi make really small appearances and I don't entirely understand why, but it helps keep the episode exciting and funny throughout. I could do with more of these non-Gin focused episodes, it really adds something to the series with just how entertaining the stories can be, even without him as the main tour de force. It says a lot about how good the writing is.
Another two-parter, in the first part Kagura tries to sell off Gin's sword after he takes the shit she bought on infomercials, and in the second, the world gets taken over by giant cockroaches because the idiot prince let it out. First half was fine, Kagura can hold her own for 11 minutes, and the ending was pretty funny, but the second half is so much more memorable, I kind of forgot most of what happened in the first. Like I've said, the moments where Gintama goes off the walls are usually the moments that really shine for the series, and a story around the gang fighting giant cockroaches in their room is no exception to that. I still like the first half and the villain going after any swords he can is pretty neat, but the second shines above it. Looks like we got a mystery episode on our hands, boys, as you can tell by how Gin and Kagura are constantly changing outfits throughout. I don't even know what it is they're referencing half the time, but the pure consistency and changes was charming on its own. The plot centers around the gang helping Otsu, the pop idol Shin's obsessed with, from a threatening letter implying someone will go after her. The episode took advantage of quite a few tropes in common mystery shows, like having a figure in silhouette actually just look like that, having the detectives try to investigate a crime scene even though the police are already there, or when the main character randomly says as he got it, but he actually doesn't have a clue. We also got some development on Shin's part for why he chooses to be the leader of Otsu's fan club and all that. I'm also glad that, even as a comedy series, they didn't make the culprit someone that the audience couldn't have ever predicted. You know, like a lot of dumb mystery shows and movies like to do nowadays. I tell ya, I can't stand when a Scooby-Doo villain turns out to be someone that was only in the background for 10 seconds. So it's good Gintama didn't fall into that trap and instead went with a much more realistic answer. It appears the tropes just keep on coming, as now we've got us a memory loss plot, but honestly, it didn't go the way I expected it would at all. It started out lightheartedly enough, Gin loses his memory, and with each subsequent attempt to try and get him to remember, he ends up getting hurt even more. But by the title, You Always Remember the Things That Matter the Least, I thought Gin was going to have some revelation of the dumbest thing possible, and there were plenty of setups for that. Seeing Sadaharu, Sachan, and I thought what would finally get him would be Sakamoto flying into his house randomly, but none of it actually works. All of the interactions hid in terms of comedy, it was funny throughout, but the ending leaves us with a feeling of sadness as Gin proposes shutting down the shop entirely, unable to get back his memories. To think such a seemingly silly premise would lead to such legitimate melodrama. Is this the end? Of the Eltingville Club? I actually didn't know the answer to be sure. I mentioned I'm writing this as I watch the series, but yeah, he gets his memories back. After working at a factory that's actually a cover-up for making weapons to rebel with, not only Gin, but Kondo is also found to have memory loss of some kind. I thought maybe it was going to factor back into the factory, and how somehow they made it so both of them got amnesia, but no, they just happened to both randomly lose their memories and end up at the exact same factory, which just so happens to be a rebel base that Yamazaki was looking into. In most anime, I'd call that contrived, but in Gintama, I call that genius. Anyway, the way that Gin finds himself is by seeing how everyone seems to find him worthless or degenerate or whatever, yet they still come together to stand with and protect him when he can't do so for himself. They rally behind him because they all care and have respect for him, despite his more brash outward traits that they dislike. It's also slightly implied that seeing people get hurt also brings back memories from his past, though that's really up for debate. When all is said and done, they're all able to go back home, though Kondo gets amnesia again, and we never really get to see the characters that appeared in part 1 again, which is a shame. I think that would have made the whole standing together scene all the more powerful if they had decided to do that. A good episode nonetheless. With Gin's memories back, the only thing left to get the crew back to the status quo would be fixing their house, and to make up for, you know, running the spaceship right into it, Sakamoto sends two Carpenter brothers to help out and fix the home. I love this episode because, like episode 27 decided to go more for story, this went all in on the comedy. Having Gin and the others make absurd requests that, after Gin tells a stupid story, motivates the brothers to continue building and building until the house becomes a mix of the Pantheon and the Castle in the Sky. There's barely anything to say about the episode beyond that being what happens, and it just is hilarious. Easily one of the best non-serious episodes. Finally, the golden era of anime has arrived with the appreciation of the cat ears in 2007. With Shinpachi saving a girl by punishing a guy that worshipped an idol with cat ears, he ironically found the girl herself had those same attributes. The rest of the episode has to do with him trying to get advice on what to do and going on a date with her. The best parts aren't even necessarily those in which Shinpachi is hanging with the girl, but how everyone reacts around him. Such as Katsura and Kondo accidentally meeting after giving him terrible advice, or Gin, Kagura, and Otai all watching him from a distance and progressively getting more annoyed. Shinpachi himself is also good in the episode, having an inner con conflict about the dreams of being together with an idol, or the reality of being with a cat girl, and the sort of mental spiral he has trying to decide. The real question to ask in this whole thing is if Shimpachi stays a cherry boy for the rest of his life, or inadvertently gets the show cancelled. And... 
<laughs> no, of course not. Shinpachi is destined to be a virgin for life. Are you kidding me? He's an anime character that wears glasses. It would go against the Geneva Convention for him to have ever gotten laid. Turns out she's just a burglar, and Shin gets over it, learning that the idea of banging an anime cat girl is far from his virgin reach. The next segment is completely unrelated and has to do with the boss of the Shin Sengumi trying to kill the boyfriend of his daughter before they're both saved by Hijikata with a Mayo cannon. You may be acting as though that's something that warrants an overly detailed explanation with tons of notes about it, but that's all that needs to be said to get the point across. It was alright. This time around, there's another new character introduced in Hanako, an easily tricked country bumpkin working at the same club as Otai that gets herself involved with a phony religion that claims to grant dreams while taking away people's money. In the series, Otai has never really gotten much of an episode to shine that much on her own, besides maybe episode 3, and I gotta say, I really like her, and this episode was good at showing both her sweet and incredibly aggressive done with this bullshit side with a clever scheme that she and the others are able to see right through, though she's more interested in taking the money to try and build the dojo, so she's also got a morally gray side, which I like quite a bit as well. I hope to see more of Hanako too. The way she epically fails at everything is funny in its own right. I believe this is the first holiday-centric installment in the series, and what better to begin with than Christmas and New Year's? Perfect for watching in preparation for a video that'll come out in May or June. The first half about Gin taking an odd job for Santa is just perfect for working with the average scenario set up in the show, and the way he's kind of portrayed as just a guy that gives cheap gifts to people because he's completely out of the times adds to the comedy when Gin has them try and deliver these cheap toys dressed up like thieves. The second half has to do with Gin and another guy fighting over a double issue of Shonen jump on New Year's. It doesn't actually have that much to do with the plot other than in a few select unrelated bits in between, but you still get the general spirit with this episode as a whole. I wonder what holiday they'll cover next, if at all, because I'm a sucker for themed specials. Continuing the holiday theme, here's another two-parter about building snow sculptures and setting off fireworks. The snow sculpture segment is nothing more than a complete spiral into madness, as most Gintama episodes are, with Gin and Kagura building a stupid statue to go against the censors. Hasegawa was also there entirely so he could throw a bunch of ice sticks at all the sculptures, and really, isn't that what Christmas is truly about? These entire cast-centered episodes really work well when put into 11 minutes, at least when it comes to jokes. Everything is much faster and plays into the absurd nature of any given episode. The fireworks part is more sentimental, showing a scene we can all relate to of a family member slowly losing his memory after giving up his dream of firework making to help his wife. The ending also hints at another aspect of getting old, and I think so far it's one of the best semi-serious half episodes. And we're back to the good old 22 minute one off with a fully Katsura focused episode. And I don't mean it like I did previously, where Gin would show up and help solve the problem halfway through. He makes a brief appearance at the end, but this is about Katsura, and how after being injured, he works at a widow's ramen shop to stay on the down low. It's another one of those encounters where Katsura starts questioning his own morals, with the widow's husband dying to rebels less like him and more like her asshole brother in laws. It's a good thing we were given time to see how he acts on his own without Gin or Elizabeth constantly by him, as him and his code of honor are still interesting on their own. The little subplot of Elizabeth going around and looking for him at the same time was also a nice touch. Here we go with another classic trope. Daddy's come to take his little princess back to where she belongs, but she doesn't want to leave. The Gintama part comes in when, instead of having a regular conversation about going back, Kagura and her father have a super destructive battle with some good set usage that was a bit lacking in a few other fights. It also should be noted that another reason Kagura doesn't want to leave is because her father has always been off fighting a Manto like some kind of Mandalorian. Is that what the Mandalorian does? I, I don't know, I've been too busy watching Gintama. But anyway, his absence means she's never really had the figure to look up to like she has for Gin. That lack of a father figure also most likely contributed to her stone will and battle tendency. It says quite a lot about her character, and it says even more about Gin's character when he allows Kagura to go. Implying he knows that she wants to stay, but also hopes she can live a more normal life for herself on her home planet. The scene is tough, but the decision does still make sense to an extent from the dad's perspective, since he just saved her from an alien xenomorph looking creature and he still does worry for her. I'm intrigued as to how this story will conclude. 
Continued from last time, this targets the emotional reaction everyone's facing from the decision Gin and the father have made. Kagura is clearly emotionally affected by the ordeal and still doesn't want to leave, caring for her friends even if they don't show up to see her off. Her father wants to make amends for barely ever being there for her, but his way of doing so is twisted and involves trying to get her to abandon her friends by thinking they don't care. Shinpachi feels like he's lost a family member and tries to get her back, though he's unable to see that Gin wants to do the same, but goes against it to continue to hope she and her father can make up. All of those emotions collide when the alien from before breaks out and everyone rushes to try and help out, and there's still one more part to go, so... In the end of this free part saga, the most important thing isn't as much about the fight itself, but rather what the fight represents. There's plenty of tension trying to get Kagura out of the beast when she's sucked in, but the real thing to focus on is that Kagura has grown from the roots of her heritage as a bloodthirsty species, and was able to change for the better to help others. Not only that, but Gin expresses how he truly sees Shinpachi and Kagura as his family, having never really experienced that for himself as a child. Everyone grows in this episode, and while it was clear there were more subtle changes going on in each episode, to visibly see it is a treat in of itself. Also, we got a taste of foreshadowing with the mention of Kagura's brother, and that helps seal the quality for me. Getting back to a more low-key environment after the longest continued story so far, it's a simple battle between the girls of the series to try and replace Kagura as the heroine of the series while she hides to see how they'll react to her being gone. It was okay, I can't think of much to say about it. As a cooldown from a longer story, it does its job just fine, not really stand out either. I'm more interested in the plot that started afterwards about Elizabeth being taken and all the others dressing up as ninjas to try and rescue her. With Elizabeth missing in action, Katsura needs the help of the Gin crew and Satchan to get her back, in this case by learning how to be ninja so they can break her out. I enjoy anything that likes to make fun of Power Rangers and other such media, though I guess Super Sentai would be the more appropriate term in this instance. The way they all have stupid-ass abilities like Shinpachi just being a guy no one notices because he's invisible to society, or Katsura randomly throwing curry at people really cracks me up. Having those kind of dumb abilities is perfect for a random game show trap hall of obstacles. I also wasn't expecting the reappearance of the seemingly minor character Gin fought against for some manga back during the New Year's episode, so I assume he'll be appearing more. The one scene I think is really worth talking about, though, is when Katsura is looking for Elizabeth afterwards, he somehow finds another random family of whatever Elizabeth is with a human wife. I don't entirely understand the implications with that, but I'm not sure I like it, goddammit. After a long time waiting in anticipation to Noah's backstory, here we're shown what Sadaharu is and why he was left at the door of Gin and Co. When referring to God Dog back in his introduction, it meant protector of the gods, and by feeding him strawberry milk, Kagura inadvertently turns him into the beast mode that he goes into when protecting something. The idea has potential as far as fights or conflicts during future episodes go, however limited it may seem to an extent. The shrine girls that come to help out who initially left Sadaharu have personality as well, though we don't get too much time to see the them interact with the crew. Pretty heartfelt with the links the gang went to to try and help Sadaharu, probably the best episode sending around him so far. The others don't really hit as much for me. Another episode with the former Shrine Maiden sisters, or at least one of them, who is having a battle with Otai to try and stay at the hostess club they're working for. She's pretty much the exact same as Otai, except a bit more outwardly wicked, and I gotta say, I was just kinda not a big fan of this episode. Kondo and Otai herself were funny enough in it, and the idea was kinda interesting, but I got bored of the concept early on, and it really felt like an 11 minute story stretched into a full 22 minute one. The Shrine Sister also just wasn't engaging much at all. The only thing I really remember about her is that I can say her name in a Watto voice from Star Wars Episode 1. Ade! Kinda weak, all things considered. I still don't think Gintama has really had a bad episode yet, but this is kind of a low point. Just boring. Oh, would you look at that, an episode centering around the world pandemic- uh, Pollen outbreak in Edo. Gin and the guys think the person behind it is this demon looking Amanto named Hetero living next door, so they investigate. The setting was perfect for showing the talents of the voice cast, as they're all given some of their best comedic performances here. Another good example of that is the disconnected short in the beginning, where Gin is unable to move, so the VA has to carry the scene all on his own, and he does a pretty good job, and just saying, even if it would seem lazy from an animation perspective, I would totally watch an entire episode about Gintoki being unable to move while the most amazing stuff happens next to him or something. The plot of, oh, he's not as bad as we thought he was, is quite overdone and easily messed up, but throughout the plot, it's made so obvious that Hetero is a nice guy that it doesn't really bother me. Surprised there was never an actual reason for the excessive pollen in the air. That looks like a bit of an oversight since it's said to be worse than regular pollen. Besides that, I don't really have any major complaints for this. 
starting to get used to having these two-parter episodes come up randomly, but anyway, first has to do with Hijikata being tracked by some assassins, and constantly being thwarted by Gin being in the mere same presence. Their interactions are quite hilarious, and you can tell the mangaka had these two as some of the original characters thought up for the series, with how well they bounce off and complement each other. The second half is also good and simple. Kagura meets an old guy that wants to play Kick the Can, and everyone joins in. It's nice to see shows tell people it's okay to not conform to the standard of adulthood, and that they can still be children at heart. That's a pretty important lesson that I've rarely seen other than, I guess, on Gravity Falls. Jolly good show. With how often it said Hasegawa and Gin bet and lose, I suppose it was only a matter of time before we got a full-blown gambling episode. And was it worth it? I mean, it was okay. I'm actually a huge fan of gambling anime, especially Kaiji, which is one of my favorite anime ever. But when the series is a comedy, having a gambling episode does take away from one of the most important aspects, that being stakes. Sure, there are stakes placed in this episode, but we know everything's going to be alright since the episode hasn't really had that aura about it up to that point. It's also okay to have a gambling anime without stakes as long as the characters are enjoyable or the way they win is creative. No Game No Life is a perfect example of that, and I like Gin and Hasegawa, but a lot of jokes in this episode after the halfway point have to do with either really Japanese things or Mahjong, and I can handle the former, but I've got no clue how to play Mahjong. The person they play against is an obvious reference to Akagi, a gambling anime about Mahjong, but when you don't know how to play, like me, it can get confusing trying to get invested in others playing. That's why I like anime like Kaiji, which instead of choosing confusing, pre-established games, comes up with simple challenges that gain complexity as the competition continues. The same applies to No Game No Life. I can still enjoy the episode to an extent, but as a person without knowledge on Mahjong, the second half kind of fell through when it came to me specifically, and with no stakes in it to get invested with either, the episode just doesn't have that much to offer. First technically filler episode since the first, and it's wonderful. Some of my favorite situations in comedy series are when multiple characters have a discussion about what they want to do with something, or how they'll do something, followed by a skit where hilarity ensues. It's a formula that always gets me to laugh whether it's on Gumball, here, or even Avatar. Yeah, you know that one episode of Avatar everyone points to as the worst? I like that one, but I'm going off track. As the start of a new season, this is a metasode about the whole cast trying to come up with ways to entice viewers and get better ratings. The pace is exactly how it should be with a breakneck speed and jokes flinging constantly, so even if you don't like the ones they told, the next one has already made you forget. The staff has really gotten good at mimicking the mangaka, and this is such an improvement from the first filler. Good old baby left at the doorstep that looks like the main protagonist, so everyone thinks he had a one-night stand trope. Pretty typical way of going about it, but fun nonetheless. The scenes of Gin actually growing with the child while either trying to make it someone else's problem or find the true mother kind of reminded me of when the gang first got Sadaharu. And in a similar fashion, I like the interactions here as well. The scene with Sachan specifically was great. As a two-parter, there's some mystery to who the woman that left the baby is and why the grandfather wants him so bad, so looking at the next part... Yeah, Gin didn't actually knock up some girl and just go about his day. It just so happens there was another guy that was an important heir to a company with naturally curly white hair, and the mother was trying to save her child from being taken by the loathing grandfather that blames the death of his son on her. Besides him, the main antagonist was this swordsman guy who could cut without seeing, but he wasn't more than a footnote in the story. Like the last episode was a standard setup, the conclusion here is just as much so. Could have been much worse or better than it was, but unlike many episodes of Gintama, the trope wasn't really subjective subverted, leading to a mostly uncreative story as a whole. Gin tries to throw away his manga and gets mistaken for an arsonist by a female firefighter named Tatsumi, so after seeing the disconnect she has with others at the department, he decides to help her catch the crook and prove she's a worthy firefighter. A large repeated phrase this time around is that of a soap bubble wanting to fly higher before it bursts, and as events play out, that idea of human fragility and the links we can reach before disaster are conveyed in the sacrifices made while saving others. The relationship between the chief and Tatsumi is reminiscent of other such families shown in the series before. Only major complaint I have is that the title promises something so much different, and I was hoping there would be a bit more to it than, whoa, the fire chief is balding. Savage. A lone mom comes looking for her son who's been living in Kabukicho and happens to come upon Gin's place by pure coincidence. Acting as a typical middle-aged Japanese mother would within the episode, Gin and crew spend most of their time looking for the son, using dumb methods that turn out to work and keeping the mother out of trouble. Interestingly, the episode takes a 180 from the story about a mother looking for her son in the city to a hostile takeover of a host club by a group of lying hosts, and we're delivered a little more world-building about the last of the four leaders of Kabukicho. The theme of shame about your own profession 
passion is highly relatable. I mean, just look at me. I'm talking about Gintama for a living. What <laughs> parents wouldn't be ashamed? But yeah, it's conveyed rather well, and the mother is enjoyable. Continued from last episode, after an anticlimactic exit of the antagonist from before, the mother follows along because, well, mothers be mothers and want to help out whenever they can. The family relation stuff is nice to see as always, albeit shorter than last episode, mostly being brought up in the latter half. The twist with who the son was was unexpected, though not entirely necessary, but the resolution was touching and kind of makes you want to ask for your mother's cooking again. Also, Gin says just do it a lot, and yes, that's an important detail, considering it came out before the Shia LaBeouf meme. Oh, and and as second parts that don't fill up a whole episode do, the next episode's plot of the pop idol Otsu becoming the Shinsengumi boss for a day is unveiled. I already explained what this episode was about before, so I won't repeat myself. Other than getting the others dressing up as a weird horseman mascot and doing as they would in that scenario, the majority of the comedy is focused on Okita and Hijikata's reactions to everything. Otsu herself does the typical trying to make the savages more civil with prettier rules and no violence trope, and it's executed decently enough. The only stuff I really feel is worth remembering from this has to do with the always well-written fights and mishaps between Okita and Hijikata that take place throughout the episode, and the foreshadowing of some new musician character that's implied to be going after the gang. Sagamoto's company is stolen by a mysterious group of thieves and hire the gang crew to try and get it back. As a filler episode, it's really the first to have that sort of feeling to it. There are a lot of callbacks to other episodes, like Sakamoto and Mutsu being there, a reusing of those toys from when Gin lost his memory, the Stalin fucker with an army of gimp suitors as the antagonist, and not to forget the Neo Armstrong Cyclone Jet Armstrong cannon with a high quality finish. Luckily, as Gin Thomas filler has shown, just because it's anime original content doesn't inherently make it bad. With so little of Sakamoto before, Beforehand. Finally getting to see him in a full episode after so long was refreshing and needed. The comedy of this episode was also as good as always, which is an achievement in terms of filler, though it doesn't stick out as much by Gintama filler standards. With luck, Mutsu and Sakamoto will get a more substantial role in a plot-based story down the line, as I believe they're fun to have on. With a sword bearing unknown power missing, and Katra supposedly being struck down by the person that took it, the Gin crew and Elizabeth set out to try and find who's behind it. With Katsura missing, it's mesmerizing to see Gin actually get serious for once, and take it as an actual threat since his longtime friend may actually have been killed. The same kind of thing goes for her Elizabeth with some of her trademark weird but effective humor. Going beyond the prime Elizabeth moments the episode has to offer, the twists were even better. Not only was it a good callback to have the blind guy from beforehand return, not only was the sword having a mind of its own a cool concept with a suspenseful fight to follow, but Gin actually isn't fully able to come out on top in the end and Kagura comes face to face with Takasugi from way back in episode 17. That one music guy is also coming to join the party and do some probably cool shit. Currently there are plenty of questions left to be answered and suspense as to what will happen next, a perfect point to leave on for the next. With Gen out of commission and Kagura captured, it's basically up to Shinpachi and Elizabeth on their own to try and defeat Takasugi to save Zura. Takasugi's also assembled this group of rebels to try and stage a coup on the entire government, leading to some more advanced action than we've previously seen. You can tell how much more serious things have gotten by how more characters have been getting stabbed, shedding blood, and so on, yet the series continues to keep its upbeat charm while doing so. It's really marvelous how the tone can be serious without the comedy added feeling inappropriate. The twists also keep coming with the reveal of the brother from before being being behind the creation of the Parasite Sword, explaining why the sister was quiet beforehand when explaining what the sword was like to the Gin crew. It looks like multiple fights are incoming, and I'm excited to see what Gin and the others are going to be able to do in this current situation, considering his injuries. Whoa, that was a lot to pack into a single episode. So basically, Shin and Kagura fight off the cronies on board until Katsura, Elizabeth, and Gin show up together to face off against Takasugi and Co. In this, we got to see the complex morality of not only Takasugi, but also Katsura, who's changed in the past several episodes. In regards to Takasugi, he tries to distance himself from those members of his past in his violent, destructive ways, but he also can't help but feel anger at their deaths, whereas with Katsura, he's sworn off violent acts of terrorism entirely, so he and Takasugi are no no longer able to let each other slip by. It's good to have those ever-evolving dichotomies, and as far as villains, Takasugi definitely has my attention. The continued fusing of the sword and the blind guy gives some well-animated scenes of him taking down ships and causing damage despite the world as a whole. Gin's screen time is mostly devoted to him receiving a sword from the sister to fight the blade with, and the emotions keep on coming as everyone starts getting into standoffs with other characters. 
Ooh, specific opening for the ending of an arc, and what an ending it was. Gen's sword fight with the blind man was legitimately impressive in comparison to everything shown before, and the themes and symbols hit just as strong, showing that creating something solely to destroy and consume the one that uses it in essence is the antithesis of what a weapon should do. But the brother was unable to see that, and instead chose to continue using his rage to fuel the parasite sword made, and of course when the sister crafted a sword for Gin to use in order to protect others, it favored him. As the user is the real factor that should determine a weapon's use, and that ties back into why Gin generally uses a wooden sword. He holds the true morals of a samurai by choosing to not kill when possible, and instead uses his skills with a seemingly basic item to fend off those that would come between him and those he cares about. Seeing Katsura and Gin team up again was also so overdue, and finally those pirates from before so many episodes ago finally made good on the promise that they made to go after the two again. Can't wait to see what more is done with Takasugi and the others, as his reasoning for why he wants the world to burn, that being the death of the master to all of them, has me wondering what exactly happened to him and how it affected them all. Slowing down from the previous massive arc, Yamazaki tries to figure out what Gin is like in relation to everyone else. The humor obviously comes from just how mixed everyone's opinion on Gin is, and that no one really has a straight answer to give him. As far as continuity, this feels kinda weird considering that, at least in the anime, they've encountered one another before, but I digress, the episode was a decent slowdown. Well, if it isn't the return of Zenzo the Hemorrhoids Ninja, in a story mostly about him and his escapades to try and kidnap a clairvoyant girl from a shrine. More so, it's actually about the bond he and that girl are able to share over manga and the talks that they subsequently partake in. As far as relationships between characters go, this is certainly a less conventional one, but they do feel for one another and it gives Zenzo a bit more character than he had before when he decides to go against the people he was hired by to save her. Again, the rest feel a little bit shoehorned in here, but they still provide a few funny lines here and there. Katsura gets followed by a news crew to document his entire day, and in Katsura fashion, it doesn't go nearly as planned. Or does it? Seeing Katsura's day as almost nothing productive but eating, asking Gin to join his group, and running away from the Shinsengumi is a funny concept in of itself, and the fact only Okita is in this episode and not Hijikata actually works in the episode's favor here as it allows more time for the plot without side tangents. It's just the right amount of dumb to be enjoyable, as Gintama always does, and seeing Katsura actually have a plan at the end with minor jokes mentioned before coming back to play for the ending joke was a great finishing touch. Kagura loses a beetle in part thanks to Okita, so she gets Gin and Shin to go beetle hunting with her. As far as animation, the CG used for some of the beetles is outdated, but in the charming mid-2000s way. It's like watching Jimmy Neutron. I never really realized just how well Okita and Kagura work when put against each other, and this episode is a shiny example of their pure stupidity to try and win whatever they're doing. The addition of the Shin Sengumi in this instance was wonderful just for how outlandish their tactics for catching beetles were, yet how in character their attempts were. This is one of those episodes where I would have preferred if we got to see characters like Sachan and Otai getting in on the action, but their exclusion doesn't take away from the enjoyment factor. Gin's favorite old-timey sweet shop is facing some competition by a group of Amanto who've created a shop of sweets from around the world, so the two have a standoff to see who can sell more of a particular sweet in a short amount of time. As a parody episode of a popular Japanese TV show, Gintama has been shown to either have full-on hits or misses, and I'd consider this a hit. The way that Gin and the others try to beat a crowd of people while also not letting others get in on it at the same time despite it being a competition is hilarious. And I like the idea that just because something is different or has more variety, that doesn't take away from the value of those that have worked their entire lives to perfect a particular skill. Quality over quantity is an idea that's been around forever, and as aforementioned, the delivery is effective, though some of the jokes where they just repeat phrases can get a bit grating. Whoa, amazing. They finally did it, boys. A two-part story that actually correlates to the short before! Finally, we get a little more of robotics inventor Gin Guy helping Gin with his bike after he runs into a girl that constantly needs to feel the wind or else she'll die. Due to that mishap, they have to deliver several packages in really humorous ways. The glorious moments in this part have to do with how instead of installing brakes, Gin Guy put in tons of dumb shit, and that the main stressing element of the episode is a bomb, but they get blown up by something completely different. The second part has to do with him and Zinzo being in the hospital hospital while Sachan tries to carry out an assassination. It's classic Sachan stuff, thinking her one-sided love for Gin is going to make her less of an assassin, but then getting over it. This segment is also good, but there isn't too much to say about it beyond that. 
A man named Ochi is running a haunted house for a festival and asks the gang crew to help out. Like most funny turned emotional stories in the series, the haunted house and how Ochi acts in it are representations of his weak mental state and the lack of courage he has. He got to the point he is by refusing to look forward and be honest, instead choosing to run away, leaving him feeling unfulfilled and only finding it in these small carnival games that would be insignificant to most other people. Before that's more elaborated on, it's still quite fun to just watch Gin and the others messing up in almost every way imaginable thanks to their own incompetence. Not the best episode to mix heart and humor, but it's still got some highlights. Episode 69. Hey, Anyway, Gin finds the head of a robot in the trash, and the gang tries to figure out what to do with it. Having the twist of the head being a fugitive of the robotics company that made it opened up tons of possibilities for enemies, like a massive gang of maids with overly sized anime eyes. Seeing those kinds of characters as unstoppable fighting machines is something you can't help laughing at. The interaction beforehand of Gin and Co. trying to make it work is equally entertaining as a person that's played Dragon. Quest before, and side note, I'm just now realizing that the scene of the group trying to find the robot a body was foreshadowing for the fight scene. Damn. As a prediction for next episode, I'm gonna guess the robot was given some kind of emotion chip to be able to feel the whole spectrum unlike most of the other cold, unfeeling hunks of Moe. Much more exciting middle part involving Gin and Co on the run, whilst the presumed to be dead doctor reveals himself to have transferred his consciousness to a robot and started a maid uprising. I was half right about the emotions chip thing, cause it turned out to be the essence of the doctor's daughter. The conflict of a man so focused on helping his daughter to live again to the point of trying to take over the world so it's more accepting of her is definitely not where I was expecting this arc to turn, but I'm not complaining, that's for sure. Plus, getting a bit more of Gin Guy and his completely useless inventions was a nice change of pace, as he helped contribute to the insanity a ton more. For the climax of this story, Gen, Gengai, the robot Tama, and the rest of the crew infiltrate the main power source of the robots to fight the digitized Doctor. In a similar way to how Ochi in episode 68 ran away from his problems without a fight, the Doctor tries to run away from the inevitable idea that his daughter is gone, and that he is truly the one that was and is lonely without her. He turned into a robot to not face those emotions, but even so, Tama knew that what the Doctor was doing wouldn't make the deceased daughter happy, so to atone for it, the gang helps her put the Doctor's soul to rest as she's destroyed alongside him, wanting them to hold her in their hearts. I love the bittersweet ending where Gin holds on to the head that started everything and allows it to try and learn new things from the ground up. It gives me major vibes to the Gravity Falls finale in that regard, so yeah, I quite enjoyed it. In the case of this two-parter, some focus is finally given back on Katsura and Sadaharu after so long. The first segment regards Sadaharu being in heat, and I don't really understand the mechanics of that with his size, but the concept alone raises those questions in a laugh-out-loud way. As he acts like a teenager looking through magazines to try and look cool while Kagura does a ton of shit to him. The second part, having to do with Katsura needing an ID to rent a TV show, has him driving a car with Gintoki and then spacing out with radical delusions of stuff that could happen. When it comes when it comes to wittiness, Katsura is the only character who, no matter what episode they're in, always gets me to laugh a ton. The way he imitates scenarios and tries to illustrate his absurd ideas mixed in with the reaction of Gin and the teacher always gets me, and the way Katsura always does this shit so seriously is too funny for its own good. Gin and the boys need to make some quick cash before they get thrown out of the apartment for real this time, so they go into the mountains looking for mushrooms to sell, finding a guy trying to hunt a massive bear with a mushroom on its head. Wasn't expecting that much action in this instance, but the choreography and antagonist to fight against gave a cool setting and execution. I cared for the nature guy in his quest to right the wrongs of tampering with the cycle of life, and his struggle to kill a good friend for the greater good was heartbreaking to watch, though you can empathize with and understand why it must be done. The other antics relating to the mushroom in the episode in general were also fun. How funny that the best gags in an episode about eyebrow zombies don't even have to do with those aforementioned zombies. I do love me a good parody episode of regular Walking Dead type characters, such as one of my favorite one-off fairy tale episodes, Fairy Tale of the Dead Man. But yeah, back to this episode. Its highest moments have more to do with running gags like everyone being injured beforehand by completely unrelated events, or cutting their hair in the worst way possible. The reasoning for why Gin doesn't turn into a unibrowed useless old man is also amazing to the point I don't want to spoil the joke. The entire episode is just some weird shit upon more weird shit. So I highly recommend watching yourself, as I would for all of the series so far, but this episode specifically needs to be seen. 
first filler episode to really feel like nothing more than filler. The anime tries to spice it up a bit with some kinds of humorous voiceovers, commentaries, and so on, but the majority of the episode is the equivalent to watching an AMV about the series up to that point. Like, half of the episode is just songs and hype for the next arc. Hopefully with it, there'll be something a little bit more interesting than this episode I'll forget within minutes of watching. Apparently the next arc is supposed to be pretty good, so let's check it out. As the start of a much longer arc than we've gotten before, Otai gets proposed to by an old friend named Yagyu Kyubei because of a promise they made as kids, and for a B-plot to that specific episode, Kondo is paired up with none other than an actual gorilla Amonso to marry. Starting with the Kondo stuff, this pairing and setting up is just too genius to not praise. I mean, I'd never expect for it to happen, and that's why the fact that it did happen is so fucking good. Not sure if this will have any role in the overarching plot, but if it does, that would be great. On the side of Q Bay, he's already shown himself to be quite forward and bold, making for an interesting antagonist as he technically isn't doing it out of any villainous intentions, but rather just because he wants to marry Otai, and she accepts, though through tears. Shinpachi's anger over the entire thing is also understandable and relatable, with Kondo and the Gin crew challenging Kyubei to try and get Otai back, and I'm curious as to how those events are gonna go. So, for the determining game to get Otai back or not, the samurai all split up across Kyubei's estate and have to try and break the other team's plates. I thought this was going to be more of a one-on-one -on -one matchup type thing, but honestly, this kind of game is much more interesting, and with the characters playing it, seeing them try to team up is a beauty to behold. This episode mostly focuses on the fight Kagura and Okita have against some strong guy, where they mostly injure each other, and that's also how they end up winning. With confidence, I can say this is shaping up to be an exciting comical arc, whether the next battles continue continue with this theme of teaming up, or instead have more one-on-one -on -one type battles. From the moment I saw a guy pouring an exorbitant amount of ketchup on his rice, I knew that he'd be fighting Hijikata, and the battle was pretty neat. Ideas of doing something clashing in a fight are always bewildering and suspenseful to watch, as they both have strengths and weaknesses over one another, in this case one having a flashier set of fake-out sword styles, and another having a more straightforward approach with immense power. The way Hijikata was able to adapt to his opponent and use the environment around him, while not giving up his poker face, is indicative of an iron will and rationality, exemplified in the story Kondo tells him during the fight, and in the end, that simplicity and adaptability help him win after all, even with a massive handicap in the form of a huge plate on his chest. Not my favorite so far in terms of comedy, but one of the most sophisticated when talking about the fight itself. I am moved to tears by this episode, not because of its soul, not because of its psychological acuity, but because, goddamn. Who would expect one of the most intense games to happen on the john? So for context, the four strongest fighters in the game all have to use the shitter, but there was no toilet paper, so they had to either cooperate or find a way themselves to wipe and get out. Beyond the priceless comparisons and reactions, the mind games played are legit smart. Kondo and the lackey are playing checkers, Gin and the old man are playing fourth dimensional chess. Even down to the last moment, you're given insights into the lengths the parties would go to to help the person they're fighting for, whether it's having to wipe with sandpaper or the person's picture themselves. The lackey didn't endure the pain, and therefore he had less resolve, but Kondo was more headstrong about his loyalty, so he faced a greater injury. Then again, when I talk about all this, it reminds me of the type of person who likes to say kill a kill scantily clad outfits are a statement about society. That being that it's true, but when you try and talk about it, you sound like a pretentious douchebag. Anyway, with only four or so members in the fight left, the test of strength of wills begins. The twist of Kyubei being a woman was actually something I fought from the start, but was then told the opposite by the show, so I'd say I'm a psychic by now. But yeah, with Kyubei's uprising, it's understandable to know why they fight so hard to be with Otai, despite not taking the time to know her feelings. Just for reference here, since it seems they want to be able to act like a regular girl, I'm going to be referring to them as a she from here on. Good? Good. But yeah, she was forced to be trained as a boy without her parents ever listening to what she thought, and seeing someone she admires be picked on gave Kyubei the incentive to protect and be the only guiding force for Otai whether she liked it or not, just as Kyubei was forcefully raised as a boy. At the same time, Otai has given more development herself as a character by giving an explanation as to why she's always smiling. That being to conceal her emotions from everyone else and act like everything is fine to not worry others. That wall is broken down, however, by everyone fighting to bring her back so she can live a life of her choosing, and the genuine thoughts she displays are heard by Shinpachi, who wants to be the one to protect her for once. It's all become a lot more complex than the show has really dug into up to this point, and I dig these kinds of character moments shared by so many in the fight. 
For the end of this saga, Kyubai finally comes to an understanding that she decided to ignore Otai's feelings in order to protect her own feelings of love for her, only then realizing her parents had done the exact same thing by trying to raise her as a boy to protect her, though that wasn't what she wanted. Like I said, she followed what she'd been taught, and so the reason she tried to say she was protecting Otai was only a cover because she herself didn't want to face the reality that Otai was never interested in that way. Otai still considers Kyubai a friend afterwards, though, so they can both be whoever or whatever they want to be like towards each other, rather than putting up fronts and faces, as both of them had done to not only one another, but also loved ones in the past. The gorilla subplot also comes to a conclusion, with Otai storming the wedding and everyone being chased by a herd of gorillas. What a way to end the saga with so much drama and character development. For the first two-part cooldown from the last bit of craziness, we've got a story about the Gin crew finding a city with monsters that changed to gold, and a request from the one girl back in episode 17 about her boyfriend still involved with drugs. The gold monster story was okay, it kinda got tedious watching the Gin crew and villagers going back and forth attacking monsters and repeating the same actions over and over, but the ending is decent. The second part is mostly just forgettable, but has slightly funny jokes about the gang confusing the girl's name for Ham and the druggy boyfriend not being innocent. Not too memorable as a whole, but a good slowdown episode. Once again, we must enter into the escapades of cross-dressing, as Gin and the gang have to try and be good hosts for the Shogun of the Land, of course leading to them doing the exact opposite unintentionally. I enjoyed how the events kept on building and building until the entire group was running with the Shogun naked whilst a small army ran chasing after them. I haven't been much of a fan of the episodes taking place in the hostess bar up to this point, but I think this was better than most and got a few solid laughs from the premise alone. A quote-unquote hard-boiled tough guy detective is actually pretty pathetic, and accidentally takes Gin and Gang in as a criminal he's been unable to catch for years. At first, I wasn't jiving too much with the vibe, because the first five minutes is a detective show parody, and that's fine, but most of it was a little drawn out and slow, plus they kept repeating the same theme over and over, which isn't as funny to me as something like Dear Sister because of the slow pace. But thankfully, that's corrected as the episode goes on, and by the end of the first part, you're actually invested in having fun with this time Tiny Dick compensating Noir Detective, and the Gin crew trying to help him. I just hope they can keep the pace up in part two. Within this extended installment, the group breaks into the museum and searches for the foxes, only to find it's a full-blown clan. As the detective kept making stupid claims in a longing pose with various glasses of wine, I grew an appreciation for the narration aspect of the parody, and thought it really added something a lot of episodes don't have. Kagura rides in with a motorcycle in the beginning, but doesn't really show up again till about halfway through, and that's kind of a shame as her raging through a museum on a Harley Davidson sounds like a super playful idea. The fight near the end was also pleasant, though the back story for Detective Guy and the subsequent resolution for the Fox Thief came off a bit too short. The idea of why the detective is how he is could have been explored deeper, but then again, some episodes spend too much time on the backstory aspect, so getting a more simple explanation to make room for more comedy is fine as well. First real Okita-centric conflict this time around, and I wasn't disappointed. In this instance, we're introduced to his ailing sister that's always watched after him like a mother figure with their parents gone. Since Okita has always been headstrong and stubborn about how he plans to do things, it's no wonder that he got it from his sister giving him what he wants and somewhat pampering him. That might just be why he hates Hijikata so much. Not only does Hijikata have the authority to not listen to Okita as a superior officer, but from the time they met, he's always followed his own path and not been to the whims of others. Okita dislikes Hijikata because not only does he not take orders from people like Okita, but he actively gets those that Okita seeks the attention of to follow him unknowingly, making him feel like the support he craves is gone. At first, his dislike and constant attempts to harm Hijikata just appear to be for fun, but with this, we can see he has real hurt feelings over the whole thing. Especially now as Hijikata refuses to heed Okita's wish for his sister to be happy before death by allowing a criminal to get away, thus obstructing justice. He's a much more layered character than just the sadistic comic relief, and I appreciate when characters get that focus. Further expanding on the last story, this continuation is almost nothing but action, in the sense that the story, characters, and emotions are all moving at hyperspeed. Getting some more insight into Okita, we learn that he thought of himself as separated from the rest of the Shin Sengumi due to his stubborn attitude and attempt to be distant from them. But it's obvious he's only saying that to try and deny his true feelings of the group to himself, which Kondo reinforces by punching the shit out of him because he needs it. The same feeling goes towards Hijikata. He tries to hate that Hijikata chose to not bring his sister along against her wishes, but he understood 
understood he only wanted to keep her safe so that she could live in a less violent life. And in a similar, wordless way, he tries to take down the manipulative husband without Okita or anyone else knowing because the connection would be enough to get Okita removed. That's why I think they're so drawn to one another. Their selfishness and stubborn attitudes clash with one another, though Hijikata is the more adult of the two. And therefore, he wins most arguments between them through actions that seem selfish in the moment but are meant for the greater good. And the sister understands both of them, as is shown when she says how proud she is of Okita on her deathbed. It's all really moving and gives insight to the characters without even requiring the whole Gin crew to be there in the background or helping out, letting us just be with the Shinsengumi and see their problems alone in a mostly serious way. A stupendous short arc. Tojo, one of Kyubei's aces, is afraid she's unable to be as womanly as she wants and may be considering changing gender, so to try and help her out, he decides to make a group date to help her reawaken the feminine side she desperately wants to open up. Yet, yeah, in retrospect, some parts of this episode seem just a little bit... questionable? but it can still be enjoyed despite that. There are plenty of great moments with Katsura, Otai, and Tojo, so I can get past the more suspect elements of this episode. Or at least laugh in a kind of, mmm, that seems a bit, uh, type of way. You know what I mean. I'm gonna just move on now. <laughs> The Gin crew and the Shinsengumi are asleep and come across their gods of victory, reacting accordingly. To be completely honest, I wasn't expecting both situations to devolve into household drama about being a neat and sleeping with 10,000 men at the same time, and the reactions of both groups are where the true comedy comes from. Of course, neither side would actually treat them as gods or guardian spirits, but instead think of them as exactly what they look like, and so, without hesitation, they don't give a fuck about whatever it is the gods are trying to push, and I respect that total lack of caring. Gin and associates are told to take out some expired crabs, so of course they eat it and end up in the hospital alongside Hasegawa, who got hit by a car. Not entirely sure why this story in particular decided to include references to Sin City, but the change in art style was cool and the scenes full of references could still be laughed at without knowing the context, so I don't see it as a downside. The main plot of trying to help a nurse get with Katsura is fine enough, but the twist at the end is what really solidifies the episode as a whole for me. If you've seen the episode, you know what I'm talking about. I should also mention the kind of out-of-place weird-ass VR scene that I think was just kind of shown off as like a tech demo or something, but that's also there for whatever weird reason. Yes, the all-girls episode. It must be where all the fan service is at, right? I mean, if you're into inflation, I guess. So what happened is that Kagura and all the other main girls of the series were faced with the greatest fear of any anime protagonist, actually gaining weight from eating huge amounts of food. To remedy and correct this, the girls all go to a fasting camp to try and lose the weight they've accumulated while fighting each other for potato chips. Good to see a continual shifting up of the cast every once in a while to keep things interesting. I mean, I can't even remember the last time Otose and Catherine had a part to play in the plot of the story. The humor was also, thankfully, not entirely reserved to fat jokes, though we do get a good few here and there. Last thing I can say about the episode is that someone on the staff definitely enjoyed animating these scenes just a little too much, you know. An assassin is trying to snipe the police chief, but he keeps misunderstanding what Gen and others are doing, believing they're onto him. Usually I'd have more to say, but this was basically an 11 minute episode put into a 22 minute slot. Not that the story is dragged out or anything, the pacing is fine enough, and it's got some good gags, but the ending and opening 5 minutes are both made to intentionally spend time, as in, they actually talk about how they're wasting time and so on. It's okay, but kinda boring, so it brings the episode down a bit. A giant Ultraman parody comes crashing down to Earth, and it's up to Gin and Co to try and help her confess her feelings for the enemy she's facing. The main jokes revolve around either just how large the spacewoman and associates are, or showing us that she lives a really normal office life outside of protecting the universe and all that. It's kinda comical starting out, but over time the whole bit just drags on my nerves a little bit. Like, yeah, we get it, she's an office worker past her prime that hasn't married, and she also is trying to save the universe and all that shit. The jokes feel like they're constantly repeated rather than really going anywhere half the time, and other jokes are just plain references to Ultraman, which can be funny if you know the context, but if not, it's just a bit confusing. Not a big fan. Hasegawa is planning to try and finally start a new life. For the past, like, 75 episodes, we've been seeing him try and fail to get a job, but now he's confidently working at a most likely not-so-legal establishment and is ready to try and get back with his estranged wife. But then he accidentally German suplexes a woman, so he has to go to trial with the man she's been dating in Hasegawa's absence. I've always liked Hasegawa as a character and his ability to just go with the flow and find a place that suits him. So seeing a bit further into his personal life that's been hinted at before gives insight we didn't see beforehand. 
hand. His personal struggles speak to why he lacks determination in trying to find a job that he can reliably stay at, but his drive to continue for his wife only makes it all the more inspiring. I also believe the antagonist will be worthwhile considering what he's shown so far, and with Gin stepping in as Hasegawa's defense attorney because of course he would, the next episode is shaping up to be one for the ages. As was expected, the trial in this episode was both intense and imaginatively dumb, in a way only Gintama can pull off. I have no idea what Heidi is, but the imagery of what Hasegawa is feeling as the case goes back and forth is still creative, and I love him. <laughs> How Gin tries to win back the conversation with such stupid shit is exactly what I expected and exactly what I wanted, and seeing the prosecutor and commissioner just go along with him, it's also perfect. Not sure what the ending really says about the resolution for Hasegawa's relationship with his wife, but I I wasn't expecting it, and it was funny, so... I don't know, man. Who could have predicted there'd be an episode solely dedicated to adventures of Kagura's dad, Umibozu? Not sure, but... I liked it. The story follows the father as he goes to a self-sufficient world that's drawn the humans they see as a threat to the planet underground. The characterization of the leader of the resistance, Kai, was strong, and she was depicted as a consistently brave hero type that wants to save the world rather than abandoning it like everyone else did. Which is also valid, but it doesn't take into account how they're partially responsible for its destruction. Umibozu himself was silly, but effective in caring for others. Those who saw the episode may be wondering why I'm giving it a serious analysis when the entire thing is shown to be Nothing more than a hair commercial, but well, uh, hey, go fuck yourself. So far in this video, I've usually complained about episodes that have too much going on or don't contain enough content, but in the case of this two-parter, I'm more saddened we didn't get more out of both ideas. In the first, Catherine is given some development in showing the lengths she's willing to go to be loyal to Otose, including turning down her old burglar friends. It makes sense that she would get an episode like this, as when she was introduced, she was more of a prop to show Otose's kindness and relationship to Gen. And where I wish there was more is the possibility of her being forced to go on some big hit and maybe the Gin crew chase after her, and Atose finds out at some point, then she goes to find Catherine and they have some big moments. It feels like this idea could have even been multiple episodes, but it's resolved in 11 minutes, so you feel kinda empty and longing. It isn't a bad episode, but you can see how much more it could have done. On the second part, Gin is having a sick day, so Kagura imitates him, thinking it'll help her and Shinpachi finish their job. The comedic timing was great for this one, and seeing Kagura try to act like Gin is great, but it just doesn't escalate quite as high as some other Gintama episodes when given the proper time. The two parts were good on their own, but it's easy to see how they would be extended for the better. Who can't relate to the timeless tradition of waiting in line for the newest game console and taking any opportunity to cut if possible? What shined most for me in these episodes was the way characters were set up in various spots to be more comfortable or trick other customers in line into moving. Of course, there will also be tons of video game references, the gang is literally going to buy a Wii, and if you don't like video games, that could be a downside for you, but then again, the entire purpose centers around trying to get them. So I think that kind of person would have been tripped up before then. Having Katsura as the out-of-water grand pod that hasn't played a game console since the Stone Age was also a touch I quite enjoyed, and I can only wonder how he'll do it a girl game in the next part to try and get the Wii. Like I said before, there's only so many times I can say how funny or good an episode is, but this is fucking funny. Gaming humor is always really hit or miss, and this was nothing but straight hit after hit. From the out-of-place parodies of popular games and tropes, to the subversion of the breaking the rules trope to mean nothing, to taking an NPC and using it as a weapon, everything is so fucking charming and I admire it. So far, this may very well be the funniest episode in the series so far. It's too good to be true how the series continues to one-up itself with better serious and better comedy episodes. Woo, 100 episodes. I know it's 369 in total, but I'm just gonna round up and say that I'm at the one-fourth mark. You still holding in? Good. And what a way to celebrate 100 episodes of Gintama, with a story about making a manga, and exactly why the viewing public most likely should not be editing the script. Seeing mangaka and other people of different entertainment professions explaining common ideas of the medium they work in within that media and making it entertaining has always been fascinating and fun to watch. As an avid otaku, this is all especially played to my interest as I got every joke about various jump titles, though it doesn't take a genius to laugh at hearing all manga artists are nothing but hyper-intelligent gorillas. 
Hijikata gets a cursed sword that makes him act like a cowardly 14-year-old girl as a newer member of the force comes in and takes notice. As Hijikata's first real foil since Gen, he's shooting to take Hijikata down so he can move forward in the Shinsengumi. My guess for the next part is that the cursed sword and that new guy Ito will have some big relation that was set up to try and lure in Hijikata. While the episode itself has a good setup, most of the jokes were rather predictable and hinged on Hijikata does the opposite of what he's expected to. Ito also had surprisingly little screen time here, only really having one meaningful interaction with Hijikata in the whole thing. The twist of Okita working for Ido is interesting as well, and I'm sure in retrospect this episode will be good as part of the story being told, but on its own, it doesn't hold up too well. Whoa, that was a major upgrade from last episode. Hijikata goes full otaku because the sword he has is possessed by one, and it turns out Ito's actually working with Takasugi and co to kill both Kondo and Hijikata, thinking it'll lead to them taking over. What he and the other anti-foreigner group doesn't seem to understand, however, is true loyalty. One attribute common among the members of the anti-foreigners is their hatred for the Amanto and undying lust to take down those they see as traitors. With no code of honor or morals to follow, the only thing tying them together is that hate, and that's why they can't understand a person like Yamazaki, who marches forward to try and deliver info to Hijikata even in death. Ito only sees the others in the Shinsengumi as an obstacle to his ultimate goal instead of other individual people who have their own strengths to author, so he doesn't get the relationship they all share. Okita may have plotted to get Hijikata out of the vice chief position, but that's all he was striving for, so it may come as a surprise to him and the others when Okita turns on them at the idea of Kondo being killed, but to us, the viewer, it makes complete sense. The old Shinsengumi is driven by a compassion and loyalty to one another that isn't easily broken, even under new management, especially with Kondo involved. And there's a sort of beauty in that relationship. The comedy was also much more on point, as Hijikata has more to him than just doing the opposite of what he normally does, and other characters get their own jokes, the addition of Gen obviously helping. Also, did I forget to mention that the swordsman musician guy from before actually does a thing in this episode? Now that's a real accomplishment. He actually did something besides looking cool for once and possibly killed Yamazaki. I hate him already, in a good way. Probably the bloodiest episode in a while. I mean, Okita straight up slaughters an entire group of traitorous Shinsengumi, but beyond that, the episode's real focus is showing why the Shinsengumi chose to follow Kondo, even at the cost of their lives. As is shown in this installment, Kondo is highly protective of those he cares about, and that encompasses the entire Shinsengumi. He doesn't see one member as more important than the other, including himself. And upon reflecting on his decision to not listen to Hijikata, he thinks death is the only substitute to make up for not trusting his family over Ito. He holds such a deep respect for the others that he's willing to die for them himself, and ultimately that helps Hijikata to overcome the sword, which preyed on swordsmen not mentally skilled enough. In overcoming this, Hijikata has emotionally grown to remember his true self and why he fights. Mixed in with all of those kinds of scenes is also some classic Gintama comedy of breaking up emotional moments in a way that only adds to the overall experience. Gin himself gets some great character moments as well alongside Kondo and Hijikata. I also love how the title for the episode is a subtle play on the first episode where Kondo Kondo is properly introduced. If the last episode was mostly meant to show the other side of Kondo, this was clearly doing the same for Ito. It shows us that his quest to be seen for his achievements was nothing more than a front to make up for the fact he never felt appreciated or like anyone ever really cared for him. His constant battle for the attention of others only ended in more disappointment for those he wanted to impress, so to stove this off, he'd withdraw from social society and act as though he didn't want to have true friendships but to make a mark in the world, something Takasugi could easily exploit. As others in the anti-foreigner group perished, such as the brother of the swordswoman, Takasugi planned to use what Ito could do to his advantage and have him killed so he could never get the chance to understand his true strength. That being working in a team with people who care for him. Ito gets the chance to understand Kondo like the others in the Shinsengumi do when he saves him. So to protect that person he secretly yearned for for so long, he takes a bullet. He tried to change the Shinsengumi for his liking, but in trying to destroy it, he understood just how much it meant to him. Gen also once again gets gets some good moments of endurance and bravery when fighting the musician swordsman, who finally gets some character himself with his reading of other people's moves as music. Finally seeing him fight was awesome to see in its own right. Great episode. 
In this last installment, Gin is able to take down Banzai the musical samurai, and Ido is given the death of one, being able to die in a duel to Hijikata with all the other Shinsengumi members connecting to his own soul as he slips away. It ultimately takes up a small part of the episode, but with the journey we've taken so far, it's rather satisfying and heartfelt at the same time, since we thought we'd get to see more of Ido. Yamazaki also isn't dead, Banzai having spared his life before, giving a bit more depth into what kind of character he is. From that point, it's almost completely comedy, and I'd expect such an arc to end no other way. Like the Akagi parody before it, the show goes for a parody of Captain Tsubasa here, and while I've never read nor watched it, I can still appreciate the humor more here since soccer is a much easier game to grasp than Mahjong. However, getting a team of people from across the series to compete in a game of soccer or whatever is such an overdone filler trope that even Transformers did it, and unfortunately, most of the jokes are also about the same. Some are funnier than others, such as the player saying he's doing the last game for his little boy, which is actually his dick, but other than that, I don't remember almost any jokes from before the last five minutes where it actually gets interesting and the game plays like it's a battle. Most of it was just boring cliche after boring cliche and boring joke, and that's kind of just it. Gin and crew are hired by a Yakuza family to try and get the leader's silent son out of a storage room he's supposedly been staying in for the past five years. Turns out not only did the son originally become that way because the father kept him from living an honest life, but the son is also dead, with the second in command planning to usurp the gang after the father passes. The jokes were fine, mostly centering around the gang trying to get the son to come out with no luck, but as it keeps going and going with multiple jokes being repeated, such as the Yakuza surrounding Gin and Co after their plan doesn't work, the episode felt like he was was constantly playing on rewind instead of going anywhere until the second act. It finally started moving after finding out about the betrayal the second in command committed by killing the son beforehand, plus Gin has a decent fight and the ending does leave some questions left to be answered about what's going to happen next, but as a whole this just hasn't really gotten me as invested as the other openings to arcs have in serious or comedic ways. Okay, why is it that the second episode is always usually better? Wh whatever, I digress. I was impressed the story was able to go from somewhat intriguing to actually interesting, with us getting more insight into the relationship between the Yakuza father, the son, and the second in command, having been cared for by the father from a young age with just as much compassion. Having the second in command cover up for the son's suicide of feeling inadequate by blaming himself and going to others to fill the role really shows just how much he cares for the old man, being willing to lie about it up to his deathbed. Gintoki could even see through his mask and decided to help him out in the end, helping the second in command be able to say farewell at the father's grave before dying himself, leaving a bittersweet end. Was kind of surprised Kagura and Shinpachi didn't come back at some point, but their absence doesn't take away from the product or the genuine emotions you feel for the characters. Yamazaki tries to enter Katsura's forces undercover, but he has to go through many more obstacles than he'd expected. Having him have to go through a written exam where all the answers are either incredibly dumb or about Jackie Chan's nose was really entertaining, and seeing the entire episode devolve into nothing more than a Jackie Chan spoof entirely was a spectacle as well. I didn't expect so much of the humor to be tailored around one specific movie of his, but as a person that hasn't seen it, the gags were still hilarious, and as a whole, it was a much better spoof than the goddamn Captain Tsubasa episode. Another Katsura episode. This time he gets locked up in jail with a guy that's trying to escape, and general prison hilarity ensues. Unlike other episodes where scenarios were repeated multiple times and it could get old, this perfected that formula by having stuff actually happen between that. Of course, we get one of Katsura's famous delusions in the mix, and only he would be able to completely change a prison system without even trying. The guy trying to escape all the time was also fun. He and the prisoners all had a lot of personality. The best part had to be the end, however, because I just love the joke that everyone was double-crossing every everyone without even realizing it. Not entirely sure how I should try to talk about this two-part episode. I mean, in the first part, one of the drag queens from the Hostess Club falls in love with a host, and in the second, Kagura gets an umbrella for the rainy day. Both were enjoyable, but I can't say much about them without just directly stating the plot synopsis. Uh, Kagura slowly having worse and worse days doing the same routine was funny. Yeah, that's it. It was good. I just can't find anything to say about it like I can for most other episodes. Tama the robot, now without her past memories working at Otose's bar, is given time off to do what she wants, so her and Gin go to see what she can do during that time. If a message can be gleaned here, it's that you're your own person, even when you're a robot, and you should be able to do what you want for fun. At first, Gin doesn't understand that, and takes her to places that he finds fun to see if she'll have a similar reaction. But as we dive a bit more into Tama's interests, we see that her want to help people isn't as surface level as it seems. She wants to not only be useful, but help others smile, and if that means doing work other people might not 
want to do, that's fine by her. She may not have conventional methods about letting loose and all that, but she's still doing something she likes, so it's really up to her about how she decides to use her time, just as Gin and the others can do in their free time. Also, we needed more of Katsuratama than five minutes. Where's the goddamn spin-off? Getting back to another story about a newer Shinsengumi member, this guy with a mole on his head is really concerned about smegma germs. Next thing you know, Kondo turns out to have whacked without washing his hands too often, and his germs mutate into an unstoppable blob taking over humanity with a big attack on Titan Season 4-ass charge, and of course it's all a dream. I really wish they could have tried to solve the episode without doing that incredibly overdone dream trope, but the pure escalation is still incredibly creative and builds up jokes well. I know I've talked about how stories have escalated in tremendous ways before, but Jesus Christ, the new guy also delivers his own personality to the group. Hijikata is asked once again to keep some guys away from Matsudaira's daughter, and she ends up recognizing him from before, leading to Hijikata having to go through a ton of shit to try and get her off his back. Most of the episode is about the date they go on, and while the ending bit is great, a lot of the episode is callbacks to previous ones without much of a spin on it. The original episode was also shorter, but it had a much better mix of the characters, with Kondo and Okita barely even being there in this instance, despite the extra time given, instead being replaced by Gin and Co. They also do a perfectly fine job, but the lack of the Shinsengumi members makes the episode feel like it's missing something. At the least, this can still hold up on its own, unlike most anime filler of this nature. After about a hundred episodes, we finally get another beach episode that isn't really a beach episode, this time with minor fan service in the beginning. Gin and Co find a peeping Tom Turtle at the beach and are compensated by getting to go to a palace from folklore, but literally everyone else is also doing that, so they get into a big fight and end up on a deserted island. I love how the first thought everyone has when they get there is that they're alone and they can do any embarrassing thing possible instead of actively looking for help. Katsura particularly is at his best in this episode, but then again, when is he not? Stan Katsurapio. Anyway, interested to see what the old man box story leads to. Probably something stupid in a good way. My guess is massive government conspiracy. Place your bets now. Damn it! I should have known it was Space Turtles. I mean, what other answer could there be? But yeah, it turns out the box was made by a vengeful old geezer turtle princess that wanted to spite the world because she couldn't stop aging, and the entire gang crew spend the rest of their time on screen trying to get to the princess to stop her from turning the world into a giant wrinkly ball sack. Gin and Katsura are much more entertaining as old men than you'd think, and as the straight man Shinpachi gets plenty of good material in the different scenarios presented. With a skeleton wife, I thought Turtle Guy was going to turn out to be Kappa John Wayne Gacy or something, but turns out he's actually a rebel fighter, and becomes much more bearable to watch as the episode goes on. Including Kyubei as part of the main cast for once was also a good idea, she fits right in with everyone else. The boys are already to storm the Princess Otohime's place, while Otai goes off and fights her alongside the other girls. We finally get a deeper explanation for why the Princess is doing this, with the reveal that she's kept the person she valued most in cryostasis for a long time, trying to look the same when he awakes, and to make herself shine brighter, she takes away the light from others. Her plan's flaw comes in that while others might not look as good as her, both her inner and outer body have decayed to the point she's unrecognizable. The man called her beautiful not only for her looks, but her heart, at least that's my interpretation and that's why his words had more effect on her. Otai understands this and wants to try and explain how even an ugly person can look beautiful with a kind heart, but Otohime is unable to grasp this concept, lashing out at even her own people for nothing more than looking better in comparison. Shinpachi and the oldies continue getting some great lines and interactions in this episode, and I wish Kyubei got more screen time as she was wonderful as well. Mostly what I expected would happen, the team continues to try and reverse the ultimate plan of Otohime to age up everyone, and through the performance Katsuro and Gintoki are able to perform at an old age, she understands just how much she fucked up and why the man's words stuck with her so well, as I predicted, because of her soul. The team still helps Otohime survive, however, as they believe she could still live on for not only the man she loved, but for the sake of herself to regain her inner beauty. After the event, she's able to live on as just another snack shop, and such a humbling would obviously help her ego calm down. Getting crew obviously have their own highlights as well in the episode. Unlike many other shows that have fucked the I just turned into an old person trope up by making them annoying, the Gintama cast remains as fun as ever, and that's an achievement on its own. Overall, a decent ending to an arc I didn't expect to be as long as it was. <laughs> 
Hijikata sees the world around him start to ban smoking more and more, so he tries to go to a planet where cigarettes are made, Planet Hammock, but Brisa already destroyed it. Yet from this point on, it's a full-on Dragon Ball parody, with Hijikata going on a journey to find the slimy wet Dragon Balls to bring Grillin back to life so he can have a smoke. It reminds me of that Chowder episode where he tries to get his hat back, but has to trade a ton of shit to a ton of different people to do so. The parody is also much funnier than I anticipated, as it isn't the main focus, but rather how Hijikata reacts to it. And his expressions are all golden. My only complaint is that there wasn't more of this. I honestly loved it. A two-parter connected via a restaurant theme. First, Katsura tries to infiltrate an Amanto-only restaurant and finds innocent people working there, mainly the idiot prince that got mistaken for an alien and left on Earth. The other half has to do with resident Madao Hasegawa having to run a sushi conveyor belt restaurant with the gang crew while the owner is out. Part 1 has more development for Katsura and his attempt to keep his moral standards by not involving innocents in an attack, making him possibly look like a radical. He also has some good gags about how stupid his disguise is at the bar. The second part has better outlandish comedy, with everyone being unable to simply make regular sushi without fucking it up somehow. It ends a bit abruptly though, showing Hasegawa going fishing for more ingredients but never getting a true conclusion to everything that was going on. It was funny, but not all that satisfying. Ironically, in a world already filled with Amanto, there are still classic crop circle type abductions, in this case having it happen to Shimpachi and the rest of the gang. Why? Because the Amanto's PSP broke and he was looking for a screwdriver. So Shin gets one for a finger, Kagura becomes a living flathead, and Gin's dick becomes the least useful one possible. It's amazing that what it really takes Gin to kill an Amanto is messing with his cock, but hey, it works. For the second time in the series, the gang goes into a game to try and find the Amanto that changed them, and knowing just how underhanded they all are immediately upon entering is so what I'd expect. Considering they're in a game, there aren't nearly as many stakes besides staying the way they are, so I can see all the possible jokes that can be made in the place of drama or anything like that. I didn't expect this to be a multi-part story, but considering how it's gone in the past, I'm already interested in where this'll go. Continuing on from before, Gin and Co. run into more players who inevitably turn out to be other people they know who have also been turned into screwdrivers. What's even more priceless is when the characters are screwdrivers or whatnot for completely unrelated reasons to the others. Like Kondo, who had a the-fly-type accident, and Hasegawa, who's just in denial about his shitty life. It made a lot of sense that he was the most powerful one in the game considering all the free time he has. The callbacks to Fruit Punch and Fruit Chinpo Samurai were also cleverly conveyed. The greatest part, though, has to be when it turned out the people who looked like the Amanta were just Hijikata and Okita, who are also screwdrivers, just to clarify. The setting is cool too, but honestly I don't even really care about the game stuff that much because I'm too focused on the humor and what stupid twist will come next. I really want to know if the others just got abducted too or had some other unforeseen accidents. How do they fucking do it? How do they mix melodrama with comedy so seamlessly? The guys go to a cafe to discuss how to change back, but Katsura says they should all just accept what's happened and move on with their lives. So the gang all gets jobs working off the pun of driver, like golf driver and car driver. Then, Sachan independently finds the aliens on her own and gets the gang together so they can beat them, I guess? Uh, the latter half of the episode doesn't have the best direction, and the conclusion comes off a bit rushed without much thought. The use of Gin's dick was actually pretty good, and the repeated bit about Hasegawa off doing something else got a chuckle, but I wish the story had a bit more narrative fluidity to it that was kind of lacking so that they could tell more jokes relating to drivers. Plus, we've been following the story for some time, so a less thought out conclusion was kind of a letdown. Otsu needs to write a new song because her producer, who happens to be Banzai the Musical Samurai, who's still recovering from the battle with Gin, so she has to write it herself. You can tell how much of a filler episode this all is because characters constantly repeat shit like, Banzai can't do that because thing. Did he really do thing? I don't believe he did thing. Then the whole cast shows up out of nowhere at one point to help with no foreshadowing or anything really. And the plot is centered around the song itself, but as it's a joke about fucking the censors, most of the song is bleeped out. Then afterwards, for some reason, the entire the entire theme song plays over with an uncensored but also different version of the song previously sung? It's so all over the place. Not the worst filler, but it's not exactly winning any prizes either. The best thing that can be said here is that Otsu isn't as annoying in this episode as she usually is. Most of this episode was boring. Half of it is spent on the single background of the Odd Jobs place while Shin and the others talk about how they're dragging time. Then they have an actual recap episode, like, no joke, no, no subversion, regular recap, and then at the end a completely different short that's never been played before happens, and it's okay, I guess. But it doesn't really fit with the rest of the episode and the whole thing is a mess. Thankfully, they say in the credits of the show that they won't be doing this anymore. Good. 
Shinpachi is telling off his subordinates for talking about other women instead of idolizing Otsu, then he gets a message in a bottle saying the same thing and tries to get ready for their encounter. Am I the only one that notices it's almost the exact same basic plot as the Cat Ears episode from a while back? Shin says not to do something, he does something because he experienced it, he looks for people to help make the contact with this person perfect, they fuck it up, and it turns out the girl isn't what he thought it was. Some of the jokes, setups, and the ending is slightly different, having both sides fooling one another, but it feels like a moment of deja vu more than anything. I I still enjoyed it and think the second episode will be more original, but goddamn, it's a hard aspect to overlook with just how obvious the reuse is doing specific scenes, and before you ask, no, this isn't filler. Shinpachi continues his adventures in riding back and forth to the girl, who's actually the sister of the girl in the photo, while she does the same up to their meeting. Out of all the people they could have chosen to help Shinpachi write the letters, they chose Hijikata, Kando, and Gin, and that might sound like the start of a complaint, but no, it's fucking perfect. This is the funniest episode of the show I've watched so far, and that's saying something. All the timing was perfect, every mess up or change of the letters were laugh out loud great, and the way the sister interprets all the messages is amazing as well. I've never laughed so hard at the show before, and even upon rewatch, I laughed just as much. I'm also interested how the encounter is gonna go with Shin and the real girl accidentally meeting at the end. I don't know how it could top the humor, but seeing as how the girl stated before she's never had a friend and desperately wants one, it could be more heartfelt. Through a complicated series of events, Shin chases after the sister when she runs away to try and help get Shin with her sister, hiding her own feelings away, whilst Okita, the sister, and Gin are all chasing after her as well. The humor wasn't quite as good as the last episode, but there were still quite a few standout moments such as Okita making the original sister submissive to him and acting like it's nothing. There were also some more genuine awe moments when Shin and the older sister communicated directly to one another for the first time, being able to express their true feelings without the mask of another person or indirect messages to to stop them. For once, it looks like Shinpachi could actually have a good relationship with this girl, and if that does happen, it'd be interesting to see where he'd go with his character and activities, thinking about how he idolized and only looked at Otsu for so long. Sadaharu isn't feeling well, so Kagura and the rest of the crew go to the vet to see him checked out. Katsura does the same with Elizabeth, and upon finding an alien in the body of a dog with a dying master, Kagura and Katsura, of all characters, try to get the dog to him before death. At first, I thought the series was actually going to do a semi-realistic depiction of an old dog and master dying together, but after the parasitic life forms and dogs and cats bit got revealed, that's when I knew this was Gintama, and more crazy shit is bound to happen. Also, the way this set up such an odd pair that's never really had too many extensive solo experiences together ended up being a good move, since both characters do well comedically on their own and work just as well with other characters that they're not usually with. Okay, disregard one of my previous statements from the last episode, this story is indeed about the inevitable and eventual death of an old man and his dog, but in an unconventional way that's somehow even more heartwarming. I mean, what's sadder than seeing two friends spend their lives trying to get the other to die so they won't feel worthless or horrified watching the other slowly perish into nothing? That's not where I thought the story would go, as the first part set me up to believe it was going to be all fun and jokes, but no, that last scene of the two trying to continue going on their walk and continually collapsing is kind of of fucking hard to watch, and it's really sweet in a non-overbearing, realistic way. The alien shit is basically second to the bona fide emotion from start to end of the two buddies. The gang gets recommended by Otose with a job at a haunted spring, with Otai tagging along. The idea is pretty simple. Gen and Shinpachi are the only ones that see the ghosts until eventually they try breathing the ghosts in, leading to everyone becoming rock ghosts other than Gin, who passes the woman who runs the hot springs test. It's executed well enough with a few okay gags, though the fact that Gin is so afraid of ghosts, as has been established, wasn't really used as exaggeratedly as I'd hoped, though it was still nice to see. Everything was pretty middle tier about this episode, but if it turns out the ghosts and whatnot are actually Jojo stands like in assumes immediate S tier, no questions at all. Well, technically the spirits are calling themselves stands, but that's more so just for Gen's sake, so F tier! Fuck you! Gintama's trash now! For real though, the main conflict of the episode has to do with Gin virtually being trapped as a doorman for a bunch of random Japanese historical figures. I like the concept, which is carried out in a way that isn't too original in terms of interacting with ghosts casually and so on, but it gets much better when Gin tries to actively fight back and fails miserably despite that. The twist of the spirits being kept there against their will is an equally interesting idea to build on. Since the old woman's main ghost is her deceased husband, there's potential for an emotional moment when or if Gin can defeat him with the idiots in his group who got turned into ghosts themselves. There's a good potential for an engaging conclusion to the whole thing with a mix of good old ghost fighting. Yeah, we got some ghosts to- 
I wouldn't really call it fighting, more like strategically getting ghosts to go away in an inventive way, that being by putting their souls to rest, as ghosts are naturally vengeful spirits with grudges to settle. The mistress was only keeping them all on earth in order to make a profit rather than being genuine with them. Explaining why the spirit Gen teamed up with stated she'd changed. The whole husband story that's been foreshadowed even goes back to Otose in a way, with the mistress having a grudge of her own to get back at Otose for taking her original husband. So in a way, the mistress is like all the ghosts she entrapped. The start of eating ghosts from Mario type power up some fights also has me interested to see what will transpire next. The fights were pretty inventive, with an amazingly anticlimactic ending, just as those kinds of fights should, and the main theme of the entire arc is revealed and how the mistress went from trying to send souls to heaven to keeping them there to not grow alone without the presence of her husband. In her letting them go, it could both represent the idea of friends that leave still remaining in your heart after they go in a more literal sense, and the loss of a loved one can be slightly alleviated by thinking of them as remaining true in your heart, in a way continuing their memory with the activities you used to do together. In this case, the bathhouse to release lost souls. Now all we need is an episode about Xavier, the guy with a bad haircut and shotgun that brought Christianity to Japan. We all know he's the real star. Allow me to summarize this filler episode in a short description mimicking the meeting for its creation. Hey, hey guys, do you remember that time we had an episode where Gin helped a manga editor use stupid tropes to make it better? Well, uh, yeah, yes we do. Uh, funny episode. Uh, okay, so for this filler, what about if for the first five minutes we have an identical setup to the first episode, except now the guy's tall instead of short? Then we follow with the same idea, but for tropes relating to female characters, and have a third of the episode dedicated to showing off the amalgamation of those tropes. Great, great. I'm sure the viewers will never see that coming. Yet yeah, this was just okay. Could have been worse. Could have been better. Could have had a different opening than that of the original. There are plenty of could'ves in this world. Let's not add to it. Getting back to the escapades of Hasegawa in his attempts to regain the trust of his estranged wife, he and Gen go on a hunt for a new house with the help of some bald guy. The pacing was a bit slow with the running gags dragging out too long, and while I thought everything relating to the obvious murder scene house was strong, the lack of clear ending made the inclusion of it feel incomplete. The mangaka seemed to be going for more of a horrorish approach to the ending, but with how goofy Gintama is, the lack of an ending punchline and Hasegawa's wife just running off, I feel like I'm missing something here. Usually I can pick pick up an intentional usage of a change in genre for comedic purposes, but this whole thing is played mostly straight to the end, so it makes me wonder what happened instead of laughing at the end of this almost entirely comedy-centric installment. For the first two-part filler episode, the show doesn't disappoint, the first part notably, as it uses a concept you'd think the actual mangaka would have already done by this point, that being Kondo and Sachan getting together to try and get each other with their opposite person of stalking. You already know just how stupid both sides are going to try to get the eye of Gin or Otai, and it plays out as hilariously as you'd expect, including them pretending to be a couple. It takes regular tropes of the genre of episodes, but unlike other Gintama filler, it exhibits what the canon series is able to do with those kinds of situations and tropes, giving new life to them with the characters and making it interesting again. The second short calls back to the first ever Christmas special with Santa and the reindeer, this time having them deliver the baby of one of the people that chased them away. The connection is a bit unnecessary and the ending is surely abrupt, but I'm just glad these guys are back on screen. They're surprisingly much more enjoyable than you'd expect. Thanks to Kagura and Shinpachi finding some old photos of Gin before they were the odd jobs together, he spends time reminiscing about the people he used to work with. For whatever reason, they're all black westerners who speak English, and something about that is just so fucking good. Maybe it's that they all have guns attached to their hands for no reason or end up leaving him, but it's both so sad for Gin and funny in every other sense. And the way he dumps all of them in a river to get rid of them at the end had me in goddamn tears. I thought this was going to be so much different than it was, but the relative absurdity hits the middle ground where it's weird but real enough to to heighten the humor. Gen comes across a kid looking to get into a brothel to meet the top woman there. Don't worry, this is an anime, but it's not going that far. The kid is doing it because he thinks the woman is his mother, so Otose hires him at the snack bar. But when they get back down, the group starts a bit of a ruckus and starts being attacked by a secret police working down there. In general, I love the idea of an underground city for reasons I will not currently explain, but it's just such an interesting concept of its own culture and people different from those living above. It gives plenty of room to be creative using a whole new world with fantastic points of view, and its underlying tension of the kid trying to meet his mother while the Gin crew are chased by a fighting force already opens up a lot of possibilities. 
Getting a bit more backstory on why the kid Seta is being tracked, he's indeed the kid of the woman at the top of the prostitute ring, Hinoa, held there against her will for having birthed Seta in the first place and letting him live. The reason for why they can't meet isn't completely specified, but what is elaborated on is the heads of the underground city, those being Elite Yato members, part of the space pirates from before, excluding Kagura's older brother and co, who just show up to take Seta separately. In his short introduction, I can already tell the cold but analytical mind of the guy leading the group, Hosen. He's left Seta's mom alive after birthing him because she was important to his sales, and he made her stop from killing herself so Seta would be allowed to live. In that way, and within the flashback the female ninja and leader of the secret guard Skuyo provided, we can all deduce that Hinoa is a kind person, so Hosen would be able to take advantage of that. Kagura's brother's design is also pretty sick, so getting to know more about him is sure to be a treat. Putting Gin and the others in the background for a second, the most memorable bits of this chapter come from the interactions between Hosen and Kagura's brother Kamui. Hosen remains about as calculated as I predicted, but he also holds a strong, if slightly withered tenacity that comes out when the city he's built is in danger of being taken over. As a retiree, he wants to live a peaceful life, so when Kamui comes into the picture to bargain Sato away, it disrupts that peace. Kamui himself is a rather rambunctious little rascal, disregarding all traits about a person besides their strength to gouge whether or not he feels the need to interact with them. As a person constantly on the hunt for new opponents, he sees Kagura as another weakling to forget about, and is willing to kill whoever necessary, even comrades, whether intentionally or not, if they try to stand in the way of his fun. There's a level of insane logic there that I like to see in antagonists, and he feels that bit pretty well. Skuyo continues to hold off against the other female ninjas of her group, whilst Kagura and Shinpachi fight the subordinates of Kamui, holding him off so Gin can try reaching Hosen. The theme of going against the common culture or blood of the society you grew up in is woven into the narrative of both stories going on, and each is handled with as much care as the other. Skuyo struggled to leave the cage she built up around herself in the city of Yoshiwara from fearing Hosen, so she focused on getting more women like her to fill the void left by Seda's mom's absence, not realizing she had become a separate beacon of hope for those women seeking help. Kagura, on the other hand, hasn't really gotten a chance to face a true challenge to her warrior clan's bloodline up to this point, never facing something so life-threatening she'd have trouble keeping it together. In this instance, she isn't able to get by on her restrained strength, so to save Shinpachi, her inner instincts take over and force her to lose any and all preferences about fighting and just go for it, almost killing the Yato member she's fighting before Shin is able to get her back to her normal self, showing that in a way, the Gin crew as her family are the ones keeping her in check and helping her stay sane. They know her ambitions as well as her and want to help with keeping her from losing her morals. It's a well thought out dynamic and the inevitable confrontation of Gin and Hosen is building. Among episodes so far in the arc, this is the most middle of the road. Not as in, like, middle placement of episode ranking, I mean, it's literally in the middle of a larger conflict, rather than having a full stopping point along the story. That's what makes it a bit harder to speak on. Kagura understands how important Shin and Gin are to her, as Seda comes face to face with Hinoa, learning his biological mother actually died at birth, and she, along with the other prostitutes, only assisted in the birth. But he calls her mom anyway for all she's done for him in the process to keep him alive. Gin also comes face to face with Hosen for the first time, Time so he can help the two escape. The obvious main message here has to be about bonds beyond blood family sometimes being stronger, whether it be Seta with Hinoa and Gin, or Gin with Shin and Kagura, and how they're willing to help each other stay in check. Other than that, what's shown off most is the pure power difference between Gin and Hosen with his massive fucking comically oversized umbrella. The strength imbalance is really insane, and I'm seriously wondering how the gang can make it out of this one without using some kind of Super Saiyan blue power of friendship speech. Seda finds his mom unable to move, having paralyzing injuries, so to get her out, he carries her, becoming her sunlight of hope for a better future, as she had been for those other prostitutes for so long, as Skuyo and Gin continue to fight off Hosen. Kamui is also still there, but that's about all that can be said on his part. It was nice seeing Seda finally be of use to others for once, showing he's grown as a character over the experience and is unwilling to run away anymore. Gin and Skuyo's continued determination was also as cool watching as ever. Since the weakness of Hosen, the sun, and a plan for showing it to him have been made, all that's left now is to sit back and see how the fireworks go off. After Gin stops Hosen with a noticeable increase in animation budget, Seta is able to allow the light in, destroying Hosen in the process. During those final moments of Hosen's, his true feelings about the sun and light in general are revealed. He may have placed himself into an environment of eternal darkness, but in truth, he wanted to be able to see the sun more than anyone. As an old Yato member, the sun would and does kill him, and as something valuable gets farther away, a person can't help but chase after it, yet Hosen could only claw rather than use his arms to catch it. If he could use his arms, he would lovingly embrace 
against the sun with all its light just as anyone else could, but instead all he can do is hold on to it for dear life as it tries to escape, using the women below as small rays of sun that burn out quickly in his grasp. In that way, he can only dream of what a true sun is like, and so the only way he can feel it without being harmed is in death, when walking towards the undying light everyone sees. A bittersweet demise to a troubled character who only ever grasped at straws that ran from him. Everything wraps up. Hosen gets closure, having Hinwa there to help him sleep, Kamui fucks off somewhere else, Umibozu pays tribute to Hosen's grave, the prostitutes of Yoshiwara are given the choice to do what they want, sunlight is allowed in the city, and Seita goes to work at a vibrator shop. Really brings a tear to your eye. Just a nice conclusion episode with some comedy spliced in near the end. Not too complicated. Kagura and Shinpachi want to get stronger after the Yoshiwara's burning arc, though I don't remember anything burning in that goddamn arc other than maybe Hosen, but eh, that's beside the point. They both feel weak, so they go to Gin, who, as he usually does, doesn't give a single fuck. Subsequently, various members of the cast break into the house and tell the two how they should achieve their goals in a fast way. Like I said way back in episode 50, these kinds of different interpretations for a scenario type episodes are the kind of storyline right up my alley thanks to all the references and jokes that can be made. And as 50 did, this episode is equally as entertaining, especially from my man Katsura. I don't know if the theme of Kagura and Shin trying to seriously train will stay a theme for a while, but either way, it'll make for some good shtick from the entire cast, as has been shown. Out of all the parodies Gintama could have, I gotta admit, Saw was not on the list for what I would expect, but whatever, I may not look it, but I'm quite the horror fan, so this kind of plot can be amusing, and with how rarely it's used as a concept, I enjoy when it's done. So, Hijikata and Okita are kidnapped by some teenager, and have three days to try and get a key so that they can disarm a bomb set at the Shinsengumi HQ, but if one of them is set free, the other explodes. What makes the setup really work is the characters that were chosen. Both Hijikata and Okita have been at each other's throats for the entire series, but neither wants to play the traitor role, so they end up wasting time trying to make the other crack or make a move. And those interactions between them are as good as ever, which are only amplified by the unique humor that can be conveyed through the setting. I mean, seeing Okita actually try and act nice towards Hijikata while chained to a pipe in an abandoned locker room isn't the kind of Gintama situation you normally get, so the switch up is nice. Continuing the same general antics from last time, Hijikata and Okita's patience is running thin as both are starting to starve and have already given up the chance to escape by throwing away the key. I was planning to talk about the emotional scenes, but it was all thrown out the window for the ending joke of Okita just playing an act. At first, I was even a little bit mad at it, but after a second, that's when I really started laughing. I mean, the emotional scene was over a tubed ice cream snack, I probably should have seen this coming from a mile away, and the pure shock factor is actually quite stunning at first but in a very comedic way. I do wish we saw the guy under the jigsaw mask, though. As each intro to a new season has begun, once again, we're thrust into a filler episode. Thankfully, not a clip show or weird-ass commentary type episode, but instead one where the crew tries to end the series but can't pick one. Pointing out a specific detail, I'm not sure why, but every time they started it back up with the city being destroyed, I immediately started laughing from the get-go, and every ending they came up with was exactly how I thought they'd do it, and it's brilliant. Every character dying, goodbye message where a character goes somewhere else, magical girl, and of course, the Evangelion finale. Finally, we get another filler that actually slaps on its own, and hopefully it's an indication for more good episodes to come. Gin and crew need to run a barber shop for a while, so the old man who usually runs the shop can go buy manga, but none of them know how to cut hair. It's quite amusing seeing them try so desperately to just not cut the hair instead of inevitably messing it up so bad that anyone would die of embarrassment having it. Also, of all episodes, the reintroduction of the Shogun for this specific episode is pure intellect. Because of his last appearance, I'm anticipating something bad to happen. How will the show conclude one of its most suspenseful arcs in the barber shop arc? Oh, plus we can't forget the intro to the new titular series series Kintama, with Butt Chin Shinpachi and Piss-Haired Gin, and the equally thrilling opening scene taking place there. Okay, I didn't think Kintama would be continued, but now that it has, I look smart in hindsight. Getting back to the main plot, it can best be described as the gang accidentally cutting off the Shogun's hair and trying to find a way to make it better. Of course, failing in such a spectacular way that the Shogun reforms barber shops as a whole, thinking that this is just how the poor get their hair done. I think it's better if I don't describe this one much further, as it's mostly smart visual comedy that's conveyed through the episode, so yeah, it's pretty good. And I, I mean, I say smart visual comedy, but it's smart in a dumb way, if you get what I mean. 
Kagura can't sleep, so she constantly bugs Gin to try and help her. The most interesting bit of this has to do with something almost entirely unrelated to the episode, that being a short about a kid with a dog that's mostly used to convey one joke, in typical Gintama fashion. And as you'd expect, the episode ends with a flip where Gin can't sleep. I don't have much to say about this, it's very average and there's not much to say. Gintama is also there for a second to remind us that Shinpachi Butchin has a butchin. NEXT! Gin, Otai, and the rest of the crew, plus Katsura and Hasegawa, because... I don't know, are all invited to Kyubei's birthday party, obviously set up by Tojo. Honestly, I think Tojo is a rather underutilized character in the grand scheme of the series. He's got some great interactions with Kyubei, and the reactions he gives are always really amusing, so it was good getting to see more of that here. Kyubei herself doesn't play that much of a role in the story, mostly having to do with the classic country bumpkin at rich snobs part type of scenario. Insert Gravity Falls Season 2 Episode 10 clip here. Thankfully, even with a done over and over type concept like that, the show has plenty of original jokes with their classic absurd humor, and it's as good as ever as these kinds of episodes where the rich snobs get the shit beaten out of them for being such assholes. Something about that kind of ending is always so satisfying. Gin and Hasegawa have another round of gambling to try and get money for various different reasons, but we shouldn't be focusing on that. Why? Because the episode spends more time letting us know, hey, do you remember when I was cool? Yeah. Remember when I wasn't all that cool those times? <laughs> oh, definitely, yeah. Please just kill me now. I mean, there was technically horse racing somewhere in there, but I feel too betrayed by the flashbacks to care. As soon as the flashbacks exceed five minutes, the episode gets an F. No questions. Gin and Co. complain to a bartender about their problems, whilst the people they're complaining about continue to come in and ask about it. Before I get into that, though, I'd also like to express my appreciation for the series doing a parody of a silent film. No major reason, I just like the aesthetic. Anyway, a while back I mentioned how I'd love to have an episode where the characters have to talk off-screen, or in a way that makes you pay attention to their words over everything else to see if it holds up. And that's what this does, giving us perspective of the bartender instead of showing anyone. The VAs all do a great job as usual, and it's accentuated in this segment by being able to understand exactly how the characters are feeling or what they're doing based on their voices, and in an entertaining way at that. I may just be a dumbass, but the ending joke really got me in a way I wasn't expecting. The atmosphere in general was also much more chill than usual, which adds to the charm of such a peculiar little episode. Shin and the Otsu fan club notices their numbers have been steadily decreasing, and it turns out that Hijikata, or Toshi from back when he received the cursed sword, is still alive and has been taking members to make a more general fan club for people who like multiple idols. A savage and unrefined idea indeed. Seriously though, I'm glad the mangaka was able to come up with an idea revolving around Otsu without directly involving her, because like I've said, she's not exactly my favorite character. Having the group settle everything on Weeb Double Dare is also pretty interesting, and the kinds of insane fights that take place in the setting yield limitless potential for what the depths of the human heart can conjure up. A conflict between Toshi and Shin was unexpected, but it's got real potential, and the comedy hasn't been stunted so far, as can be shown from this episode. Getting some more insight into why Hijikata is doing this, apparently he still has a bit of Toshi inside him that's trying to break out, so to come to terms with himself and give Toshi a farewell, he wants to become the official Otsu fan club, but as you might expect, Shinpachi ain't having any of that as they gear up for the competition. A bit disappointed the first event is a basic ass race, but at the least some of the jokes beforehand hyped up what it could be in terms of humor. It's easy to have fun when a bunch of out of shape otakus jizz in their pants running for their favorite idol. Hopefully the next event will be eating Otsu's shit, like Gin suggested before. Now that would be a true sight to behold, and subsequently tear my eyes out at. What would be a competition in Gintama without some intrusive and ultimately obvious cheats that not only the Gin crew, but everyone, including the police, use? I couldn't see it any other way. Whether it be Gin hiring French-bred Hulk Hogan, Okita getting in a car, or Hijikata creating the Great Wall of Virginity, it all fits into the story exactly how you'd expect. Speaking of Okita, so far in the competition we haven't gotten to see much of the other Shinsengumi members at all besides Yamazaki, so I hope they're used a bit more later on as their appearances here are as abrupt and wanted as ever. What makes the arc as a whole much funnier, though, is that really only Hijikata and Shin care about becoming the official fan club, whereas everyone else is either in it for money or just along for the ride, and that suits the style of the show perfectly because somehow, in the end, they actually get you to care, and I'm getting hyped to see what the second battle is gonna be like. 
For the first competition, the two teams need to do a trivia showdown about Otsu without Shinpachi in the picture. The main joke here is about the foreigner Taka team getting all the questions right while actually just asking to go change after shitting his pants. And it's funny the first time, but as you come to expect it, the joke kinda lessens in weight rather than gaining steam. Kondo got a good moment when he deduced how much Otsu physically hated him, probably back from when she was the head of the Shinsengumi for a day. But besides that, Okita and Yamazaki didn't really even get a chance to say anything. I was sure Kagura was at least gonna do something thing with the foreshadowing that she listened to Otsu beforehand, but, uh, whatever. Not a bad episode by any means, only a bit underwhelming. In the second competition, both teams need to try their best to woo Otsu in a setting of their choice whilst another one of them narrates. The two scenes give completely different experiences, so I'll just say that they're two segments. The first is more about making references to Studio Ghibli in order to give Hijikata a chance. I do gotta say, the choice of Okita and Gin for narrators are perfect and make the scenes much more outlandish in nature, like saying why Kondo argues about why he likes one of the main characters from My Neighbor Totoro over another. The second segment is more of a Journey to the West parody, at one point actually having Again, as the narrator, pop out of the screen and join the gang. Honestly, I like this a bit more since it relied less on references and instead quirks about the setting or scenarios being played out. Still glad that the Shinsengumi were finally used a bit more for this, but the second part is better, I think. Shin and Hijikata play Otsu-themed Yu-Gi-Oh! as the last trial to be the official fan club. And when I say they play Otsu-themed Yu-Gi-Oh!, I don't mean that in the joking kind of card game episode fashion. I mean it's a literal Yu-Gi-Oh! parody. I'm a fan of Yu-Gi-Oh! as a whole, but this wasn't really all that interesting. The jokes about backstage hands and the band behind Otsu were okay, I guess, but none of it really stuck out to me all that much. Nothing was really making me laugh. And if it's a comedy episode of a primarily comedy series, then I have to dock a few points. I guess at the least it wasn't too long, only lasting an episode like the rest, and I do still want to know what'll happen after Hijikata's loss. A good end to a somewhat underwhelming arc overall. With a draw at the card game, Toshi and Jinpachi decide to settle it with a good old fist fight Hajime no Ippo style, this time allowing Toshi to actually come out for the last event. It would be easy for him to win if Hijikata were in control, but instead, he chooses to fight his own battles in order to show how much he truly cares about it, as does Shinpachi, even after Otsu says they can both stop and be the two official fan clubs. He and Toshi aren't even really doing it for the official club title anymore, but rather to give all their effort to something that they feel passionate about, leaving their marks in history through their perseverance. Usually I'd be mad and find neither side getting the title a cop-out, but in the manner it's presented, you wouldn't really expect or want anything else, and it fits better than having one over the other. Like I said, as a whole, this is one of, if not the weakest long-running arc, not having any major misses, but no major hits either, comedy or serious-wise. But at the least, the final episode to cap it off is pretty good. This was a weird one. It's two segments technically, but it doesn't really feel like that. What I mean is, there have been extra segments at the start of episodes before, but this lasted a good 7-8 to eight minutes and has a clear plot, yet it randomly just ended. Gen and the gang find out that there's some scam organization using the same name as them, and it turns out to be Gen's old companions. There could have been room for some semblance of a plot or even joke, but there isn't. They find the gang, and then the episode completely changes. There isn't even an ending joke from what I can tell. The second segment is a fine direct Raimon slash Terminator parody that has a few memorable moments, but the whole time I was watching this average episode, I kept thinking what could have been if the writers just chose to not continue on. Am I the only one that was unsatisfied with the turn of events here? Ugh, whatever. I'm unsure how to even talk about this. The first extra segment bit was actually pretty cool and simple. The gang crew is represented by real life mannequins and did as mannequins do when dressed as anime characters. What trips me up is the main part of the episode. So, Otai and basically everyone else other than Shinpachi get an influenza going around. So he has to take care of them and their various wacky antics until Katsura shows up, but he has been transformed into Ill Smith, a version of himself that can suck in any and all viruses, and he has the same catchphrase as Obama. Obama's old slogan. The flu then gets released by Kondo when he jabs Ill Smith's ass, inadvertently turning everyone except Shinpachi also into Ill Smith, and the episode ends. That should be enough to tell you how I feel about this episode. No analysis can say just how amazing what I've just described is. Any words I use would be a disservice to this masterpiece of insanity. I adore it. 
Hijikata and Gin get stuck together with hand cuts. That is the plot. Now, imagine every single cliche you could think of for this type of scenario. Hey, wait a second. I don't want to be fused together with you. I dislike you, and I do not get along with you or your antics. Oh, uh, we gotta walk together? Hey, I'm trying to do this menial task. Why are you also trying to do this menial task? Oh, no. I gotta take a shit. How are we gonna shit together? I could look over every anime and cartoon that has done this trope over time, make a perfect replica of what happened in this episode from them, and then throw it out because nothing is going to top the JoJo episode, which originally was shown in a manga chapter back in 1990. I mean, judging the episode on its own merits, it's serviceable, there's nothing wrong with it, and some jokes were okay, but beyond that, I don't got too many compliments to give here. Tama gets infected with some kind of computer virus, slowly eating her up inside, so Gen and Co. take her to Gengai to see if he can fix her. At first, I thought it was going to be one of those go-inside-the-code type deals, you die in the game, you die in real life type stuff, but no. Gengai does the more logical thing and hits the group with a mallet, shrinking them so they can magic school bus their way through Tama to find the virus. It might sound like the same concept, but I like this version more because it gives the artists and animators more unique settings to derive the story from. Speaking of the visuals, I really like the effects they did with Tama, especially when she became an 8-bit sprite, as beyond the regular using item menus and text boxes, from any and all angles, she has to look exactly the same, and that makes for some great subtle humor if you look out for it in the episode. As is custom for RPGs, Gin and Co. find an entire living city of what looks to be sperm cells inside of Tama protecting her from the virus, but it turns out they've all been compromised, so their only help will be in the form of a knight of Tama's imagination that just so happens to look exactly like Gin. Knowing the strongest person emotionally and physically Tama knows is Gin is helpful in showing how she feels about him in general, and is quite sweet considering all they've been through together. Also, I should point out I know self-awareness and Gin Tama are synonymous words, but the pure layers of upon layers here really show just how committed the show is. For example, not only is Tama still doing the same any angle same pose shit as before, but now she's also inside of herself and using actual items she has within her. Eventually this shit's gonna break the barriers of self-awareness and circle back to being unaware. Until we hit that point though, I'm just gonna tag along for the ride. The gang continues further into the enemy base, looking for the main source of the virus to find out it's already taken over Tama's body. What stuck out above everything else here is the relationship between Gen and the knight Tama created, as they are actually virtually the same, and that leads to them fighting. Beyond a comedic level, it could be an indicator that Gen dislikes himself, and by coming to terms with and helping that version of himself in the simulation, it also helps him understand himself better. Speaking of Tama, knowing that she would rather be taken over, rather than losing her fictional friend, reinforces the caring nature she's shown throughout her various appearances, and her relationship with Gin is equally as interesting as the doppelganger and provides some warm feeling scenes for the gang, even if she has a pixel art sprite and therefore it can be a bit harder to take her seriously. Entering the final boss stage of the arc, the virus evolves, leaving only Gin and the Knight to be able to face off with him. If anything, the main focus of the episode had to do with the Knight for once, which I wasn't expecting but was pleasantly surprised by. We're given room to see him contemplate his own existence, putting Gin's life over his as he sees his own life as inherently inferior, but Gin doesn't see it that way, thinking he's grown from Gin as a base to become his own person. They have different goals, different specific bits of personality, and they intend to lead completely different lives. But the one thing they can agree on is to fight for what they believe in and want to protect, that being their friends, as cheesy as some might like to call it. Much more satisfying overall than the last longer arc, let me tell you that. For this two-segmenter, in one, two guys who I think are supposed to be in themselves Gundam references break into Gin's house to try and steal stuff, but they keep running into random people barging in the home. Almost every line the thieves make has some reference to Gundam, but it goes right over my head as I've never seen a single piece of Gundam media. Thankfully, the unsubtle references are made up for by some appearances of characters we haven't seen in a while, like Sacha and Hasegawa and my boy Katsura. You already know he was my favorite part. Second segment had to do with Gin and Co. losing their hair and trying everything they can to get it back. There isn't much else to this short beyond that, they lose hair and try to get it back. Not too complicated. 
Hijikata and co. have to try and intimidate slash interrogate a mass murderer to get him to spill on all the criminal activity he's committed. So they each go in with different approaches. One of the bits I've noticed about Kondo in particular is that he's at his best when he tries to be nurturing or helpful, but it always backfires in him either being insulted or left without anything to say. So him playing the role of good cop makes for good use of that aspect of his character. I was also hoping they'd put Okita in the obvious role of the bad cop sadist, but it surprised me by showing he's a knowledgeable sadist that can tell when he's sees a masochist. Yamazaki even got some good moments for once in a long while, when he, for basically no reason, decides to blow up at the criminal and vent his personal frustrations. I've always been partial to comedy police shows that have interrogation episodes, and this gives off that vibe. In yet another two-piece, firstly, Elizabeth has been changed for a Russian version of herself, and Katsura is unable to notice. You know, I gotta give props for the Katsura episodes, and the ones where he's completely oblivious are especially my cup of tea, so yeah, I do like this. The Russian version of Elizabeth is completely unexplained in the context of the episode, and I think that works in its favor by being simple so you can accept what happens afterward. The second part is a classic body swap where Gin takes over Sadaharu's body, and vice versa. The range of emotions given to Sadaharu's face here is both impressive and entertaining. But it's all overshadowed by the ending joke of Gin turning into Shimpachi's glasses. That's a true Shyamalan level twist right there. The Gen crew gets locked in an elevator with a guy that can't stop bringing up that his house burned down because he left his blow-up doll wife by a Korean barbecue until they realize they can just bust out immediately whenever they want. I have nothing else to say here, it was incredibly average and I could see the ending from a mile away. Gin and Hijikata go to get cavities taken care of at a shady dentist spot, but they're both incredibly scared of drills, and the dentist attaches random shit to the people he operates on. We haven't gotten much of a, the two of them both have the same fear they're trying to overcome type plot with Hijikata and Gin since way back in like, episode 20? With the ghosts, and the comedy is just as good as back then. The way they both get completely unrelated to dentistry robots attached to their bodies, which then experience the pain they would have felt in the procedure making them feel guilt is so weird that I love it. The dynamic the two have remains as great as ever, and the comedy they share comes from places you wouldn't expect off the basic premise. There is also an obvious missed opportunity in not showing what Hasegawa and Kondo were doing after their surgeries in a little scene at the end, but it's not necessary for the episode as a whole to be effective. It's another goddamn clip show. What do you want me to say? Uh, this time it's a best lines raking. I guess that's a bit different from the other clip shows. The characters are in CG so they can recycle the same poses over and over. That didn't happen in other clip shows. I really don't know what you people want me to say. Clip shows go straight down the list. Getting back to Yoshiwara for a while, Skuyo and the other Hyaka have had some trouble with a drug going around and enlist the help of Gen to try and find the source of it, and you'll never guess who it turns out to be. The Phantom Troop from Hunter x Hunter. I, I mean, what else can I think? They're called the Spiders and have tattoos. They're the Phantom Troop, goddammit. Nothing more, nothing less. In all seriousness, having Skuyo and Gen interact more seemed to be the right idea, as they have a certain awkward chemistry thanks to their complicated history in relation to the Yoshiwara is Burning arc. Not too many characters do well playing off Gen in the this is kinda awkward sense other than Sachan. And with her not playing a major role in many episodes recently, getting Skuyo to fill the bill isn't a bad choice. The new villain also seems to have a history with Skuyo himself, so that'll hopefully be cool to see play out. Gin and Skuyo run into the guy they've been looking for, and it turns out the guy is called Jiraiya the Spider, Skuyo's former master, and in some ways, manipulator. I say that because he has the interesting dynamic with Skuyo of caring for her less in a fatherly way, but more in the sense of a craftsman taking time to make sure his strong little machine can beat all the other robots on her own. He crafted every portion of her personality to reject her femininity, to reject asking for or relying on the help of others, and being a cold killing machine to protect what she wants. And he sees that doll he built as being ripped, with the entrance of Gin. Not only is he the one that brought down the chains of Yoshiwara, giving Skuyo a new purpose and ability to live her own life, but she also has implied feelings for him, so Jiraiya looks at him as a parasite. When he thinks he killed Gin in front of Skuyo, you can see him using similar tactics to the one he used before when she was broken as a child to re-break and form her how he likes. He wants to put excessive guilt on her by killing Gin, destroying Yoshiwara, and wiping her character clean to build up the masterpiece he so fought for. He only believes in himself and his creations, where as Skuyo has Gin and the others to help her, so I expect throughout the arc, Jiraiya will be thwarted by his inability to accept change or help from others. He's shaping up to be a really memorable villain as well, and I can't wait to see what comes of it. The inclusion of Zenzo after so long to help bridge the gap of information and save Gin was also nice. 
Expanding on the backstory of Jiraiya, he's shown to not only be a merciless killer, but a raging masochist and thrill seeker, constantly trying to top the thrills that he's had before, whether that be killing his own master, the people that hire him, or as he'd hope, himself by trying to construct Skuyo in his image. She was never his student to him, but rather a piece of clay to bend to his whim. He thinks she can only be strong if she's like him, because he sees himself as strong for taking people, making them stronger, and then killing them himself. He sees his way of life as supreme, and he longs for the emptiness and joy of killing a foe he helped nurture, but as Gintoki will show, that isn't a master. This episode in particular also hints that Gin has his own story to be told about the person that trained him. But for now, he and the others are ready to kick some ass and save not only Skuyo, but the entirety of Yoshiwara before it burns to the ground. Wait, shouldn't this arc have been the Yoshiwara is burning arc? Gin has his final fight with Jiraiya, and it is a sight to behold, as the animation has gotten a serious upgrade for the fight, and Jiraiya's fighting style with threads is really different from anything shown before, other than, I guess, Bonsai. Gin also has these scenes expanding upon his backstory as a lonely kid with a sword, protecting himself in any way possible until his master came around to help him. It's explained as the fight between him and Jiraiya continues, and over time the battle goes to black and white like the flashback, possibly reflecting Jiraiya's more black and white mentality of strength and how one can can protect himself, whereas in Gin's flashback, it slowly turns to color as Gin and his master walk away, implying Gin's master opened his eyes to the true potential and value of others beyond himself to protect more than just him. Gin and Jiraiya are also given more of a connection in that they were both prodigies at a young age, but Gin's master was able to pull him from the dangerous life he lived to feel peace and honor, whereas Jiraiya continued down a worse path that his sister couldn't watch, leading to her killing herself. Jiraiya raising Skuyo to kill him wasn't only to feel the ultimate pleasure, it was to avenge his sister by giving himself the ultimate punishment, death at his own hand, though indirectly. It could take Skuyo time to recover from it all, but she's willing to help bear the burdens of her master and live on for him, leading a new life in his place. Finally, Gin and the others are given a moment of downtime to allow Skuyo to rest and be able to act like the normal girl she never was. The setup for this is by having Gin and her share a room at the host club and play games together, and it's about as funny as you'd think, having Skuyo not only be able to not hold her liquor at all and turn into a completely different person. Skuyo is still the same person that she was before, preferring to look over and watch Yoshiwara any chance she gets, but that's okay, because now she has Gin and the others to help when she can't do everything herself. It's heartwarming, simple, and pleasant. Hmm, a comedy arc about the characters getting mad or depressed about themselves because of a popularity poll? Well, that's a new one. Unlike usual in this instance, Shimpachi isn't as much of a straight man, as he's going through an existential crisis of whether or not he can improve himself while staying in the same role he did before, well below the other main characters and in some cases get less screen time. There's even a funny little detail of the cast always having their rankings pointed out above their heads. And not only do the characters reflect on their scores, but they try to change their scores by fighting one another and making them do shit to become less popular. Man, that's a cool, hilarious concept. And considering the variety of characters in the poll, I can only imagine how they might try to fit in certain ones that either haven't appeared in a while or make no sense ever being in the universe. A good example of them doing this is when Otai finds a way to go outside of the anime and kills the mangaka as he is drawing what's happening, so the world slowly begins to deteriorate around them. The surrealism is off the charts and I dig it. This entire idea really is just a playground for the mangaka to use up some ideas he made, isn't it? Not that that's a bad thing by any means. How could I not absolutely fall in love with an episode that has an official song done in MS Paint? I'm no fool. The idea of all the characters becoming clout-chasing monsters looking up their ranks in the polls not only reminds me of the episode where everyone gets large unibrows, but also the YouTube algorithm. Some stay friendly and wait to backstab the competition for their friends, others leech off the clout of unassuming people that don't want any trouble, and others try to imitate the more popular people to get a drop of the credibility they have. It's almost scary how accurate this is without even trying. Above all other examples, I like the constant betrayal factor involved. It doesn't matter who destroyed Yamazaki's credibility in the beginning anymore, because anyone can do it, so theoretically, everyone could have done it. Mystery on top of humor is a surprisingly well-fitting match that you weirdly don't see used too often. Ending the character poll arc with a bang, the mangaka Sorachi takes the opportunity to not only tell jokes about the characters fighting over ultimately menial rankings, but he also uses it as an excuse to vent out all the complaints he's gotten about characters within an episode. By having the character ranking battle turn into more of a battle of the sexes, each character with similar counterparts can have a go at one another for those similar attributes, and or feeling like one replaced the other, making them mad. The only person who really isn't as affected by any of the insults or whatnot is Kondo because he's just so shameless that nothing can 
can penetrate his iron hide. Having Yamazaki play the role of the jealous rival type that wants to be on top for once also makes sense, as he's one of the least explored upon characters with the most jokes made about how incredibly average he is. I'm thankful we got a more effective solely comedy arc, as that hasn't happened in a while. Technical halfway point here, the series is 369 episodes, so this is the midway point of it, though the video will also have to cover a few other things, but you know, it, it's still a milestone that I'm gonna go for. And what else could it be but a two-part filler episode about mayonnaise and wasps? Let me explain. First, Hijikata sees an ad to go to the magical gumdrop land where tons of mayonnaise is made by fairies, so he gets the rest of the Shinsengumi to eat it so he can go. Other than the obvious joke of it being just a regular factory, the main thing to laugh at isn't even the in-episode humor, but rather the way that the mayo basically looks like cum throughout the episode, and yes, it's difficult for me to think otherwise. Second part has to do with the Ging crew finding giant wasp nests and accidentally killing all of their queens with various gaming consoles. Then it turns out the wasps are all fighting and kill each other. It was okay. Kinda was hoping for a little bit more since it's a halfway milestone, but I guess the animators didn't really know how many episodes there would be at the time. Okita gets stabbed on the street by a girl, so typical day for Okita, and it's discovered she's the daughter of a hotel owner he supposedly killed while fighting an anti-foreigner faction, so the girl was seeking revenge after the hotel closed down and her mother died as well. Throughout the episode, it builds up the supposed incident that Okita looks into after the attempted stabbing. He's adamant about covering up some facts and only has one other key witness who survived alongside him, along with one of the faction members that survived to manipulate the kid into going after Okita. Since this is a mystery built on two episodes, Episodes, I think I should count them as a whole rather than separately to be more fair to it, so let's go ahead and get to the second episode conclusion. Alright, looks like Okita was keeping the entire operation a secret from the girl, not to cover up a murder, but instead to make her believe her father never did anything bad. He forcibly had to shelter the anti-foreigner group and attack anyone that came with them or his family would suffer. So he attacked the other Shinsengumi officer with Okita, leading to him killing the father. Okita himself never did anything, but he wanted to shield the girl's feelings to keep the image of her father pure. In typical Okita style, he wanted to have all that burden placed on himself and face all the consequences with the lie so she wouldn't feel bad about it. But just like he felt separated from his partners and friends before, they came around to help and punch a bit of sense into him. Another heartwarming moment for our favorite little Satanist. Taking a different format than most stories, this particular adventure starred a solo escapade of Hasegawa with a family that decided to take him in. Being narrated by the kid as he gives a report, we get to see what happened through the mind of an innocent child who had a father like Hasegawa that cheated on his wife and left him. So we see multiple parallels as Hasegawa asks for sake at a park and tries to kill himself multiple times, even when he's taken in. It's kind of depressing how Hasegawa continues to do nothing but drink his sorrows away until he understands the burden he's placing on the kid and the mom by acting like like he does. The only reason he doesn't stay with the family is because, like him, the father is trying to do the same thing of renewing his life with a job, but there's only one opening. As Hasegawa always lives by his own code and would rather be true to himself than fake the emotions he has, he fakes being drunk to help the father get back on his feet as the family is done for himself. He still decides not to drink afterwards as a sign of respect for what they did, and it's that kind of one-off story we don't often get from Gintama that would obviously balance the heavy themes with plenty of subtle or dark humor. A bit different from the regular brand. Kagura wants to do a daily radio exercise out of a spirit to be there as the only kid, when suddenly another one shows up, giving her the invigoration to go along with him out of competition and friendship, even as the other people and instructor leave, switching them out for Kagura's friends. The boy is unhealthy though, so Kagura chooses to do the exercises for him until the rain clouds clear and he can return, her friends joining in with her and making the trend bigger until the boy returns. Again, this story hits different than most others as it has less humor than most episodes, but it's also serious in a way that isn't overbearing or dramatic, instead tending to be somber and wholesome. It's honest, cozy, and a good watch at any time. Oh, also there was the story about Gin being replaced by a Gundam in a flashback given to a reporter. I, I didn't mention it because it would probably ruin the mood I was setting up, but yeah. Gen and Ko are trying to do the generic task they list for their general work by catching a stray that's been running amok, but after accidentally pissing on a cat's grave, Gen gets turned into one along with Katsura, having to team up with the strays to not get neutered by a group of watchmen for the neighborhood. And we can't forget about Kondo, who got bitten by a random gorilla and turned into one, as you'd expect. The most admirable quality of the episode is probably the characterization given to the stray being chased, Hoichi. As you'd typically expect from hardened animals on the street, he's learned the way around and knows how to get what he wants, obviously leading to see 
scenes of Gin and Co being unable to do the same whilst encountering people they know, but he also has a more empathetic side. He acts tough, but many do actually really respect his way of getting other cats out of bad situations, including seemingly Otose. The bits with Kondo are also a highlight simply because the surrounding characters all just accept that a large gorilla is going around hanging with stray cats, as you do. Looks like stray boy Hoichi is actually another human that's been trapped in a cat body for the past 13 years, showing why he had interest in getting the others. He apparently became a stray after betraying the promise of never shedding blood, so I don't know for sure how that's related to relieving yourself on a grave, but I doubt the connection is going to be as deep as I might think it could be. It's still sad nonetheless, and gives further insight into why he tries to protect other strays the way he does. We also find out the neuterers are actually hired by this cat Amanto group that want to bring the strays to their planet, hailing them as gods. I never thought about the whole Pluto and Goofy paradox created by those kind of Amanto, yet it still works within universe and makes for a few good visual jokes. Also, Kondo uses his gorilla dick like a sword, so 10 out of 10. Remember what I just said about why the cats were being rounded up like 20 seconds ago? Yeah, forget that. Some old geezer just wants cat balls to summon Shenlong and get his dick long again. Really, what's more important here is showing that Hoichi is still willing to fight for the strays, even after they tried to fight him. And upon Gin saying there wasn't a boss cat anymore, they all joined in to help as just another friend. That sort of has its own message in that when a powerful person is stripped of that power with which you used to hate them for, they become another person you want to help, since they're in the same situation as you. The cats live free, like Hoichi was intended to live, and Though we aren't given an explanation, that turns Katsura and Gin back. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, Gin and Katsura are great examples of delivering the message of true freedom among peers, as that's what they strive to do on a daily basis. Kagura is mad that Gin doesn't like how she's constantly been making rice with an egg over it, so she and most of the female cast, along with Shinpachi, go to a cooking class to try and learn. Most of the episode is the cast making wordplay of completely unrelated celebrities they'd want to cook for without actually showing much of the cooking process. I get that's pretty much the joke, but it got kinda old and the story was really stretching, even for a 16 minute episode with a bit of filler thrown in at the end. The Shin Sengumi are going to raid an anti-foreigner faction spot when Hijikata notices that Kondo has a hanging booger, but he doesn't want to ruin the mood or let the other members see it in fear of ruining morale. This is one of those stories that takes a seemingly simple concept and blows it out of proportions, no pun intended, in ways that you'd never expect. The staff really gets creative with how the snot can be used for humor or references, and by the end when it turns into a bad CGI face slash snot tentacle mind control monster somehow, you don't feel like it came out of nowhere. And it's also a dream. I could talk about how cliche it is and everything, but at the least, it doesn't take away from the episode. Gin's favorite weather lady, Crystal Ketsuno, isn't getting her fortune-telling weather predictions right, but as you'd come to expect at this point, there isn't a simple answer to solve that. The reason Ketsuno isn't getting the weather right is because she's actually a powerful mage from a clan of them who carry magical spirits, and she chose not to use her full potential in favor of making people smile by telling the weather, getting them to want to go after her, so she hires Gin and crew to help out with one of her own spirits. The spirit is called Gekumaru, and I already love her to death, an underhanded powerful demon in the form of a cynical little girl who tricks people into putting their guard down before ending them. She's so devoted to tricking others that in her debut she faked her mother being stabbed by her father and being in grieving. On Ketsuno herself, it's always interesting to flesh out characters that normally are nothing more than background jokes beforehand to show just how vast the world really is. When are we getting an arc for idiot prince and homeless man? Make it happen. Okay, this is me after the script was finished and I needed to look back through it while I was recording. I, I, I genuinely made this as a joke, but the anime actually had has arcs for both of these characters later on, so yeah, all my jokes should be serious prophecies now. Anyway, she's a sweet enough person that hopefully is expanded on more in the arc, as the character trait of having a disapproving family that may be out to sabotage her dreams is relatable to a lot of people, and it looks like that isn't the end of introductions for new characters either. It's found out the true culprits for Ketsuno's weather predictions being false is the clan right next to Ketsuno's, whose leader is mad that she divorced him, wanting to dedicate his life to getting revenge on Ketsuno and her brother with a spirit fight to the death. The reason for his anger and resentment actually ties back into an old moment in the series I thought was meant solely for a one-off joke with some continuity, but to think that it was foreshadowing all along is really clever and thought out. Ketsuno's brother, Seimei, is also a joy in his own way, being a real older, supportive brother type after realizing how much 
much the profession means to her over tradition. He's willing to let her divorce Gaiman, the head of the other clan, and breaks their own rules as long as it makes her happy and allows her to spread joy to others. That's also why she doesn't know anything about all that's happening, because her kind nature would make her go back to Gaiman in order to stop the deathmatch, but Seimei doesn't want her to deal with it. His constant personality changes are quite appealing as well. Back on the plot, Gin and the others also decide to fight with their various Pokemon, Yokai, Bakugan, Beyblade, Digimon, Spirit, Thingamabobbers, and it appears another fight's a Bruin. This episode has the distinction of being wild, but in several different ways over the course of the two fights displayed. First, Shin pretends to be a spirit to participate in the spirit battles and has to eat a space parasite if he wants to win. But it has a disgusting face he accidentally kisses, so it turns into a shoujo romance scene of him trying to confess his feelings to it. I'm always down for some Shin Kagura team-up action, and the crazy setup helps make the whole thing work pretty well. In the second battle, Gin and Seimei fight Gaiman by crushing his ass, so in return Gaiman uses Gin's nuts to fight. This battle actually has a serious moment for Seimei, believe it or not, where he releases his other guardian spirits from around the city and disregards all other thoughts besides letting his sister's smile get to people. Gekko Maru gets a similar kind of scene in which he pretends to be the larva Shin was supposed to eat in order to give him peace of mind. It's little moments like that which really humanize them beyond all the fighting and jokes, and I appreciate that characterization. Continuing the fight with Gin out of the picture, some context is given as to why Goman and Seimei fight each other when they used to be friends. What else but tradition thrown on them by their ancestors and parents who continue to grudge between two brothers for a millennia? Both sides bottled up their feelings and passed that anger on to the children who didn't want to fight, and Gaiman also had the anger of losing Crystal after loving her for so long, so he serves more as a tragic character created in the image of his ancestors to fight rather than the person he wanted to be, and so only a third party like Gin would be able to intervene and help the two sides reconcile. He's also the only one strong enough to take down the manifestation of the two's hatred in a demon their ancestors sealed away. Gin fights the summoned demon using the power of the spirit Seimei controls, awakening the good memories Gaemon has of Seimei and holding back the demon enough for both clans to join together, infusing Gin with the power to defeat and seal back the demon, freeing Gaemon in the process. Almost all the animosity between the clans was able to be relinquished in one moment of solidarity and save someone precious to both clans. Obviously it won't all go away in an instant, but the hatred becomes more of a friendly rivalry as they wish Gin and crew off on their next adventure, and that's a pretty nifty ending. Kagura is having doubts about the idea of Santa during her second Christmas on Earth, so Gen and Umibozu separately decide to dress up as Santa Claus and surprise her, accidentally running into one another in the process. I've always been a fan of the types of episodes where multiple characters get the same idea to do something and end up blocking one another from accomplishing that thing. And Gintama goes above and beyond with that concept, bringing in even more people who want to play the part of Santa in varying capacities for a big-ass Santa death fight. Competition episodes have always been pretty hit or miss with this show, so hopefully based on this episode, it'll be the former. Closing out the 3x4 aspect ratio era of Gintama before going on hiatus for a year to make Gintama dash, Gin and the other various Santas act out different scenarios in Kagura's mind to try and make her Christmas special. Running gags aren't usually my thing, but they're portrayed really well here, and I love how Kagura keeps trying to make the setting American, that Shinpachi is almost always an inanimate object, Hasegawa is always a cockroach, and somehow all the stupid stories are all tied together in one giant Gintama cinematic universe. By the end of the episode, the Santa contest doesn't really even matter matter anymore, and it all ends kind of abruptly, but with the consideration that it was the last episode of the series for a while, that actually makes it better if you ask me. Because of course Gintama would make you think something climactic is gonna end it all when the whole script is flipped. Anyway, on to HD quality, so I no longer need to take the time to crop out the stupid fucking black bars, I swear to god! Hopefully this won't be like The Simpsons, where HD is an indicator of lesser quality. Taking advantage of the hiatus from before, a two-year time skip occurs and everything has changed. Well, besides Shinpachi. Gin turns into Yamcha from DBZ, Sadaharu becomes a living ward, Otai married Kondo, Kyubei... I wouldn't say became trans, more like... Uh, got an operation, but also intentionally tried to continue looking female to make it so that they don't really conform to any specific gender. I, I'm not entirely sure. Katsura also changed just so his and Kyubei's characters wouldn't clash, and yeah, Shin is just sort of along for the ride. Similar to the character pole arc, there's an interesting concept to be made in the idea of feeling stagnant in your own life while everyone around you grows or changes. Making you feel like you aren't doing enough or the world is changing too fast for you to comprehend. Of course, that message is mostly covered in the hilarity of all the parodies to timeskip arcs the show makes, but it's to be expected. 
Shinpachi continues seeing his entire worldview crash around him, only having Hijikata alongside him as a person left behind by time. After figuring out that the reason for everyone changing is the same wart that got Sadaharu before that transforms people into an older version of their host, in hindsight the ideas Shin and Hijikata come up with for why they were left behind become more amusing. I rolled with the idea of them somehow just being passed by and feeling like they stagnated, but thinking they were left behind because they tried to not act like straight men as they usually did in the series especially made sense with the logic Gintama has, even if it turns out that wasn't even the case. Since the wards are attached more based on ambition, Gin being the only one to truly not have a ward also makes sense because he just doesn't give a fuck, I would like to reiterate. And it makes for an unexpected but logical ending joke. The best kind. For another two holiday special bash, Gin and Ko are presented with two different issues about quantity. For one segment, the gang is given an assortment of New Year's cards, and a majority of it has to do with them making one-off jokes using those cards, along with a weird connected story about Hasegawa near the end. It's amicable and simple, like the other segment, in which Kagura wants to give a gift to Gin and Shin for Valentine's Day, but she's too embarrassed. What elevates this segment is the addition of all of Gin's sort of love interest characters trying to normally give him presents from them and Kagura. It's oddly fascinating what a character like Sachan or Skuyo try and fail to use the doorbell, and those kind of interactions happen throughout the episode. The ending was also cute. Yamazaki stakes out a house to see if a woman is harboring her older brother that happens to be part of an anti-foreigner group. I don't know if it was because I was sleepy or just dumb, but at first I thought it was the girl Katsura helped out way back in the first season, and now that I realize it isn't, I kinda wish it was since that would've been a cool comeback. It really isn't as much about her though as it is about Yamazaki and his obsession with eating Anpan and nothing but Anpan during the stakeout. Uh, Anpan is a Japanese sweet bun filled with red bean paste. Yamazaki, despite being made fun of constantly for being bland, always has the most intriguing stories for how they delve into the inner workings of his mind and thought process, in this case showing us his slow descent into madness over eating nothing but Anpan until his mind breaks in a comedic way. The second part of this episode has to do with Kondo actually getting Otai to go on a date with him, most likely so he'll never interact with her again, but a bunch of varying circumstances keep him from being able to do it. The whole thing gives off massive vibes to that time Hijikata wanted to smoke but ended up going on an intergalactic adventure to get Dragon Balls, and Kondo is able to hold the same presence in a different but also somewhat similar scenario to that. Twas thoroughly fun. Catherine is finally given the chance to get some development since way back in episode... 97, having fallen in love with a guy that goes broke and wants to start a new bar with her. Other than showing Catherine's more sympathetic and humane sign being blinded by love, Otose also gets to play the part of the doting friend and mother wanting to protect her children. In a similar way to how she feels about Gin, Otose wants Catherine to succeed and do better in life, but she also doesn't want her to truly leave and suffer as she's gotten so used to them being around. Even in lashing out, she tries to be supportive by giving Catherine some of her finest wine to use, but of course, the boyfriend is an over-the-top evil motherfucker out to get Catherine's money and nothing else, leaving her in a box on the street. The twist could have been a little less obvious, that being completely blatant, but Gin still gives Catherine some needed justice in that department. The more memorable scene, however, has to be Otose coming to Catherine for a drink to enjoy together. These types of scenes make me yearn for more Catherine-centric episodes, as she and Otose are actually much more layered, deep characters than they first appear as. On one of Sachan's various stocking escapades, Gin accidentally breaks her glasses, so he goes to get her a new pair that doesn't even fit Sachan's prescription and even interferes with her work. Sachan may be a weirdo stalker type, but there is actually somewhat of a sweet connection you can find in her treasuring something Gin gave her so much that she won't use the other pair she's been using, even if they were fixed and the pair she chose to use ended up making it hard for her to do her job. She's so devoted to using Gin's glasses that when she's considered useless and assassin assassins come to take her out, she still wears them out of a love for Gin. It even touches Gin to the point he wants to help, and I do wonder what kind of fight the group of assassin killers will put up. Of course, the entire thing is well intertwined with comedy on the whole, and the gag of the characters using repeats of various things was especially memorable and funny. With the help of Zenzo, the gang crew faces off against the assassin group after Sachan, and it's delightful and ravishing in its own stupidity to the point it goes from being a parody to serious to back to a parody again. All the assassins are complete jokes with specific abilities that don't really do all that much harm when you think about it. The added humor comes in understanding that Sachan was defeated by these guys when they're so incredibly incompetent, so how weak must she be? Apparently not at all, as during the moment where the episode gets slightly serious and Sachan exclaims gratitude for the others fighting alongside 
alongside her, her glasses turn into fucking transformers and make her a magical girl with a full-blown transformation scene. Not even a dream. This episode doesn't even end in a dream because it's better that way. Watch this episode. In the course of watching yet another boring filler episode, I'll try to shorten it down to the most important events. Hasegawa sings a song, a long clip from the movie is played, the characters all fight about who will be the next main lead of the next movie, and there's an extended section of the Gimpachi Sensei segment at the end. It's all super boring, so instead, how about we just move on to the next arc that's supposed to be much better and one of the best in the series. Gen and crew are faced with a new semi-antagonist in the character of Pirako, a savage killer that came to Kabukicho to try and start up a war between the four devas of the city. In the past, we've gotten singular episodes dedicated to the other factions in Kabukicho and their leaders besides Otose, those being the Casino Peacock Lady and Drag Queen Man. But here, we're given our first introduction to another character that Pirako has a possible grudge slash connection with, Jirocho. From what can be gathered in this appearance, he's an old cynic samurai with a will of iron and sharp skills to boot, but he's also a little troublemaker among the four that regularly starts fights. Mischievous old men who aren't complete perverts get an instant like from me simply for how scarcely the concept is recognized in anime. He and the other Deva's struggle to retain power or keep peace in the city is amped up by the unpredictability and variety they all share, tipping at all times towards or away from a fight. Pirako is equally admirable with her whole ditzy wannabe gangster vibe Gen and Ko are constantly trying to keep her from acting like. You also have to pay homage to the fact that the manga specifically attached a strand of hair in the front of her head to be pulled by others and used as a handle to grab onto her. She also seems to have some kind of slightly exaggerated or missing backstory with Jirocho, so seeing how that and Pirako in general intertwines with the recently instituted rule of all the divas teaming up on one group if it gets out of line may end up with us getting some unexpected twists and turns with both new characters. As I suspected before, Pirako is actually the abandoned child of Jirocho that intentionally targeted Gintoki in order to get the war going, but unlike what we were led to think, she has planned out all of her movements and actions beforehand to get his defenses down and use Gin as bait. In the next four Davis meeting about the event, she also has the willingness to mention how Jirocho was after Otose's heart just like her husband but lost to him, so Jirocho cut him down in cold blood, still unable to get her heart, also that Pirako can give a motive as to why Otose would attack first. She directly goes against her father's wishes in discussing the matter so that she can further her own agenda relating to the war, and it shows how much of a threat she actually is independent of her father. Jirocho clearly has a conflict of interest hearing about this and wants Otose to leave before being discovered, but she isn't content to do so. She wants to be the fall girl so Gin and the others can escape, and these moments essentially make up Otose's character. On the note for Gin, she tries to tell him to go away because he can't afford rent, when that obviously isn't the reason, and the one line of, they serve no use at all, they just happen to be my my family sums up her character amazingly. Continuing those great interactions, for once we see a scene of Gen being unable to control himself and fight in a way that's much more primal and desperate, and the worst part is, he's still unable to win even by a little. Never before have we seen him hit such a low being unable to keep the promise he set for Otose's husband, so wherever it goes from here, I really want to know, as this is one of the best episodes so far with some of the greatest character interactions. And that's saying a lot over 200 in. Expounding upon what happened before as more is explained, you can see a few key visuals of characters whilst they're getting ready for the war, with Jirocho's backstory explained of how he chose to not go for Otose as he knew the life of a vigilante wouldn't be good for her, but then the husband died in a war for his sake shortly after, we know Pirako is nothing more than a bad memory to him of what he wasn't able to achieve on his own, that being Otose. He volunteered for that to be the case, but in the process of having a wife and seeing Otose alone all the time, he seemingly tried to forget about both in order to rule the town for both their sakes. That's why he kept Otose alive when cutting her down, so she'd be taken away from the action. Piroko may understand all of this, but she's also incapable of trying to let it go, seeking the affection she was never able to receive, believing what she's doing will fulfill her father's ambition. And like I mentioned earlier with her braid that's used constantly to push her around, Jirocho both metaphorically and physically removes that after she goes against his wishes by speaking on his past, possibly saying she's free to think how she wants, but in this episode she reties it, possibly symbolizing her own subservience 
subservience to Jirocho whether he likes it or not. Gin holds a similar vow to Otose's husband to protect her and pay off his debt in whatever way he can, so when he thinks that vow has been harmed and he's failed, he's scared the others will be harmed as well, so he pushes them away, seeking to use Otose's husband's old weapons, implying he intends to die in a similar way in order to protect what she holds dear all on his own. The people of Odd Jobs obviously won't let him do that, however, as they're a family that stands strong together and doesn't allow themselves to be scared in the face of danger. So now with everyone fighting one another with something to protect, someone is going to be hurt, and it's going to have some sort of major emotional resolution. The final battle for Kabukicho gets underway, and already to start out, the Odd Jobs gang is given some help in the form of all the people they've helped out over time with some pretty cool callbacks to other episodes, plus it makes the opening have even more significance than before. But what's even more interesting are the mind games at play and the twists coming from left and right here. First, Piraco decided to do the attack out of her own free will. Jurocho may have allowed her to do it, but the ambition for him to take over the world was one only shared by Piraco alone as a way to try and impress him by getting power. Second, the real person who wanted to start the war and even manipulate Piraco into doing what she did was none other than the peacock gambling lady Kata, who turns out to actually be a member of the Amanto Space Pirates bent on ruling Kabukicho as Hosen did for Yoshiwara. So it's up to Gin and Jirocho to beat Kata's main guards while Otose inspires hope for the others. Not quite as emotional as the last two, but this is obviously more about the payoff, which will continue into the next chapter. Gin and Jirocho are able to fight off all the elite guards of Kata, while the others finish off Kata's army with the help of the Jirocho gang and Saito's forces after his son is saved. The main attraction of this final installment occurs when Gin and Jirocho settle their score from earlier for the sake of everyone without killing one another. Gin showing mercy in that scene is quite indicative of his character and want for Jirocho to get the time he needs to reconcile with Piraco, who, after being accepted by Otose, finds peace with herself, resolving her character arc. In a similar way, Jirocho gets a final interaction with Otose, and of course the whole crowd comes around to ruin the moment while also not doing that. And Jirojo goes off on his journey with Piraco, leaving room for the question of what'll happen to Kabukicho now that two of the four devas are gone. And after such a great war, I'm really excited to see which of those questions are going to be answered in what way. Imagine the two most scary people in your life teaming up to destroy the Mafia. That's the plot. Takasugi and Kamui both work for the Space Pirates and are inevitably betrayed, so they have themselves a good old-fashioned stab party. Other than once again showing how fragile the relationships of those that work for the Space Pirates are, the idea of Takasugi and Kamui teaming up is an awesome idea on its own since they're both batshit insane, but they're batshit insane in different ways that clash together in an enjoyable way. I'm hoping the Takasugi gang will be a bit more involved in some of the stories, as they're they're all really likable and fun villains who haven't really gotten that much of a chance to shine at all since the Shinsengumi Crisis arc. And even then, it was mostly just Bonsai with Takasugi spliced in at the end. I can see the team up making for a pretty big event down the road, and so far, the matchup seems like a good one. Gin and all the other bottom-of-the-barrel store owners of Kabukicho have suddenly started selling something called a Patriot, and the kids of the neighborhood tour around to see them all use it, to their own unamusement. With all their egos hurt, the gang puts on a sort of play to show the importance of this stupid invention as best they can. Just another classic dumb one-off story with a bunch of beats that don't quite make sense but you accept anyway. The kids also do a good job of playing the straight man for the episode. Asagawa gets a job at the pool, and Odd Jobs comes along as well to help out. But just as you might think, everyone else shows up and messes with the plan. Of the characters picked for this segment, Kyubei and Skuyo work the best because they are opposite extremes of the spectrum for misinterpreting stuff at the pool. One thinks everything is inherently dirtier than it actually is, whereas the other is really innocent and hates to even be touched. For the second part of this, the Shogun once again shows up in his usual type of way, wanting to experience what other people do, and he's just as likable as ever. I'm thankful that, though the Shogun makes very few appearances and he does have a running joke, the flexibility of how the character gets to that joke is much more varied than a character like Sachan in the beginning, who just kept losing her glasses all the time. Going back to those episodes where the gang fights over food they're supposed to share, instead of a hot pot, this time the gang has crab, and the visualization for what the characters imagine are slightly different. It's basically another version of the first episode with higher quality production and visuals, but not too much else. The first half isn't really as engaging, and the jokes don't land as much for me, plus it's got the same ending as the last one where the characters realize the dish isn't even that good. It kind of makes me appreciate the original episode more, and the additional characters in the first definitely added to the experience. So it may have benefited this if they had brought in some newer ones, though the Odd Jobs trio can still hold up the episode decently on their own. 
Some guy comes to Kabukicho as a former pro boxer that wants to let people hit him for money, so after meeting Kagura, he gets her to show him around. It's okay, events play out about as you'd expect them to, though I do like the running gag of a guy called Takechi randomly having his name written across everything and never getting what he lends back. Other than that, this is pretty forgettable. Damn, it's been so long since Hetero was a part of an episode that I'd basically forgotten about his character, but luckily his appearance here has to be his best yet and plays up more than just the he's scary but friendly joke that makes up his first appearance. Gen and Shin try to take a bath with the Shin Sengumi, but Hetero brings his entire family along with him, so they try to act nice to not get squashed and in the process make a ton of mistakes. Hetero's mannerisms and his family's accepting nature with their scary faces makes the mishaps the crew run into even better because they're doing it for these hulking monsters that just take it, all thinking it's part of the custom. What really killed me had to be the shit involving Kondo impersonating the grandfather though. Comedy gold. Usually when there are two sides to a story and one isn't shown, I'd complain, but every second of this was full of ball-busting humor that I absolutely loved to the fullest extent of Gintama. Kyubei has to take in a monkey owned by a relative of the Shogun in order to train it to be more like a celebrity, slightly bringing in the Gin crew to help. I say slightly because it is mostly her, but the Gin crew also helps a little bit. Besides the clear humor about monkeys flinging shit and so on, underneath is an actually really touching story about Kyubei bonding with the monkey she named Jugem over the art of dodging that shit. You think I'm kidding? That's an integral part to this wholesome bonding montage. We don't often see Kyubei in the more mentoring older sibling type role, probably thanks to her issues with feeling alone, so seeing her find a way to really care for this monkey on such a deep level is touching and equally heartbreaking when she has to let it go. It should also be said a lot of the runtime is taken up by the characters saying the full name Kyubei came up with to the point it's pointed out that they had to split the episode in two because of it, and that's just brilliant. The name also never gets old to hear. It's got some staying power when it comes to laughs, and oh yeah, also we're never getting a title shorter than this, and it's even better knowing it's meant ironically. After being returned to the Shogun's relative, Jugem immediately breaks out, and it's up to the Yagyu clan plus the Odd Jobs guys to try and find him. This expands upon most of the jokes from the previous episode, and I should give it an instant 10 for the out of context moment of Hasegawa flinging shit for no discernible reason. It also adds on the heartfelt moment from before with the introduction of the Shogun's relative, who in the end cares more about allowing Jugem to be with who he wants rather than feeling like he's shackled down with the boy, only really wanting to make a friend since he's never left the castle. A feeling of isolation. Kyubei can relate to. Since Jugem is part of the Yagyu now, I suppose we'll be seeing more of him, and even more of his incredibly long name to read. And even more, even more of both monkeys and humans alike flinging shit at Gintoki. What a time to be alive. Katsura is snooping on the Shin Sengumi commissioner Matsudaira and sees he's been having issues connecting with his daughter around the time of his birthday. Like the episode all that time back when Katsura was confronted with a woman who lost her family to terrorists, over time while undercover he understands and sympathizes with the family more, respecting Matsudaira by the end after seeing him to be a real person and father. Speaking of which, up till now the relationship between Matsudaira and his daughter has been seen as a joke because he's a doting father. But as opposed to that here, we see him having trouble trying to to and showing affection for his daughter. In fact, across the story, it becomes more evident that he knows he's a bad father, but tries to make up for it by using his actions to speak for his words, even if they're undercover. And by saving her from a Die Hard style tower on his birthday using the help of Katsura, he does just that, and it's implied at the end the two have gotten closer, and that's nice. Ah, the famous episode in which the Odd Jobs gang doesn't hit the landing at the end of the intro. That alone has to be one of the greatest moments in the show, but onto the plot. Gin goes to trade in a broken VHS and finds an equally broken Blu-ray player with a disc in it that happens to belong to a computer virus disguised as a cursed ring parody. The program is a kind of masochist that likes to put everything she can in blood and has a weird attachment to turning off her kotatsu. It's a little intentionally unclear what her backstory is since she said she was made by a mad scientist but then goes on to tell a story about how she faced domestic violence as a computer program from that same mad scientist somehow? But whatever the case, she isn't as much mad or angry as she is sad about both being used too much and not being used enough, leading to the Gin crew trying to make her more comfortable, resulting in hijinks. The character is fun with the variation in setting and action, such as the program becoming Gin's GPS for a while, which is also pretty unique. 
Gaining the congratulatory title of longest episode title, Gin goes looking for a guy that's into prison roleplay but doesn't pay, and it turns out he's an actual warden that sends him to jail. The rest of the episode isn't as much about Gin trying to prove his innocence or anything, but rather living out prison life of an old man who wants to see his son. While the setup is similar to and has characters from when Katsura got put in jail, this has a different feeling, instead focusing on how Gin takes over the prison by constantly outsmarting the warden. These kind of mind game episodes have always been my type of thing since I'm a big big fan of manga like Death Note's first dick volumes, and adding comedy gives a unique experience that Gintama either hits or misses when doing so. The old man's story of writing to and wanting to get clemency to see his son is also sweet, though I feel like a major thing with the warden is going to lead to some big realization coming. Having the whole prison basically around his finger, Gin enacts his plan to dig up some of the dirt relating to the warden, while, not according to his plan, some prisoners start rioting and take the warden to be tortured. Characters who seem basic in the beginning but are later shown to have another layer of complexity make for better conflicts, and that's what the warden has found out to be, having been the one sending the letters to the old man for such a long time. At first, I thought this was a ploy to try and break the old man when saying his son is dead, but slowly it dawns that he's doing it more so just because he wants to give the man hope, even if it's a false one. In a way, it is cruel what he's doing, building up the hope of the man and trying to keep the old man from getting the chance to see his son so he can't know it's fake. But it's also considerate that he tried to give the man any hope at all. The man also apparently knew the whole time, so in a way, he actually became the old man's son. The warden's still not exactly a good person, but there are people who can accept him and the different sides that he shows. For the first time, Gintama does a crossover with a similar show I've never heard of called Skep Dance, involving a group of high school students basically doing the exact same thing as Odd Jobs, but with less fights. They say a good crossover and or parody is able to stand up on its own without you seeing the source material, and the characters on both sides are able to keep attention well enough that they can be enjoyed with no prior knowledge. The characters of Bosun and Gin make a good team in the sense of both being pathetic or cynical when they need to be to try and reach the goals of a seemingly insignificant task. In this case, ripping off another crossover to get a devil fruit, and they end up giving it away for a reason completely separate to the main use of said devil fruit. If they choose to do any other crossovers, I hope they work as well as this did. Getting back into Shinpachi's love escapades, like mine, they consistently fail, so to try and get a girlfriend he can keep, he turns to the dark side of a date simulator game to the point Gin has to try participating to snap Shinpachi back to reality. Now, in truth, the only love simulator game I've played to completion are Doki Doki Literature Club and Shrek 2 The Love Simulator, Shrekking Your Mom, but in a weird turn of events, this is one of the only episodes that barely has any references to the media they're parodying, instead going for a parody of all love simulation games games as a whole. In this case, that means Gin getting together with a homicidal housewife whose son died and joining Kondo to a girlfriend convention where weebs are pitting their imaginary girlfriends up against one another. Every character you'd expect to be there is, and I had so much fun looking at the various abominable creatures they all made. Not to mention they're all going to compete in a contest to see who's the best, so however Gin attempts to do that with his partner, I'm gonna be laughing my ass off. It's pretty much what I expected to happen, and that isn't a bad thing at all. Like I thought, the humor coming from the characters and their fake girlfriends really killed it for me. Shinpachi immediately makes it far into the competition with his boring platonic relationship, and Okita gets through with his BDSM shtick, so Gin pulls the ultimate love game tradition of removing a piece of cosmetic wear on the head to reveal a tsundere love interest. It pulls out all the stops in terms of love game tropes and so on, while actually having a message about how true love doesn't come on a screen, and if you can't accept a person, Person, faults and all, you don't truly love them. Ironically, the one delivering this message is Gintoki, after he gets so invested in the game he strips down to the nude, but that's about what you'd expect at this point, and the message still works despite Gin's gigachad status among all characters of fiction. Kagura is feeling disconnected from the friends around her, so she decides to get a new phone, finding some in Sadaharu's shit, only to realize that the phones all belong to one old man with a Freddy Krueger style claw. Based on the premise in first half, I presume the entire episode would mostly be made up of jokes about cell phones and internet humor, but it actually goes into the connection having a phone can bring to a conversation and why Kagura actually sees it as important. People like her or the old man are unable to express their words well in speech, so they text what it is they want to say so that they can hear something back. The difference between between them being the old man doesn't hear back because he only texts himself, but Kagura texts Gin and Shinpachi, who don't take into account Kagura's feelings and disregard the context of texting as dumb. It's a real grandpa, there's more to talking to someone than just seeing their face kind of episode, and I'm okay with that. 
Gen and Hijikata go to pay their respects to the shop owner that catered to their weird tastes, but have to deal with the otherworldly ghosts that only they can see. All I can say here is the amount of undead boner jokes you can make in one funeral episode that are actually hilarious is quite a feat, isn't it? What starts off as a funny montage of Katsura trying to remember what Elizabeth used his signs for before disappearing quickly takes a turn for the Star Wars, as it's discovered that he actually belongs to an alien race called the Rinho that intend on ruling Earth with a massive Death Star. Getting past the more easily laughable moments and concepts like Elizabeth keeping every sign they've ever used and Katsura somehow being there for every single encounter Elizabeth had up to leaving, the twist really does have an effect on him, and though we can't really understand Elizabeth too well through facial expressions and never knew too much about them as a character, the fact they aren't who they- I was gonna say said, but I guess wrote would be better. Who they wrote they were is still kind of jarring and actually raises interest. Sakamoto also finally shows up for the first time in like 5 million years, so having him and Mutsu directly involved in the plot should make for something we haven't seen before. Disregarding all that we already just saw that we haven't seen before in this episode alone. I also want to know if this self-proclaimed slutty ex-lover of Elizabeth is like the other Rinho in being able to take off their skin, or if she's somehow unique. A lot of important questions to answer with a genuinely good set Setup that only really became a setup for a larger story after 11 minutes of top notch Katsu comedy. Katsumity? You get what I mean. Look, listen. I could make this entire episode review over 10 pages of me doing nothing but describing the intricate complexities of every Renho aboard in excruciating detail but I'll try to keep it down to the bare essentials. As the person that originally allowed the Renho on Earth, Sakamoto and Mutsu tag along with the Gin crew and Katsura to get Elizabeth back and stop the Death Star of Renho, finding that they have tons of Gundams to take over the world with. Seeing Mutsu and Sakamoto again for the first time reminded me why I love them so much. Sakamoto's needless optimism in the face of everything, including not reading the signs to the Renho invading, and Mutsu being there to smack him up in jest is so damn charming. And the fact they'd been relegated to the background for so long really gets my blood boiling considering how much of a significant splash they've made in such a short amount of time. Even the way he interacts with all the other characters, especially Gen and Katsura, works so damn well. Some characterization is even given to Dark Vader, the leader of the Renho, who sees his men as expendable tools to his ultimate goal and is overconfident in his own skills. He's also the one who makes the Renho wear white, possibly hinting that he's a totalitarian dictator that makes his men all dress the same so they have to adhere to some kind of conformity, meaning that's why they only show features over their white exteriors, and I might be looking too far into it goddammit, but I don't care. I want to know why the giant white duck betrayed his terrorist samurai roommate. You can't stop me from caring. Gin, Katsura, and Sakamoto continue to blend into the ranks, finding Elizabeth and coming to the understanding that, like Katsura, Elizabeth doesn't want to fight him, but he apparently has something even more important he needs to protect, just as Katsura does. If anything, the main theme of this point of the story has to do with the value of bonds and friendship beyond physical things like the Earth. As a barterer, Sakamoto knows more than anything about the worth in good relationships, and it isn't what holds an object, like the Earth, that's important, but rather the item itself inside it, those being the people. It's it's actually quite profound in that no one is ever fighting for a planet or country, but rather the people that live on it. So trying to give them the best outcome is what's most important, and that might sound like a weird statement when in the background of this message being stated, Gin fights off these creatures in a comedic way, but I shouldn't have to explain to you Gintama logic at this point. Get with the program already. Elizabeth also turned on the rest of the Rinho and kept the Earth from being flooded by transformation gas, so I'm gonna go ahead and make a prediction that he and Dark Vader have some sort of throwdown later on. Upon being given the choice to do so by Elizabeth, the other Rinho revolt against Dark Vader and form an alliance with Sakamoto to fight back, leading to the Death Star look-alike becoming a Spaceballs look-alike, and the crew piloting a Gundam with a crotch laser. I believe the message relating to the Rinho has a lot to do with communism in the idea of totalitarian government with phases for leaders that are run by more nefarious people behind the scenes, and controlling the populace into becoming husks of one another in the idea of equality. Elizabeth and the other Rinho had the ability to speak and act differently, but Dark Vader who turns out to just be the supercomputer behind the ship, wanted to find an optimal planet for the Renho, so as they used the computer as a tool, it did the same and made the Renho into what they are through suppression of individuality. Elizabeth, breaking from that mold for the sake of his friends whom he seemingly betrayed, set the path for others to think for themselves and do the same, showing one standout person is all it takes in that kind of scenario to make a massive difference. Anyway, back to the robot laser dick figures. 
The computer is defeated after the Renho take off their disguises and band together to help deliver a final blow to its power source, but Elizabeth is unable to stay, wanting to rebuild the empire that was lost, so he has to say goodbye to Katsura and the others. Before that, he challenges Elizabeth to a game of Uno, something Katsura is knowingly bad at, to determine if he can keep the memories he has or have them erased, and by winning, it implies Elizabeth allowed him to do so to keep the memories they both kept close to their heart. Elizabeth remains in his costume as a vow to keep the Renho's freedom, and the group gives a heartfelt good Goodbye. Then the real Elizabeth shows up, and the one who just left was a temp that only appeared on Mondays, and Katsura knew that. The true identity of Katsura's actual companion remains a mystery, but we'll never forget you, Monday Elizabeth. The Shin Sengumi go on a holiday resort to a ski lodge with the Shogun to try and show him a good time, but with the Odd Jobs crew and Katsura also there, they end up losing the Shogun and get stranded in one of the mountains. I can't think of much to say beyond it was funny, because it was, but you know, that was in part thanks to the unusual setting, partially thanks to the dire circumstances the characters are put in that lead to great comedic moments, and the simple plot that allowed for more time to be spent on funny scenarios. Kondo and the Shogun have some of the best moments from just how poorly the two of them are both treated for no particular reason. Reason. As the gang continues looking for the Shogun, more incredibly weird stuff starts happening. I really like the experimentation with a bunch of different skit ideas, such as the group finding Bigfoot's lair, Otai finding the hidden valley of Chupacabras, and the Shogun showing up in a bear costume he found in a random lodge. They all make for unexpected and well-executed jokes. On the Shogun himself, he's still as funny as ever with his awkward personality and tendency to T-pose his way into the sky, dick exposed for all to see. Somehow, they always find a way for his dick to be shown to the world in such creative ways that the joke never gets old. The concepts really went out there for a basic Lost in the Woods type of story, so I applaud the writers for trying something different that turned out great. We're only about two-thirds of the way through, but I think we did, lads. I think I've stumbled upon the funniest arc in the entire series. Gin and the others are celebrating their year back on air with everybody when Gin gets blackout drunk, and when he's awoken, it's found out that he slept with Otai, Skuyo, Sachan, Kyubei, Otose, and we mustn't be forgetting Hasegawa. Gin doesn't want to create a scandal and have the show cancelled, but he has no idea what to do and asks for help. The rest of the episode centers around Gen trying to appease all the parties involved as each separate relationship escalates further and further, making everything ten times as hilarious in the process. Each character Gen slept with has an equally great reaction to every time he wants to take the relationship further, including, once again I must note, Hasegawa. The episode climaxes when Gen is given a home with six rooms by Zenzo, the person he's been getting advice from, to keep all of his girlfriends in and simultaneously live together with without the others finding out. The sequence that plays next is pure enjoyment of Gin going between all the rooms to try and present himself to them, and I only shudder at the thought of there being any funnier episode, even in the context of it being a continuation of this arc and storyline. And oh my god, this one episode gives an entirely different context to the opening. Holy fuck! How? How do they fucking do it again? It's magic, I tell ya. So again realizes just how bad things are going to get and all of his girlfriends meet, leading to him having to take all of them on a date to the same place using puppets created by Zenzo. And hilarity ensues as Gin tries to synchronize using the puppets with voice lines that almost all have to do with hemorrhoids. I can't even fathom how well the setup and payoff are consistently across the episode and arc. And by the time the entire thing is revealed to be a prank, I was fucking rolling. Then when it was revealed Hasegawa was the only person Gin actually slept with, I died of laughter, came back to life to laugh again, and died of laughter a second time. Much of the humor simply comes down to the reactions each girl has as Gin fumbles through using the mannequins and the way Gin reacts while trying to use it. It's a must watch in terms of pure comedy, and the ending with Hasegawa is out of left field thanks to his intentional disinvolvement with the episode until then, making it the perfect end. Plus, I was waiting for the fucking beginning to use this clip. You guys want to start a polyamorous marriage? Kyoshiro needs help running the host club after a powerful woman decides she'll come back after one visit to it, meaning she'll most likely want to destroy it and Kabukicho as a whole, leading to several of the hosts quitting. You can probably already guess the Odd Jobs crew Hasegawa and the Shin Sengumi decide to help out for the sake of the city and face their own problems practicing. Gin and Okita flirting with girls is not something I thought I needed in my life, but now I know I can't live without it. Since we've already gotten partial episodes where the Odd Jobs crew pretend to be hosts, I already had a grasp of what was going to happen going in, and the attempted pickup scenes didn't fail to crack me up. Unfortunately, Gin only says just do it one time in the episode, so if I don't see some serious let's doing in the next part, I'm going to have to deduct points for that one. 
Compared to the first part, this one is indeed quite different. For starters, the main setting is the host club itself, as would be obvious, but the part is broken up into two segments of its own, one being dedicated to the group serving a bunch of unexpected guests, and the other section having to do with serving the mistress alongside them. The first section works well on its own as just another fooling around episode, mostly having the humor focused on everyone getting drunk and getting into faction wars. The second part spends most of its time having the characters, no joke, discuss Dragon Ball and the character of Vegeta. Really though, that's used more as a backdrop to show the madam as just another person who likes to hang out and talk. To make it more plausible when it's revealed she doesn't have any swaying power and is just a girl that likes to go bar to bar because she's lonely, and she saw something in Kyoshiro, choosing to come back to see him again. At first I thought the Vegeta talk and all that was kind of pointless or a filler despite the enjoyment, but in retrospect it set up what she was like as a character in the loner sense, showing how she could be human, and opened her up to join the others in having another party where she felt welcome, and that's pretty heartwarming. It's been a while since we last had an episode about Gintaman and the various commentary about making manga in general sprinkled throughout that story, and thankfully, the viewing experience as a whole didn't at any time feel regurgitated or like it was trying to copy the previous stories. Gin and Shachi from the prison episodes are writing a manga and help to get it approved by an editor who's scared of going down the same path as the others Gin interacted with who all ended up in a gorilla zoo. I can only say what I did about the other episodes relating to manga writing in that the implementation of problems manga editors commonly face, mixed in with stupid parody manga that are just completely insane, always allows for the mangaka to put in jokes that wouldn't work in any other setting but thrive here. Only notice that the gorilla concept could have been utilized more, maybe even brought in Kanto at some point, but it's understandable why it wasn't expanded on with just how many jokes and ideas were being used already. Hijikata is tasked with handling a misbehaving member of a large family called Tetsu, also running into his brother, the head of another police force based on the Shinsengumi called the Mimawarigumi, in the process. Besides the more obvious comic anger of Hijikata having to basically babysit Tetsu, the two actually share more in common than meets the eye, being from families that set them aside at one point or another, making them turn to the side of delinquency. The difference between the two being that Hijikata used those negative memories to fuel his own determination for moving forward, whereas Tetsu shun the world and all those that didn't jive with his own beliefs, stunting his growth as a person. The members of the Shinsengumi have all gone through a similar process to be where they are, proudly wearing suits of black to represent that they know of their origin and choose to revel in one another to get stronger rather than denying the negative attributes that helped in making them who they are. In contrast, Tetsu's half-brother is a big fan of the Shinsengumi, but from what I can perceive on a first viewing, he sees them as what they started out as, a group of troublemakers coming together without any skill or training. He's come from a prestigious his family that could give him all he could need, and to visualize this, he and his men's uniforms are all white, implying they come from a lighter path with less flaws. It makes sense he would drop Tetsu with the Shinsengumi because he may say he's a fan, but from what I can see, it appears more like he looks down on them and sees their entire structure as something that needs to be redone and fixed, and Tetsu can't fit into that vision. The same goes for criminals in that he seems to have a low tolerance for them, arresting Gin for pretty much nothing. With such a contrast in vision of how a strong group is made, one from removing imperfections, another from making them shine, the contrast should make for a good conflict when they decide to butt heads for whatever reason. I feel kind of weird taking a semi-comedic episode so seriously, but I don't know, something about it just clicks for me. Going slightly differently than I first proposed, the head of the Mimowari Gumi doesn't just see the Shinsengumi as a lesser version of them, but also an obstacle to whatever it is they want. So he pawned off Tetsu to act as a bargaining tool when his shady past is revealed and his old gang takes him hostage. He wants the Shinsengumi to take the fall for it if Tetsu dies, so he'll use any means necessary as they're all equally lesser according to him. Tetsu and Hijikata's relationship also just so happened to grow further in this installment, having Tetsu get to shine as a newly reformed person by delivering a letter Hijikata wrote for his long estranged brother, symbolizing both them growing and therefore Tetsu having to run if he wants to catch up. That may even be more of a reason for why Hijikata is angry at the whole thing, because it took away a moment for Tetsu's ambitions to blossom, which the leader let happen. Since Gin is also in the mix as an unknowing spy for the Mimowari Gumi, the infiltration and fight between the two groups should be intriguing, because he'll obviously be a part of it and probably fight the silent badass subordinate girl. 
The standoff between Hijikata and Sasaki the leader continues as Okita and the vicious girl have a standoff. Going a bit deeper into the mentality of Sasaki, he doesn't see the Shinsengumi or his brother as people, but inanimate forms he needs to get rid of as fast as possible. He mentioned before that he saw his brother as a rotten fruit that corrupts others, and therefore I conclude that he thinks the Shinsengumi are the forms from which that fruit nurtures. Even after hearing the letter Hijikata wrote to Sasaki, asking for him to accept his brother as Hijikata was too late, he doesn't care. His black and white mentality won't allow him to think more complexly than seeing the infection that needs to be destroyed. And that's how he loses the fight with Hijikata. He fires a shot, thinking Hijikata will lose whether he takes it or dodges it, but instead Hijikata forms his own option and doesn't fit Sasaki's expectations. And even afterwards when falling into his trap, surrounded by the Mimawari Gumi with Gen by his side, the two are able to find a way to fight the group without Tetsu being in danger. The dichotomy between the two is obvious, Gen being just like Hijikata, so it's understandable how they could work together on such a similar wavelength. Hijikata and Gen continue their battle, outsmarting both Sasaki and the Mimawari Gumi without killing them, allowing both sides to get credit for taking down the terrorists Tetsu used to be a part of, and neither group having to die that night. While the series of events leading to Hijikata and Ko winning the fight is super satisfying, what really interests me is the connection between Sasaki and Takasugi. You can just feel that some big event is going to happen with Takasugi, Kamui, and possibly Sasaki with his best girl waifu for laifu, and the hype surrounding it is real. To contrast that suspense, the ending is more so a reminder that Tetsu gets where Hijikata is coming from and the struggles they face are shared. Superb arc from character interactions to fights to animation to cinematography, and good setup for whatever is going to come next in the timeline. Hasegawa goes on the Madao equivalent of who wants to be a millionaire so he can pay off someone else's debt, and in the process of trying to figure out the answer to questions, he rediscovers the reason for being there as he'd forgotten. Hasegawa's stories are always more depressing and heartfelt since Hasegawa finds a way to always have the shittiest life possible while still trying to help others that he sees are in more need than he is, and there's a certain admiration you have to give to his character for that. He forgets these experiences because he doesn't want to relive the bad memories and haunt his mind, but nonetheless, he helps people without thinking thinking, and those people help him write back when he needs it. Another one for the Hasegawa stand scrapbook. Gekomaru goes to the Odd Jobs crew because she wants to get Crystal a present for Christmas, but doesn't understand the concept of giving a gift, so they go to a demon festival to look for one. Quite a few callbacks to the past art Gekumaru was involved in here, along with various jokes around the spelling between Satan and Santa. Just a little story about Gekomaru understanding that gifts are important based on the thoughts that they share with others over the material value of said object. Nothing more to it because it doesn't really need to be. New Year's is coming around in the show once again, so Kagura asks Gen for a New Year's card, and upon realizing he's too cheap to do it, her and Shinpachi get a New Year's card to give to someone else. The best jokes have to do with the most cheapskate characters, such as how Gen puts on this big performance to try and make it seem like asking for a card is like asking for a transplant of your kidneys or something. Hasegawa also had a moment where he completely destroyed the fabric of reality to ask for a New Year's card, another perfectly decent holiday special. Gen gets a new kotatsu, which is basically a heated table with a blanket on top, for the new year that basically has a black hole within it, and anyone who goes under it turns into a balding middle-aged man. All the jokes either have to do with, we got under the kotatsu, now we're old and lazy, or, are we really gonna do this for an entire episode, repeated for 24 minutes. The pace was pretty slow, and it never felt like the episode was really going anywhere or building up its jokes to any big punchline, and it really didn't. You don't need a big final joke to end the episode, but I was looking for really anything to get myself in invested and just sort of couldn't. I just found this whole thing kind of boring and overly drawn out, which are probably the worst things a high-octane comedy show like Gintama can be. In the final filler episode of the series, Gin and everyone else takes the time to apologize for everyone they offended, but also not really. As a filler episode, I consider it on the higher end of the spectrum, thanks to the variety of apologies and uses of characters we haven't gotten to see too much this season. The Shin Sengumi could have been used more, but I guess the staff had to sidetrack them for the four minute long compilation of characters apologizing throughout the series. Overall kind of basic, but really what else could I have expected? At least the clip show only took up a small portion of the episode and it wasn't so boringly tedious that I almost forgot forgot to put it in the episode ranking.
In an opposite scenario to back when Gin lost his memory, it appears everyone around him has completely forgotten who he is as a replacement Sakata Kintoki has taken his place. You see, the joke is that Gin means silver and Kin means gold in Japanese, but Kintama is also slang for testicles. This episode goes into some dark themes fast, contemplating the idea that if you're the only person that believes the world is wrong, could it instead be that you're at fault? Could it be that you're living a false life and are only now waking up to reality? As Gin comes comes to a sort of mindset like that where he contemplates his own knowledge and life after being treated like nothing by his closest friends and even stalker, you really feel for him when he hits rock bottom. The person living his life has all the negative qualities of Gin removed, so why would people want him over Kin? Wouldn't they just think he's an imposter? Of course, in actuality that isn't the case, as Tama and Sadaharu remember Gin and know that Kin is actually a robot built by Gin Guy at the request of Kagura and Shinpachi. Whether they've actually been messing with Gin or not is still undetermined, but I can tell much of the emotion of this arc will come down to the fact that a perfect person is impossible, and rather it's flaws that make a person who they are. Great composition so far for the start of an arc with mystery, existential dread, wittiness, and possibility for heart. The title for this episode being a play on Gin's introductory episode was also a nice touch. Gin discovers through Tama that Kin was originally made as a stand-in for Gin while he was away during the break, but Kin slowly not only accepted his role as Gin Toki, but he wanted to become the real one. So he hypnotically removed the memories of everyone in Kabukicho. To remedy this, Gin, Sadaharu, and Tama try to one-up odd jobs to get them to remember. These kind of looking for memory episodes are always fascinating since it gives the cast time to remember why they liked the person they forgot about in the first place, and why they can't be truly forgotten. For Gin, it's his charming flaws, reckless attitude, and serious soul that makes people realize something is missing in their lives with the artificial personality and charm of Kin, something he can't truly replicate as a seemingly perfect double. Gin's true character even gets another chance to shine through when he accepts being replaced as long as the rest of Odd Jobs haven't forgotten who they are and why they help others. Another decision Kin most likely can't comprehend as he hears others say something is missing. You almost can't help but feel bad for him for not being able to fill the role he wants to play, and it shows conflict is coming. Kin takes out Tama as a way of both silencing her and giving him a scapegoat to blame and subsequently get rid of Gin using the rest of Kabukicho. Gin's plan of attack in this episode is quite smart, choosing not really to fight at all, but instead try his best to show who he is to those that have forgotten with actions that defined their relationships with him previously. It kind of continues the theme and events of last episode, except now Gin has to convince everyone on his own whilst they all try to kill him. Of course, a large portion of the memory scenes are triggered through comedic action, but it hits the same either way. So when the the three girls decide to help out Gin based on the tears they all share, you can feel it. Gin and the others continue to fight and regain their memories, even after Kintoki repeatedly removes them and at one point tries to rewrite the entire show. The events of this help cement the relationship between not only Gin, Kagura, and Shinpachi, but all the other characters we've gotten to know more about over the course of the series. True bonds amongst individuals aren't broken when those memories are lost because the emotions that make up their souls will lead them back to one another. Kintoki's flaw was seeing himself as the main character and everyone else as second to him. He created an alternate reality to live as the main character because he longs to be accepted and revered as the perfect being. Unable to understand that no one can truly be perfect and a main character in real life doesn't exist. Upon being humbled, it looks like he might be able to fit in with the rest of the cast while trying to discover his own unique identity. And his character does have plenty of room to grow after all is said and done. And that's because the others accepted him not as the main protagonist of the series, but as his own person with which they can gain new, unique memories. A great conclusion to a truly memorable arc in its own right. Gin and the others are introduced to an old woman living in Yoshiwara who has been waiting for her long lost sweetheart for several decades, so the Odd Jobs crew and Skuyo decide to go looking for him. Not much time is spent on the woman, but considering she's been working in Yoshiwara for several decades, waiting up to her deathbed for this guy, you can feel for her and understand he must have had some real significance for one reason or another. The lost hubby being a former shogun involved in the Amanto War could also lead to some unforeseen conflict, one of my favorite words to use, though I can't determine that now but the Miwara Gumi being there is already one flag. I like seeing the princess from episode 14 return, as she was fun and had a nice connection with Kagura, and the swordswoman Nobume also has some good moments being a total ditzy murder enthusiast. 
Upon infiltrating the castle with the help of the princess, it's discovered that the former shogun, Sarasada, was not the person the old woman spoke to, but rather the princess's grandfather, who had been kept from seeing her due to Sarasada. I already love to hate this fucker because he's a manipulative old stain that used the old woman for her beauty to rise the ranks to shogun with assassinations way back in the day. He didn't allow the grandfather and the woman to leave Ito and keep their promise, and he even tries to kill Sasaki to blame it on the gink crew when they get too close and learn his secrets. The man has has no morals and is a complete underhanded bastard, and that's what makes him so goddamn entertaining to watch. About as entertaining as when Gin, Nobume, and Skuyo get some information from him by weakened at burning the Shogun's unconscious body, showing he's also absent-minded. The grandfather's backstory also endears us to him, hoping he can reach the old woman before her death. And with the Shinsengumi helping the Gin crew escape so that they can fight against the palace for power over the country, shit's definitely about to get intense. Gin and Co. make their charge into the palace and are faced with a new band of assassins known as the Naraku and their leader, Oboro, who has a personal history with Gintuki from back during the Amanto War. This is the first time since Jirocho where a character has been able to defeat Gintoki in both mind and soul, bringing out his demonly side to subsequently crush it. It shows Gin still has many raging emotions he can't control during a fight that's so personal to him, and people like Oboro will use that anger to their advantage in order to win. He uses precise strikes to not only immobilize and poison him, but still leave him in a conscious position to watch as the people he loves are slowly defeated and possibly killed. He's powerful in an unspoken way with a bent moral compass similar to what Sasaki used to be, believing himself and the Naraku to be angels whereas Gin and his friends are devils, like Gin's master he helped kill, but he doesn't flaunt his beliefs like Sasaki. He just lets his actions speak for themselves. The fluidity of the action as a whole has also just gotten a major budget upgrade, and with both the Shinsengumi and Mimawarigumi coming to help, who knows what other fights could happen. It's not only the two main police groups we've come to know who are teaming up, but the entire police force has taken a firm stance against Sadasada thanks to the Shogun previously being aware of Sadasada's crimes. During the fighting back, you can see a bit more into Sadasada's character as he slowly breaks down upon realizing the lie he's built up for several years has come down with the acknowledgement that the people are against him. He's a pathetic man that doesn't care as much about the country as he does himself, and when his self is in danger, he abandons everyone else. The rest of this chapter focuses around Gin and Obero having a rematch fight after Gin, Skuyo, and Nobume stop his and Sarasada's escape. Like I said before, Obero is really straightforward, and in a similar way to others Gin has fought, he calls Gin not only a devil, but a ghost walking a battlefield he doesn't need to fight on anymore. But with his promise to his master to protect all that he holds dear, Gin finds the resolve to move forward for not only himself but those around him, giving him the strength to outsmart and defeat Obero in a pretty sick fight all around. With Sarasada basically defeated, he's killed by Takasugi, and the grandfather is given his chance to meet back up with the old woman he promised to meet with so long ago. Despite quite a lot happening in such a short time, none of it feels bloated but integrated into the story seamlessly. On the aspect of the grandfather, his long-awaited reunion is able to happen as the woman dies in his arms, both being withered by age but allowed to bloom under the light of the full moon in a beautiful send-off. Though he technically didn't have arms to put her hand- Not to try and ruin the moment or anything, I, I, I'm just saying. While it wasn't as much of a focus, the death of Sarasada to Takasugi also shows a few things. For one, it shows how Gin and his ideologies differ if it wasn't already apparent, one wanting to uphold his promise to his master, and another not caring about anything other than avenging him. Second, it's used as an integration to show off the Tendoshu, a manto that controlled the Naraku and wanted Sarasada alive to continue serving as their pawn. They've been looming threats in the story before, but it looks like now they're going to start playing a more active role as their main opposer, the Hitotsubashi, consisting of the Mimowarigumi and Takasugi's group, are declaring war. It's a lot to keep up with, but I'm down for it and hope the two groups are continually expanded on. At no point do I think it'll become a full-on political thriller, but Gin and the others are definitely gonna have a big part to play in their dispute. And ooh baby, it's gonna be grand, I can feel it. Otai and Shin's old training partner, Hajime, comes back to them with a new technique using a beam sword, but due to an accident, he's become half-machine and turns out to have a device in him that could destroy Earth by getting other planets to rage war on it. That being a giant beam cannon made by angry beam sellers. That isn't as much what this part is about, however, and has more to do with establishing Hajime as a sympathetic, likable character that doesn't want to do wrong to anyone, or at least his regular self wouldn't. From his past, it can be determined he's a real laugh-in-the-face-a-defeat kind of guy that doesn't get 
give up easily, showing where Otai got that side of herself from, and he wants to stay friends with Otai and Shinpachi despite how long they've been apart. Whether his robot side will force him to do something bad, I don't know, but beyond him being a living Star Wars reference, I found him pretty charming, and the episode was enough to get me invested in how the relationship between him and the Shimura siblings will end up. Gin and everyone else becomes aware of the fact that Hajime is a ticking time bomb, and he has to be dealt with. So Gin plays a villain role to get Otai and Shinpachi away so he can fight without interruption. The central theme and recurring idea presented during this episode has to do with figurative little brothers, older brothers, and what they think is best for one another. When he was hanging with Hajime, Shinpachi wanted to feel like he had an older brother again and relive old memories, even if in some ways he was being lied to by Hajime, whose body is being used by the machine attached to him. And Gin understands this. He doesn't want to give Shinpachi more false memories with Hajime. So he plays a villain to give Shin something to be mad out without knowing that his interactions with Hajime to that point were false or not genuine. Gin wants to defeat the robot side of Hajime to keep Shin from continuing to gain these false memories, not knowing the memories were faked, and to give Shin the opportunity to talk to the real Hajime before both sides of him die out. All while Shin and Otai are kept safe by the Shin Sengumi, he begged to help out. Gin wants to selfishly shoulder all the blame for taking away Shin's brother figure, even if that means losing their trust, and Shin is able to come to that revelation, giving him the strength and resolve to fight alongside Gin to fight the imposter Hajime, not as brothers, but as friends. Kondo and Kyubei also help out in their own big brother to a bunch of people who follow them type of way. Shinpachi gets the confidence to strike down Hajime, both being able to see their true selves as they strike each other down. Hajime then saves the planet at the cost of himself, using the cannon initially meant to destroy. There's plenty of symbolism here, mainly from the smiling tears Otai, Hajime, and Shin give as he's blown away, showing that they all have grown from the start of the series, but still hold on to their humanity to keep a sense of self. The following vacation of Otai and Shin could be seen as a way that they try to keep their promise to Hajime and smile through the tears with the money he left them. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see Hajime become more antiquated with the main cast before his death, but hey, at least he went out how he wanted to, protecting those he cared about with a smile. Sadaharu is fed up with not being fed as much as he wants to by odd jobs, so he runs away and in the process of looking for food, helps out an abandoned puppy. I find it fascinating how subconsciously, Sadaharu tries to start out the episode doing what Gin and crew tried to do when they first found him. Trying to find someone to take the puppy in, but then gaining an attachment to it as he learns the puppy's owner died. Continuing the parallels as Sadaharu cares for the dog, he comes to understand the importance of sharing with little to give, and that helps him develop responsibility and pull himself into the shoes of Gen. A straightforward story about what it takes to be a pet owner and how much some people have to sacrifice in order to keep those pets along with themselves going. Gin finds a time-altering clock left by some Amanto, and almost immediately breaks it when he has to wake up in the morning, leaving the world frozen for everyone but him and the Odd Jobs crew. I do kind of wonder why it was only them specifically who were spared from the time stop, but if it isn't explained, that could actually make it funnier since you just gotta accept it. It's a pretty typical Frozen Time episode with the characters messing around, going too far ahead or back in time, playing pranks on people, accidentally killing them, etc. The only major difference it has from the other time stop episodes is its Cast, and that's really enough to make the concept itself funnier. This is a concept made or broken by the cast, and it's the Gintama cast, so yeah, it's a job well done. The gang continues trying to move forward in time by getting a battery to recharge the low energy clock. This is one of those instances where the entire episode has a constant escalation with no rhyme or reason, and that's what makes it fun to watch. Every attempt made to make it easier to get the battery leads to them somehow making the situation far worse, or even giving life to inanimate objects. Sometimes the changes go beyond regular time stuff and instead just break the fourth wall by changing the sound effects used for impact, but I don't have a problem with that since it's a nonsense story anyway. Moderately enjoyable, though the ending was a bit weird if not... Uh, creative, I guess. Yamazaki gives a crush on Tama while doing one of his patrols, so the Shinsengumi try to get him together with her so he can spy more in-depthly on the odd jobs. Previously, he had a segment where he ate Anpan continually until he went mad from it, so seeing him get a sort of similar obsession with Tama after hearing inspiring words from her isn't too out of the ordinary for his character, and there's a joke in of itself that the person Yamazaki fell in love with was a literal robot. Getting the others get a bit annoying down the line where they tried to constantly critique each other like disapproving families do, 
but Yamazaki and Tama have enough good moments to balance it out and make the whole thing more bearable. Judging by the ending, this kind of relationship doesn't seem like it's going to continue in the series, but at the least, it was cute and humorous while it lasted. For this two-parter, on one hand, Gin is brought in to try and make learning a bit more fun for Seita, and on the other, Shin is given some fan service manga and needs Gin's help to try and hide them from Otai. Both harbor a lot of creative potential and are executed in laugh-out-loud ways. In the learning segment, Gin's lack of knowledge of history makes him completely make it up with Skuyo to try and get Seita invested in the real thing. The fact almost none of the humor has to do with actual Japanese history and instead goes off the walls insane works to its advantage, and the team of Skuyo and Gin is as lovable as always. The other segment has Gin coming up with stupid ways to try hiding the magazine without actually hiding them. And the same absurd humor applies, taking a simple concept and making it more needlessly complicated than it needs to be, and those are usually the best in terms of comedy. Two two-segmenters in a row, baby! First, Sachan decides to put up a two-sided mirror to look into what Gin is doing, but finds the others revealing their weirdest secrets instead. It's simple, but works well enough. Nothing much else there. Second, Yamazaki is feeling self-doubt because of his small-time job, so he goes off to get a ninja license. Zenzo makes an appearance for the first time in a while alongside Yamazaki, but the episode mostly just has running gags and jokes about this old woman being treated really badly. Not my favorite short, was kind of repetitive and didn't seem to have much of an ending plan, but it was also all right. All the former Joy members are invited to a reunion by an unknown person they all used to fight alongside, and the rest of the episode is dedicated to trying to figure out who or what he is. I wouldn't exactly call it a mystery as much as an excuse to let Katsura and Sakamoto do some of their trademark misunderstanding and hallucinations to comedic effect. Though it doesn't happen too often, I like watching Gin play the role of the straight man when the people around him just become too insane for him to handle, and the duo of Katsura and Sakamoto seem tailor-made for that purpose. Always inadvertently getting each other mad for stupid reasons. For a second, I did actually think Takasugi was also going to be here, but the fact he isn't and the way he was revealed to be so is even better. I do actually want to know who this guy they're trying to remember is, though, and I guess that's what the second part is for. Turns out this guy, Kurokono, wasn't the one who called the meeting, but rather Takasugi's group looking to take them down so that they can't intervene in the future. The first third of the episode was dedicated to showing a flashback where the group thinks they kill Kurokono when setting off an explosive, but other than serving as a catalyst for Gin to think they're being haunted, it doesn't play too much of a role in saying anything about who Kurokono is. Later on, he does actually come to help Gin and the others out, having just been a person that wanted to fade into the background rather than being remembered, but we don't really get that feel in the opening flashback. I don't know, I just wish there was a little more characterization to start. The ghost scenes are nice to see after a while. I can't even remember the last time the show actually brought up the fact that Gintoki is scared of ghosts. But the implementation works. Only complaints I have are that Kurokono was a bit underdeveloped, Katsura and Sakamoto weren't really used as much as I would have liked, and it would have been a nice touch to have Takasugi's reaction upon hearing the others tried to kill them. It's all nice and entertaining by itself, but I feel like there was more that could have been given here that wasn't. Hijikata finds a winning lottery ticket that just so happens to be Gin's, so the two spend the rest of the story imagining that they've been chased by different people. These kind of tales about how money makes you act incredibly paranoid are something I quite like because not only does it allow for the writers to give the lead stupid hallucinations, but there's an actual message in there about how stupid the lottery actually is. You want money super badly, but as soon as you get it in a lump sum, of course you're going to be incredibly paranoid that someone else wants it. That kind of paranoia could lead to you thinking you're being chased, fighting over with others, or, I don't know, accidentally joining a group of mohawked bandit robbers and stealing 300 million yen. It's all played up for comedy's sake, obviously, but it does present a real issue that people face when they win something large out of nowhere. First, the Odd Jobs crew tries to come up with a poster to represent the group. I like the idea not only because there's an unlimited number of posters that can be parodied, but also, from a graphic designer's point of view, I can also find humor in how they parody common templates for businesses and so on. In the end, what wins out is accidental simplicity, and yeah, you shouldn't overthink a design. The second segment has to do with the new four divas of Kabukicho, now including Otai, having to figure out a mascot for the district to bring in tourism. Same kind of commentary as before, except in this case, they'll go all out with the weird imagery and some experimental visuals. 
Finally, the moment we've all been waiting for, the Rule 63 arc. Kyubei gets tricked by a group of hermaphroditic space extremists into turning Kabugicho upside down and changing everyone's gender within. Kyubei is most discussed in this because of her androgynous appearance and philosophy, not really being against her womanly attributes, but also still dressing and on the surface acting like a man. The Space Cult is a good antagonist to Kyubei and the others because they see gender roles in black and white, taking their gender very seriously. So someone like Kyubei is going to make them mad. Otai staying the same gender from being out of town also presents Kyubei with the conflicting idea of if they're satisfied in their original body. There's also the obvious fun of seeing what the characters we followed for so long would look like if they were the opposite gender. So that leads to a lot of big titty anime women and Shinpachi getting pink glasses frames. And those kind of subtle running jokes are also something I appreciate in Gintama as a whole. Now with the Shinsengumi and others by their side, the gang tries to find the base of operations for the cultists while acting like the stereotypical versions of their gender to not be seen as heretics. The religious thing is nothing but a hoax, however, as they're nothing more than people with a satellite laser that wanted to test out a new serum they made. Kyubei's identity crisis continues after seeing Otai is inadvertently attracted to her as a male, tempting Kyubei to want to stay in her male body. Though it isn't too expanded on in this specific episode. It's pretty rich though watching as Hiji Kata and Gin fail at acting as women in front of the guards, only for Skuyo and Sachan to show up and basically tell them to just fucking fight, followed by the girls and men's bodies all completely upstaging them. This arc will only be complete though if we see Hasegawa as a girl. Come on, show. The Kabukicho crew infiltrates the Earth base of the cultists to find that they've already planned ahead and sent another beam down to Earth, turning everyone back into the way they were originally. Unless maybe they were in Yoshiwara. I mean, Skuyo and the Hyaka initially were changed, but we don't know for sure if uh, never mind. The point is, just like all the groups went off and got driver puns when they became screwdrivers, a large portion of this is spent showing how the various gangs are doing as the opposite gender, while everyone else is the same. The message here has to do with being your true self, and upon seeing everyone trying to adjust for her after being contemplative about turning back or not, Kyubei discovers that she's fine the way she is, as the cultists shouldn't determine who or what others can be. No female Hasegawa though, so I'll be expecting a written apology on my desk soon. Following another story with Seita, he's embarrassed to eat lunch at school with the massive lunches his mom makes, so she brings together the help of almost every girl in Kabukicho to try and make a normal lunch, obviously failing in the process. Despite the more outlandish aspects, this ended up feeling like one of the most realistic episodes as it portrays a real struggle that kids go through, that being shyness about social norms and fitting in. Taking into account his past, Seita would want to fit into such a place, so having constant failure after failure, slowly drifting him from the class, would make him angry since he feels like he's missing out. In reality, his inability to show gratitude publicly for his mom's work was what led to the drift he experienced, and by opening up to others by letting them join and see what he's having, he's able to overcome that obstacle and make friends, a straightforward story about a relatable concept executed in a mostly realistic manner. Gin runs into a reaper trying to kill herself named Asaimon, and finds out she's a personal executor for the shogun that kills undesirable people. The reason she tried to kill herself was to make it seem as though she committed the crimes her father did, that being letting prisoners go years back. And the crimes her brother also did, who's been killing those people that he let out. Straight off the bat, both Asaimon and her adoptive brother Yaimon are clearly defined as characters. Asaimon has a deep attachment to the family that took her in, and from being so close to them, she feels a moral obligation to keep their name out of the mud, even if it means soiling her own. Yaiman is a ruthless manipulative type with the facade of a smile always on his face, kind of like a mix between Takasugi and Kamui. He's not above using people close to him if he can seize an opportunity in doing so, and he's willing to do anything to fix his father's mistakes, including killing those the government doesn't want him to. And as it's revealed that Gin was on the list of people freed, it could mean that Yaiman plans to use him to fill a similar purpose. It also hints that Gin and the Saimon's father have history, adding another layer to the complexity to one of the best to find arc starters so far. Gin and the others are given a job to transport Asaimon away from the Shinsengumi, only to find out from them that the transport was nothing but a setup to get the Odd Jobs crew killed so that Yaimon could get in good with the opposing political faction mentioned before, the Hitotsubashi. That's also how he kept Asaimon from being executed initially, since the Mimowarigumi are associated with them and bent the rules. As I predicted before, Yaimon is always willing to jump at an opportunity to get his goals met, in this case taking Asaimon's situation and making it about killing Gin. 
Speaking of a Simon, she's given development by coming to terms with the death of her father, which she carried out. Learning he was a strong man that lived by a personal code to help others, giving her the strength to want to defeat Yaimon as appeasement. Don't know how that fight's going to go, but with the odd jobs and Shinsengumi involved, some shit is definitely about to go down. Damn, a lot of bombshells dropped. First, Yaimon was never officially given that title by his father. He had heavy devotion, but his bloodlust consumed and kept him from being able to deal out executions with the grace that would allow them to die as humans. So he felt jealousy when Asaimon was chosen over him for the title, implying Yaimon helped in discovering the past of his father. Gin actually knew the father and Asaimon more than he let on. Having been imprisoned after taking part of the fall for Asaimon's biological father's crimes, who was wanting to sell her to pay off his debts. Gin was set free because of her adoptive father knowing his heart, and the two together are able to defeat Yaimon with the grace and humanity he never had. Subsequently, they metaphorically kill each other's past selves, a Saimon doing so to rise as a merciful executioner, and Gin to move past his life as a demon to be seen as a regular human again. The leader of the Hitotsubashi, Nobunobu, is also shown off for the first time alongside Takasugi, leaving us the viewer with both a newfound sense of hope for Gin, along with one of mystery for what Nobunobu plans to do in trying to become sure. Shogun. Cooling down from the more serious arc with a normal premise, Hasegawa is making money scaring kids with stories at the park, but he's run out of stories, so he goes to the gang crew to help him brainstorm. He uses a few horror story tropes for openings, then by the end goes back to having some character from Saint Seiya always show up to ruin the mood. It's alright, does the job, nothing too of note one way or another, other than some copyright jokes. Gin sets up a confession booth to try and make money off the people telling their sins to Tama, but slowly he realizes that most of them are talking about him. It gives off similar vibes to that episode where everyone was hidden by a POV shot looking at a bartender confessing their secrets. But this time you can tell who everyone is as they tell a cohesive story. There's some good wit from the encounters, but what's more interesting to me is that there is a part 2 episode about the Shogun losing his memories and joining Katsura, and to be honest that sounds more interesting, so I'm just gonna get to that. Katsura takes in the Shogun, with both sides acting like they don't know each other, to get a feel for what the other is like, and Katsura finds he's not quite as liked as the Shogun. While other Katsura-focused stories have gone more for the moral or philosophical side to why Katsura does what he does, none have been particularly about his own skill as a leader. We've seen the Joy be really incompetent, and we've seen Katsura be incompetent in life, but now it's the first time we've seen him actually questioning his own skills. To be honest, he is somewhat of an incompetent leader, and that shows in how easily the Shogun is able to outwit him when also being pretty idiotic himself. But that adds to the charm of Katsura as a character, and shows him to be human just as the Shogun is. Either way, this episode shows us that no matter who wins in the end, the Japan of Gintama is definitely fucked. Kondo is disparaging because Otai didn't go with him to a festival, so he dresses up as a roach and just so happens to run into her. The rest of the encounter is a series of gags involving Gin and the others trying to keep the two from winning carnival games they set up. Not sure how much Otai was in on the whole thing beyond knowing that Kondo was under the mask, but the gags do also show that she's still a considerate person who's willing to put up with Kondo when he isn't being a stalker dumbass. Gin just sort of takes advantage of the situation as he does, but since Otai and Kondo go to multiple stalls, you would think that maybe there would be some more characters to run into who are manning them, but I digress. Glad we got an episode dedicated to Kondo and Otai. I can't actually remember another time that really happened since the first appearance he had in the show. Other than that, it's just okay. Firstly, Kagura is playing with the princess and trying to find ways to enjoy watermelon, when some crooks come and try to kidnap her. Basically every joke was about using moves from Dragon Quest and for the princess misinterpreting what the Odd Jobs crew is saying. Second part has Seita trying to write about his summer in a diary he forgot to fill out, so he goes to Odd Jobs for help. It's like the first part in that most of the jokes had to do with one thing, that being Laputa Castle in the Sky, a Ghibli movie, but it's also got the added benefit of the characters messing around with other sections of his summer work and so on. It's at least got a bit more substance than the first part, but both are still pretty average. Gin and Hijikata both get hit by an isekai bus with an invention by Gin Guy to extract eggs to put on rice, so instead of being transported to another world, they switch bodies Freaky Friday style. Now, with the two of them having completely different viewpoints on not only discipline but life in general, trying to play each other's roles leads to them changing the teams they're a part of. Odd jobs getting more structured and the Shinsengumi being more free and also more Fist of the North Starry, if you get my drift. What makes these scenarios fun is not only how they react to the whole thing, but how everyone 
everyone around them reacts to it, since it usually leads to the characters changing some ways in personality, and this episode has that idea down. The new odd jobs in Shin Sangumi even still end up clashing because their viewpoints are so incredibly different that conflict becomes inevitable. I'm also so glad the setup for the event wasn't like, Man, I hate my life. I wish I could just do what you do. Because that's so contrived it makes me want to scream. So far, other than that, the story has played out how you'd expect it to, though that isn't a negative, but I'm gonna go ahead and assume things are about to get weird very fast. The machine to bring Gen and Hijikata back isn't working because a bit of Gen's soul split in half and went up a cat's asshole, creating this monstrosity that the two factions are both after. This focuses much more on the conflict aspect of the last part, and shows off the larger parts of each group and how they've been affected. I will say it is interesting to see characters like Katsura and Hasegawa join odd jobs after the switch, but they don't have a part to play in the ensuing fight, so while it's mildly funny, since it doesn't contribute to the story, those scenes feel a little bit fillery. The other focus here is the cat itself, which retained only Gin's worst attributes and got taken in by Otai as a pet. Their dynamic is honestly much more enjoyable than the expansion scene I mentioned previously, plus it's more important to the story since Hijikata and Gin needed to be able to switch back, so I wish it was shown off a bit more. Hope hopefully the last part will make up for the slack this episode left with some of its less necessary or memorable, though still mildly entertaining bits. While Gin and Hijikata try to get the cat monstrosity away from Otsai, to get a feel for the troubles they went through in each other's bodies, the subordinates of both groups switch bodies at random, making for some truly remarkable changes like Shin and Yamazaki being glasses, and Hasegawa being the shit within Sadaharu. Other than having plenty of good jabs for each character to throw at one another with a different body, there is an actual lesson to be learned in that people are who they are regardless of what body they may be in, and in the end, their priorities and personalities will make their physical facade disappear appear to reveal their true selves. It also looks like Hijikata and Gin learned a thing or two from being in one another's shoes, though I don't really think we're going to see much of a difference in how they act. Still, a satisfying ending with plenty of amazing weird twists, like Hasegawa and Yamazaki growing limbs to turn into an unstoppable shit monster to fight the cat monster giving us a bit more backstory on Mutsu and Sakamoto's relationship, this episode presents two simultaneous stories about where they were and where they are now, on both occasions Sakamoto being taken in by space pirates. We've known from the beginning that Sakamoto is mostly oblivious but capable of scoring a deal and fighting, but seeing him do so on such a small scale shows he doesn't just do it for the profit or thrill of looking after a deal, but rather to get smiles on people's faces as that's what excites him, even when he's a prisoner bargaining with slaves. He's also always had a sort of love-slash-hate relationship with Mutsu, and by the flashback it's clear that was never not the case. He still means a lot to her though, as can be seen by in the flashback when Mutsu was a more closed off person. I mean, she's still closed off, but seeing Sakamoto make deals to bring joy to people made her interested in something for the first time in her life, and it made her see a new point of view like she had never seen before. So you'd expect that she'd want to help him after her father dies and her commander plans to kill her, leaving Mutsu with nothing else to live for. It's one of those you give me a purpose kind of stories, and I thoroughly enjoy them for how they can make characters who appeared hopeless come back to life with new goals. Plus, it gives another layer of depth for Sakamoto and Mutsu's incredibly back-and-forth relationship, and why she'd want to try and save him when he's caught by the same pirates in the present. Capping off the flashback from before and moving to the present, Gin and Mutsu storm the pirate ship to beat the crew and get Sakamoto. While the last bit of the story had the theme of how helping others can be beneficial to you as well, the theme here has more to do with the value of people beyond their looks and what they can provide to others when given the opportunity. This applies both to Mutsu and the slaves Sakamoto set free, as both then and now, the set free slaves helped Sakamoto form his group and overthrow the space pirates, and Mutsu is not only a skilled fighter that was thrown away when she was thought to have no more use, but she's also a Yato clan member, apparently. But yeah, good message, good backstory, even better episode. Be good to people. First, Shin pulls the card I'm surprised the show hadn't up till this point, and recognizes that the crew wears the exact same outfit every day and goes to change. Usually the writers will do this so that they can change the character designs up slightly for variety, but instead here, the mangaka opts to just have the crew's various clothing pieces explained as they try new things. Less often seen in shorts where the characters point out their fashion is actually explaining how and why they're able to do it, so this gets an immediate plus for that alone, and the clothes changing is just as pleasant. The other segment deals with Shinpachi finding a move for his dojo to use as an ultimate technique, and the rest of the short is spent beating Shinpachi up with it. I like the game style they approach the fighting with, and it does well with its short time, incorporating plenty of new jokes and running gags. 
Kondo finds a thief that takes him under his wing, not knowing that Kondo is a police officer. The main idea conveyed here comes in the form of loyalty to a moral code versus personal beliefs for a seemingly greater good. The thief turns out to be Kondo's old master, who originally taught Kondo not to steal, but did so himself to pay for repairs on a temple that was destroyed long ago when Kondo tried to protect it after some loan sharks took the deed. In both instances, you can see that it didn't end up working for them despite their good intentions, and Kondo was able to realize that himself by the end of the episode, cuffing his old master in a heartwarming goodbye as he dies. Simplistic idea, amusing execution, touching ending. Katsura puts on an afro to try and infiltrate the Shinsengumi, but he's stuck with a silent, shy, afro samurai called Saito of the Silent Squad. I am of the firm belief that a shy, silent-type character works with basically everyone for the sheer variety of interactions that can be made from it. The silence itself can also be indicative of many different things, in this case being that Saito is just a lonely boy with massive social anxiety, but everyone thinks he's a cool stoic type. The dynamic gets even better when Katsura believes Saito is trying to kill or intimidate him, when Really, he's just trying to make friends with the help of odd jobs. Katsura has been able to make connections with the Shinsengumi by going undercover before, so seeing him actually make friends with one would offer an interesting new conflict. Having successfully infiltrated the Shinsengumi, Katsura plans to use Saito's inability to speak to get him executed and take over the squad he led. It's been a while since courtrooms were used as a backdrop for the story, but just as it was used for Hasegawa all that time back, it's used well once again with the odd jobs crew speaking for Saito as the trial goes on, making tons of Mr. Magoo-like mistakes and misinterpretations. What I appreciate most about the humor of this episode is that it's completely character-based and has almost no references or non-sequiturs. Not that I dislike the more reference-heavy material since there's plenty to laugh at even without knowing what's being referenced, but humor based off of character traits set up in the previous part is equally impressive, and through the comedy, the story is still able to convey Katsura and Saito's now more complicated relationship. It's kinda like Batman and Joker, but with less mysteries and more afros, and I'm hopeful it'll be used in the future installments because it's a relationship we haven't seen from the series yet that I quite like. I won't really count these two episodes as part of the series since they're OVAs, but they're more Gintama content that are canonical to the story, so I should look at them anyway. Also, sorry for the incredibly low quality on these, I searched far and wide for HD, but there was never an official HD sub to part- watched an ethical way to our corporate overlords, so this was the best footage I could find of it. To spare your eyes from looking at it too long, I'll just put it into one section. A drug from Yoshiwara causing people to fall in love at first sight has been going around via a single person wanting to mess with the residents of Ido, so Gin and Skuyo get on the case to try and solve it. The weird concept allows for the mangaka to basically do his interpretation of fanfics about his characters in the dumbest way possible, and it's hilarious. Gin and Skuyo, Otai and Kondo, Kagura and Shinpachi's glass, Glasses, tons of random matchups fans have been looking for, also that they can be made fun of by the original creator. The main plot does actually have a purpose with a theme that love using drugs and so on isn't true and won't fill the hole in your heart left by a loved one. And I'm down with that, but I'm a bit too focused on laughing my ass off as Gin turns into Glenn Quagmire and tries to fuck everything in sight. About what you'd expect from an OVA. <laughs> Kagura gets mad that everyone's forgotten her gimmick of feeling weak in the sun, so she fakes having an illness to get people to remember. These kinds of episodes only really work when you know from the beginning that the character is faking it, and they have to spend the rest of the time getting what they deserve for faking. And I'm glad the episode took that route. Specifically, they took the escalation tactic, where it gets to a point that she can't tell anyone or get beaten to smithereens. So it increasingly becomes better and better as she perpetually digs herself a hole she can never climb out of, as everyone acts like she's already dead. The ending Things are what make or break these kind of stories though, so... Yeah, they landed the ending. Okita knows that Kagura is faking as he sets up a funeral for her that the entire nation is watching. From there, it all plays out like a regular funeral, but also in the most disrespectful way you could possibly hold one. Something about Kagura suffering in this episode is just side-splittingly amazing to watch. Probably because she brought it all on herself. There's also a legit moment for Kagura to reflect on why she decided to try playing sickness and come to understand she already knew how the others felt and just kind of acted the way she did because she was angry. Okita knew that this better than anyone, which is why he set the funeral up the way he did so Kagura would be able to learn a lesson or die in the process, so either way it's a win for him. As a whole, it's probably just as good as the other funeral episode involving grave desecration. 
Following two stories of manga artist Shachi in prison, he first wants to try asking a nurse out using manga, but she keeps misinterpreting it. I like the aspect of the manga drastically changing as he keeps making it because she puts anything other than the answer he wants. In the second bit, Gin and Shachi are given the chance to show off their manga, but they have to write it in a day, so they enlist the help of a bunch of perverts to try and get it finished. Besides getting to see the underwear bandit again, the visual gags were also pretty fun, though I think they could have gotten just a little bit further if they wanted. Gin and Co. have to take over for Tetsuko the Swordsmith from way back in the Benizakura arc, but the gang keeps getting really weird figures they have to deal with. You'd think that after almost 300 episodes I get a bit tired of RPG humor, but nope, still love it. Still, some of the funniest shit the show has to offer. Even when it's as simple as good and evil switching, that charm is immeasurable. The other story has Tama grow an attachment to an old vending machine right before the shop next to it closes. Since Tama can talk to machines, she helps the old thing work until it can't anymore, letting it feel useful and like it's more than just scrap metal. As a robot, Tama would have to face the inevitability of many of the things she talks to being thrown away as junk, so she probably has gone through this process before, and that only makes the interaction sadder because all she wants to do is make it feel at home. Both have some of the best short stories in different genres, and that's pretty impressive. The Shogun is being targeted for an assassination, so different people go in different directions with fake Shoguns to try and confuse the attackers, Gin and Co. obviously being included. Since this is really just an introduction episode to set up all the major elements, it does its job effectively. The ones attacking the Shogun are the Hitotsubashi, headed by Kamui and Takasugi, with the new Shogun candidate Nobunobu acting basically as a puppet alongside the Mimawari Gumi. Those protecting the Shogun are the Odd Jobs, Shinsen Gumi, and Sachan's group of ninjas. I mean, that is other than Zenzo, who, despite being shown as nothing more than a ninja with hemorrhoids in the past, actually does have significant skill and is made out to be an intimidating force for once. Whether he's working for the Hitotsubashi or just doing it for the thrill of possibly killing the Shogun, we don't know yet, but either way, his betrayal and possible killing of the Shogun shows his determination and skill. Plus, it sets up the tone for the upcoming arc to be darker than those in the past, and I'm all for it. Gin and Co. are still there to provide comedic moments, but seeing the series take on another serious arc should be good as they've been able to do it with the Jiraiya and Yoshiwara's burning arcs before them. This can best be described as shit hits the fan the episode. Every decoy shogun branch and their respective fighters are targeted by the Hitotsubashi, including Zinzo's own ninja group he gathered to fight Sachans. The group's reason for doing so is also sound, not really caring where the shogun himself is, but since the shogun's best forces are being used, the best way to cripple his forces is not to cut off the head, but rather cut off all the limbs. If the head is detached, it can grow back, but if the body is so destroyed it can't come back together, it's defeated. We also get to see Kamui versus Okita, and there really a perfect match because the two have incredibly similar personalities, but one fights for the sake of something while the other does so just because, making them clash. It basically ends in a draw as you'd expect, but Kamui in the whole thing is shown to be more surprised in the encounter, letting us know how much closer in power they are to one another than it appears. Zenzo continues to fight not only for the thrill of killing the Shogun, as he'd like to go on, but because his home was destroyed by Kamui and the other Yato, and he needs to keep it safe by keeping his promise to them. This adds a layer of depth to Zenzo that he puts on a face to fool others, but has reasons for why he does things beyond the thrill like Kamui. The Shogun also just so happened to make a deal with the same ninjas before this happened, so he's okay, as is in character with our legendary boy. Okay, rewind on Zenzo there for a second. Upon the gang crew making it back to the ninja city, it's revealed Zenzo actually killed a fake shogun intentionally, not only to keep Shige Shige the real shogun alive, but also to figuratively get rid of the shogun title so there'd be no reason to target him. Along with that, we finally get to know the history of Zenzo and Shige Shige as friends. Through the past, Shige Shige's genuine kindness and love for people is recognized by how he's willing to break his role as shogun if he can save someone that wanted to protect him. Similarly to Kondo, he sees all the people that fight for him as on an equal playing field, so they should be respected just as much as he is, including by Shige himself. His particular fondness for the ninja villains in Zenzo comes from their past being together, not only making the ninja as a whole comrades in a war or citizens to take care of, but friends to bestow loyalty to. The ninja aren't helping Shige out of an obligation as the shogun, but because of who he is as a person and what he means to them on an individual level. And he's really humanized by that kind of bond, and it also makes Takasugi a perfect antithesis. He holds no respect for anyone one other than himself and doesn't care about doing anything other than causing destruction for others. It doesn't matter if the government or shogun is taken down, his lust for destruction will drive him to kill and maim anything he sees without discrimination if they get in his way. That's what leads him to the ninja village to destroy it, and that's what leads to the upcoming conflict we're about to see unwind. 
With the ninja having to split up upon the destruction of their village, the odd jobs in Shinsengumi are also split up, one stuck fighting the Yato, and the other taking on Kamui and Takasugi. Beyond some more momentary questioning from Shigeshige of why he chose to become the Shogun and Sachan getting a second to reminisce about things going back to normal, this is basically nothing but non-stop action and boy, it does look nice. The fights between the odd jobs and Shinsengumi against the Yato especially has some great choreography and fluid animation. Shigeshige and Shinpachi even get a few hits in. We all know this is just build up for Gin versus Takasugi and Kagura versus Kamui though, so let's just get to that. Getting to the action, Kagura and Gin take on their respective foes while everyone else holds each other back from the fights. What the two battles have in common is that it's not only a battle of strengths, but a battle of wills and to get back at each other for the past. Kagura sees her younger self with Kamui being an entirely different life, one she restarted after meeting Shin and Gin, so she doesn't want Kamui to be able to take yet another life away from her like he did when he cast her aside. Gin and Takasugi are fighting for themselves and the knowledge that their battle will be a determining factor in what happens to the land of Ido as a whole. Interspersed with that fight, we get flashbacks to when they met as complete strangers, and how their master Shoyo brought the two and Katsura together under one roof. Both constantly dealt with failure in their lives, but Takasugi hadn't been forced to get strong up to the point he met Gin, so he lost in a battle of wills. Takasugi remedied this by going back to the dojo every day for another fight until he could beat Gin, sharpening his skills while making friends at the dojo along the way. It's important to know all of this, as with their master being taken from them and their home destroyed, the one place Takasugi felt it was safe to show his emotions was in Sin generated never to return. His world was burnt down, so he seeks to destroy the same world that took everything from him. Gin has already had a life of misery and death, so the destruction weighed on him as well and still does, but he's able to move forward by looking at the future and promising to protect everything he cares for to never lose it again. It looks like Gin may have lost the battle now, but I should wait until the next episode before I make a final decision. Still, an amazing, self-contained multitude of stories for both teams' fighters that define the characters in such a well-constructed, complete fashion. As the battle rages on between Gin and Takasugi, more and more of their past is uncovered, from Katsura and Takasugi abandoning their past to live on and continue with Gin and Shoyo, to their final battle together as four, to the unfortunate death of Shoyo at the hands of Gin himself. As you could gather, Gin would never want to do this himself, but he had to choose between two things, kill his friends or kill his master. And he chose based not on his own will, but rather that of Shoyo for his final wish. Gin had more reason than everyone to want Shoyo alive since he basically gave Gin a life he never got to have before. And like Gin, Takasugi felt the same way, but he could never betray the trust of that person. So at his wish, he killed Shoyo to keep the things he cared for most, his students, alive. Takasugi rebukes this event because he not only was unable to protect his master, but he made Gintoki bear the action he was never given the chance to make, though he knows he'd do the same thing. Gin represents a different part of Takasugi that he refuses to accept because it led to his master being dead. So he repressed that self and tried to destroy everything to forget but his fight with Gin makes him remember and embrace that side he knows his master would have wanted him to show, knowing only they can stop each other as fellow students. Then Obero, the guy who originally made Gin choose between the two, whom we saw previously in another arc, stabs Takasugi, intending to take both out after letting them go free before. And I hate this man so much in a good way for possibly ending such a meaningful fight the way he did. I gotta know what happens next. With the reintroduction of Obero and the Noraku, so are Nobunobu and the Amanto pulling the strings behind the entirety of the government in Gintama, the Tendoshu, who come to clean up the scraps after the Hitotsubashi and Gin's factions have finished fighting. Turns out, Nobunobu got well enough to order the attacks on Kamui and Takasugi for using him, inadvertently being used by the Tendoshu to fill in as Shogun with the resignation Shigeshige had made way back when being brought into action. The betrayal and crumbling of the plan Kamui and Takasugi made is so enticing to watch as past plot elements are brought back up in succession of one another for the Tendoshu to use. It really shows how they were able to stay in power for so long, shamelessly taking out those they fought along with their allies if it means being able to rule above all else. Like Takasugi and his men, however, they hold the same flaw of not retaining real loyalty to anyone but themselves, making the bonds they share weak. Shige, on the other hand, cares deeply for all of those that he rules over, and gains respect by making not only connections but friendships with those that matter to him. So that's what makes it so satisfying when the rest of the Shin Sengumi come in to help. With their plan in shambles and both being beaten up themselves, Kamui and Takasugi even decide to join Kagura and Gin in fighting Obero's men to get a chance to fight once again. This is all coming to a big finish with some of the best episodes of the show, with betrayal after betrayal after non-betrayal after twist after twist as stepping stones. Let's get to it!
Having all factions come to a standstill, each group retreats as Nobunobu is given the new title of Shogun. Shigeshige, on the other hand, secluding himself in an imperial home for safety to try acting no longer as the Shogun, but rather as a normal person who will allow the people to live by their hearts rather than his command. For the most part, it's a rather subdued and calm finisher, though everyone but the Tendoshu have come out scathed. Everyone appears to be ready to live another day, but for Shigeshige, that doesn't come, being poisoned by a needle given to him by an old friend controlled by the Tendoshu. The the action holds major significance because Shige Shige had previously asked Matsudaira and crew to not guard him, so that he could act as a normal person and trust those supporting him, leading to a situation the Tendoshu took advantage of. It's a complicated feeling you received seeing it, however, since Shige wanted to die in such a way, not having a grand death as a shogun, but a short and less boisterous one as Shige Shige, being allowed to die sipping his sister's tea and taking a final nap in her lap. The cast is left with an unknowingly large hole in their hearts from not a great leader, but a great friend they'd only just gotten to know and the arc ends on that note, leaving the future uncertain as all parties recoil from the previous battle. The way that Shige Shige is portrayed up to the very end shows his character growth to appreciate all those around him even more than before, and gives him a sad end he could see coming but chose to accept to hold true to his own ideals. It's subtle and nuanced and a perfect ending to an arc so full of emotion and action to calm the viewer but also make them want more. It really does feel like we're on the precipice of something much more than Gintama ever was. Since Nobunobu has taken over as Shogun, his first means of business is disbanding the Shinsengumi to appoint the Mimawari Gumi in its place, planning to kill Kondo and Matsudaira to frame them as responsible for the death of the Shogun. The episode as a whole feels really bleak in its outlook, and that's understandable because, well, the characters have basically lost. The Shinsengumi are all brought together by their bonds as troublemaking outcasts from society, and that bond can never truly be broken with the ideals they hold, but without Kondo, many of them lose the strength to go on fighting because because they don't want to upset him by possibly dying, the last thing he'd want. They're all hesitant to make moves, and so despite their urgent want to help Kondo, even people like Hijikata are left not knowing what to do with themselves. Whereas Gin and Zenzo feel like they couldn't protect something important. And for Gin especially, that feeling hits extra hard with the past he's lived. It's heartbreaking to see him and everyone else feel truly helpless emotionally and physically, because we know what they're all like as characters after so long watching them, and the determination they all hold. Whatever happens, changes are imminent, and they are not going to be happy ones. As Nobunobu and the Mimawaragumi heavily police the streets and start causing trouble, Katsura and the rebels join up with the former Shinsengumi, and of course the odd jobs, to fight a similar foe and fight for the same goal of a better country. Beyond how differently the Mimawaragumi have acted, I really like how they conveyed the difference between Shigeshige and Nobunobu in a single scene, that being a trip to the Hostess Club. Whenever Shigeshige went, he may have gotten embarrassed, humiliated, demeaned, or whatever, but he took pleasure in getting to know the people he wanted to protect, and the experience helped him understand what it means to be a common person. Nobunobu is the exact opposite. He doesn't treat anyone lower than him with any respect, and while he may say he wants to be treated like a normal person, when he's treated similarly to Shige Shige, he berates and kills the staff for not living up to his standard. Rather than coming in secret and trying his best to not even address that he's the Shogun like Shige Shige, he boasts his own wealth and makes the Mimawari Gumi come along with him so nothing can go wrong if he doesn't like it. All these actions show that Nobunobu's want to be seen as normal is completely artificial official, another mask he wears for the public while unapologetically using his presence to shit on Hijikata and Gen. It makes sense that the Joy and former Shinsengumi would team up because they have a common enemy to rally behind as fellow fugitives looking for change. Plus, they both have a leader to save, with Katsura being imprisoned alongside Kondo. Oh, and the hard-boiled guy from before is also there, so that just cements this episode in the history books for me. The Joy and Shinsengumi officially make their peace treaty to free Katsura and Kondo, as them and Matsudaira try to break out of the prison they're housed in. This midway episode is full of a lot of good small moments, laughable and serious. Hijikata and Gin finally coming to an understanding, as Hijikata has to make a choice between fighting with the Joy as the Shinsengumi, or letting Kondo die and never being able to show their faces in the country as official police ever again. Katsura and Kondo have some funny moments playing dead, etc. As I said with another episode like this, we all know it's most mostly hype for what's about to happen, so let's just go ahead and get to it already. 
the Shinsengumi, Joy, and Odd Jobs Alliance get on a boat to the prison where the Mimawari Gumi are headed to kill Katsura and Kondo, but unexpectedly, Oboro's men show up for an unknown reason. Like the previous part, it's another semi-midway point, which explains why it only lasted 16 minutes and had another skit after. The fight scene between the Alliance and the Naraku was pretty neat, and it looks like a mysterious double cross is taking place in the background, but yeah, for the most part, I had about as much to say about this as the last. For an episode called Prison Break, you don't exactly see too much of that, I think that was more in the last episode, but I, I guess I shouldn't expect this too much by now with Gintama episode names. The ending skit of some alien visiting Earth was a decent breather that changed the art style up, which was kinda interesting, but it was pretty much just alright fluff to fill up the rest of the episode and make it 24 minutes. The Alliance makes their way to an island, as Kondo and Katsura are followed by a section of the Mimuari Gumi, including Sasaki. A good portion of the runtime dealt with strategy and trying to outsmart one another, as each group makes it around the island and plans attacks on one another. Like the Shogun assassination arc before it, the main fight setups here pit Gin against Oboro and Okita against Nobume, while Hijikata runs to stop Sasaki. Speaking of which, Hijikata and Okita have a great interaction before that split up, where for once he called Hijikata the Vice Chief. That's a major thing in the two relationship considering up to that point, Okita had always been trying to get rid of Hijikata to fight right next to Kondo, never calling him by his title because Okita didn't accept his placement. In just a few words though, he acknowledged Hijikata as the one serving right under Kondo, and gave him the go-ahead to help Kondo out while he and the others face the enemy ahead. The other moment that really solidifies this more than the other halfway episode is where Kondo is given a flashback showing that he values being strong enough to help a friend rather than being strong enough to beat them and I love that just for how well it encapsulates Kondo's values and why he wants to help Katsura when wounded. Those moments also bring the episode up quite a bit. For the first time in a while, we get a mostly single character focused episode around Sasaki and why he chooses to fight on. In the preceding scene before his flashback, it was pretty clever how the Shinsengumi chose to use the exact same trick on Sasaki as back when they fought beforehand, changing his men's uniforms to mix in Shinsengumi. It shows that he hasn't learned from the experience and also hasn't become adept and responsible enough to remember the faces of his entire squad. The reason for him not remembering is implied in his flashback with Nobume, in which he stops the Shinsengumi from dying on their first mission leading to Nobume and a squad of Naraku trained by Oboro killing his wife and child. He blames himself for that event because of his attempt to save others whilst improving himself. So his main goal in the story as a whole is to bring down the entire era of the country so those kind of events don't happen again. In that same way, he sees Nobume as a victim of circumstance, so he allowed her to live on and struggle to become someone new so that one day, when he had accomplished his goal, she could cut him down for his inability to save what he wanted and free herself of her past. It really puts a different lens on all the the actions he made during the course of the series, such as the thorny arc, where he persistently tried to get the Shinsengumi to act out. It's first portrayed as him just wanting to get rid of them, but on further inspection, he really wanted to help spawn a revolution of which could end the era of samurai in wake of a new one. That could also explain his tendency to text and use a gun rather than a sword. Two accessories that were never really used in the age of the samurai. Whether the Shinsen and Mimowari Gumi are teaming up or not to fight Oboro, I don't know, but the character development and reasoning for Sasaki and Nobume was masterfully executed. Nobume makes the decision to defy Sasaki's orders in order to keep the troops from dying, knowing the plan will fail, but it's already too late as a new power reveals himself as a former leader of the Naraku, Utsuro. Now, other than Nobume's promise to become a person that only decides what to do based on her own decisions, he is the main focus and immediately steals the show with his overwhelming presence. He's powerful, his design is striking, and there's this little tidbit of him looking exactly like Gin's master, Shoyo, who, I'll remind you if you forgot, Gin was forced to behead back in the the war. Already, there are so many questions to raise and so many more story opportunities for what this is. We only just recently learned that Gin had to kill Shoyo back in the war, so seeing him or something that looks and acts like him alive so soon after should give some insight into how Gin must have felt. And I know already that whatever follows in the story, Gin's only objective will be to finish off that thing that looks like his master. From the beginning, he barely needs to think about the decision before going ahead and attacking because he knows that it isn't Shoyo, so it has to die. And whatever follows will be a branching of that one initial gut feeling Gin is known to have. 
If episode 313 was about Nobume and Sasaki's past, this is about their present and how the two actually feel about each other whilst they and everyone else escape the island as it's destroyed. In this arc specifically, I wouldn't say Sasaki pushes away, but he distances himself from Nobume for the majority of the arc. And until this episode, you don't think too much about that. But with the knowledge that Sasaki knew Nobume had faked being the killer of his wife and child, when really she protected them, you see Sasaki was keeping her away from him so that he could protect her from his destructive plan. When you think about it, why wouldn't Nobume be important to Sasaki? They've been together for a long time and shared many experiences fighting for one another, and if Sasaki knew from the start that Nobume didn't kill his family but went along with it to give her a reason to live on, that's when you know his true affection towards her. Even as the world crumbles around them, they have one another to try and stay alive. But now they have the others to support them as well, so Sasaki feels like his job is done and sacrifices himself to keep the others from dying. Nobume now has something she always strove for, friends and a purpose beyond killing. So Sasaki's death is beautiful in that kind of symbolic way. Also, Obero gets struck the fuck down! Top tier, give this episode a medal! With everyone kinda being outlaws now, the Shinsengumi are forced to leave Ido to protect it, while Gin and Ko stay behind to also protect it, exchanging goodbyes in the process. It's all really calm. For once, Otai doesn't hit Kondo after seeing him, and they have a brief talk. Hijikata and Gin have each other's favorite dishes, and Kagura and Okita fight each other once again. All of it's symbolic that things are going to be changing with them gone, so they try to tie up all loose ends, whether it be talking to someone you normally don't, getting to be in the shoes of someone else, or testing your skills against one another. Wherever the Shinsengumi are going with Katsura and the Rebels, I'm sure they'll be back whenever the fate of Ido is in danger again. And let's be real, with Nobunobu as the person in charge, things are probably going to go to shit even faster than they already have. Almost everything stated in this episode is expository, so excuse me if I have more description than commentary. Gen and Ko have gone underground with Katsura after becoming wanted and are visited by Nobume, who wants the odd jobs to help her and the rest of Takasugi's gang bring down the space pirates they were betrayed by, who, along with Oboro's faction, are controlled by Utsuro, who turns out to have been living for an incredibly long time, with Shoyo being considered one of the lives he lived when reincarnating. The reason he's able to live on is because he and the Tendoshu got large amounts of all Tana, the most valued resource in the cosmos used to create all their futuristic technology, and coming in contact with a ton of it can help grant immortality. The Tendoshu use their large amounts of Altana to control and take down planets at will to gain even more Altana from the core of those planets, and Earth just so happens to have a ton of it. Better be writing this down because it's gonna be on the test later, but yeah, the idea of Utsuro possibly showing a different side of himself that he's since locked away as Shoyo is really intriguing because you know Gin and the others want to kill him, but he's also technically still Gin's master, so a conflict of interest arises. It's also implied Utsuro may have some bits of Shoyo still in him, so Gin could face hesitation at that thought if it's ever brought up. I also noticed the implementation of many other potential seeds of conflict, like since Takasugi went missing after the attack, he'll probably be used as a reason for characters to act or not. Since Kagura's father Umibozu is involved with the space pirates, she may have to fight him. Since Gin is now working with groups belonging to Katsura and Takasugi, his gang is either going to need to sneak around or be blatant about their presence. There's a lot of information delivered in such a short amount of time, but it's effective and gets whatever major conflict is about to happen set up pretty well. With Umibozu under the employment of Utsuro to kill Kamui's group, Kagura heads off to quote, kill Kamui first, with the odd job Sakamoto and Katsura following behind to find her and Takasugi. In Gen and Ko's encounter with Nobunobu, I thought it was pretty cool to see three of the former rebels joining together to take down the government heads so easily. It's a small example, but the event shows us just how well they work together and gives a snippet of what's to come while they look for Takasugi. Kagura and her family still have their ever so complicated, fun to watch relationship, all wanting to kill one another so everyone else can't, blah blah blah, plus Kagura has the added characteristic of having another family to protect, who she knows will come to do the same for her. The fact she knows that shows just how different she is from her family, who chooses to either fight alone or have teams, but only really care about themselves when fighting. There also wasn't much of it, but it appears Obero has a similar ability to Utsuro, which will be explained later on. And I'm also interested to see that. It's kinda hard to rank these middle-ish episodes though, not gonna lie. 
All the various factions, including Utsuro with the Space Pirates, meet up at Kagura's old home planet and start duking it out, some of Gin's groups getting split up in the process. Other than having the good old anime practice of showing a few new characters with their name ending in a number, and Umibozu possibly having some conflicting feelings about what he's doing, I pretty much explained all that happened. The world everyone's fighting on appears to have a history and significance to Kagura and Umibozu as their home planets, but right now that's just a glimpse for the future, however well set up it may be. It's pleasing, I just don't really have all that much to say about it. Katsura fights this Monkey King look-alike, while Sakamoto and crew are attacked by a robot guy. More so, the focus is on Katsura's fight and how he distinguishes himself from the other members of the former Rebels. Among the four, he's probably the hardest to pick up on because his skill set is the most subtle. During an average episode, Katsura is usually the butt of the joke, but in the context of the few times we've seen him get serious, we know he's not one to shy away from a fight, and he makes strategic retreats for the sake of his crew. That's his distinguishing feature, his ability to throw shame away in favor of helping recover from a battle he knows he'd otherwise lose, as a good general would do. When a fight is taking place, he has to prioritize himself and his men so that they can both live to fight another day. But he also has a side that breaks loose when there's no one else he needs to protect besides himself. He gets rid of inhibitions relating to safety and completely removes his self-defense to go all out and fight with strength he's forced to restrain in his regular general position. Really, it only adds another thing for me to like about Katsura and his personality, since it shows his humanitarian and selfless sides, which the other former rebels have trouble understanding, since they always go out to fight instead of defending when necessary. Not to mention his fight scene with the gorilla was also just awesome. The robot's ability was also cool, since his army comes in the form of brain-controlling nanobots. It's a unique ability I don't see too often, and it looks like it'll be used effectively for fight scenes. Sakamoto and Mutsu bring Nobunobu along to try and take back their ship from the robot guy. While on the ground, Gin faces off with a guy he may know from his past, possibly? In the beginning, I wasn't sure how a situation between Sakamoto and Nobunobu would work, but surprisingly, they fit and interact really well together. Sakamoto is a figure who cares deeply about his entire crew as its captain, and doesn't ever want to betray their trust by killing them in a weak, unconscious state. This mindset contradicts to Nobunobu, who always solved whatever problems were in front of him by getting other people to take care of it, in turn opening himself up to be controlled by those same people. He fed back into a circle of betraying and being betrayed, so, like the space pirates, he never formed any tight bonds with people that he could count on, because by the time he reached the top, he was standing alone on a mountain of bodies. Bodies that other people killed for him so that they could manipulate the power he wanted. You never really think about how Nobunobu feels about the whole thing, so seeing him realize his own errors and want to genuinely reach where he wants fairly shows major character development in such a short time, and it works, hinting that Nobunobu may even join against the Tendoshu. That's not even mentioning just how good of a duo Mutsu and Sakamoto always are, and Nobunobu adds onto the shtick without feeling out of place. Gin takes on an old foe and then makes it to the fight against Oboro and Utsuro's groups, with all the other factions joining in too. Gin's fight with the third eye guy is mostly used for comedic purposes, and it provides a humorous break from the seriousness of the arc, though it also has something to be said about Gin's casualness about possibly dying at any given time. The real main event, though, is the four former rebels joining together for the big fight. Just that one shot alone at the end makes the whole rest of the arc much more worth it, since it's something we've been waiting to see in the present since we knew all four fought together at one point or another. Every opening has built up this one moment, and while most of the fighting in this episode happens in other areas, the build-up also brings the episode up in my eyes. Gin, Takasugi, Katsura, and Sakamoto continue their reunion fight as Kamui, Umibozu, and Kagura do the same against each other. The fight Gin has against the space pirates with the other former rebels holds a lot of symbolic significance in that they aren't necessarily going to be a team again after everything takes place, but knowing their master's body now belongs to someone else, the chance to be just friends again is something they wouldn't pass up. You can tell as they fight that they enjoy it despite the brash circumstances, and whatever reasons they may have for fighting can be condensed into them wanting to be together again as Shoyo students when they're actually on the battlefield together. Kagura's fight is equally impactful for a different reason, that being to show off how Kagura and Umibozu have grown to a point where they can fight off Kamui, knowing they've grown as people where he stagnated. I wouldn't really expect any less when, for the last few years, he's only ever tried to grow in the physical sense rather than in the mental one. He fights and fights and fights without learning anything new or growing as a person, so he becomes predictable and mentally unsound, never really growing while his family goes off to become better people. And this fight might be what's needed to blow some literal sense into him with more than punches. The double conflict in this was pretty well handled and balanced in the narrative. 
As Utsuro and Umibozu clash, he goes back to thinking about his meeting and subsequent courting of his wife. It's a simple story, strong man meets really strong woman who, for some reason, can't leave her home planet and survive for long. Man falls in love with woman and tries to gain her affection by fighting a hydra and crushing one of his balls. Man helps woman see the world and marries her. If anything, I think the main point of the story is to humanize and show the various sides of Umibozu that we don't get to see often with how little screen time he really gets. It also draws back into the story in that the woman had absorbed all Tana and is implied to have died because of that. Plus, it sets up why Kamui wants to kill his father, blaming her death on him since she lived for a much longer time if she had never left the planet she belonged to. Nice little self-contained story that ties back into the plot, so let's see what the other half of the story is like from Kamui's eyes. Kamui recollects what led him down the path he took while Umibozu continues to fight Utsuro. A lot of the theming around the story Kamui tells has to do with the concepts of strength and family. Specifically, what are they and which version of it should be followed. Kamui doesn't get the true meaning of strength because of the many contradicting ideas thrown at him by different people, and in many cases those people aren't sure themselves. So Kamui deludes it to physical strength and the title of strongest, as if it's a quantifiable, easy concept to grasp. He wants to gain the strength for his family and self, but in doing that, he contradicts himself by casting aside the idea of family to attain that strength. The reason for this contradiction is that he doesn't know the true meaning of strength either, and whether or not he can beat his father, who's considered the strongest in the universe, the title will remain empty as he wears it, exhibited by how easily Gin takes the title to show Kamui the utter uselessness of it. Really, no matter how Kamui tries to play it up or hide it, he's just a lost kid who thinks he'll find the answer to his problems if he beats up his dad. A dad he considers a murderer because he couldn't understand understand his mom wanted to die by Umibozu and her kid's side if it meant truly living instead of just being alive. Umibozu didn't quite understand it either, trying his hardest to keep his wife alive, but in the process missing out on the time he had left with her and his family from being away so long. Neither was truly right when the story came to an end, but Umibozu learned and remembered what happened to reflect and get better for his family, whereas Kamui stayed in the same rage he had as a kid and never got over it because he thought he was just being strong, even if it meant discarding the family he wanted to protect. He ran away from his problems instead of standing up against them. That's where Gin and Shinpachi differ from Kamui. They want to grow in strength too, but to do that, they're not only going to do so by Kagura's side so she never feels alone, but even without blood ties, they never forget where their family lies and what's really important to them. That's why I think the three of them together are going to spend the next episode hammering that lesson in to try and change Kamui's view set. And if it's as well done as this, then I'm really excited. Continuing from before, Gin and Kamui fight, with Kagura and Shinpachi joining in as well to give support as it gets more and more heated. I never really thought about how Gin specifically related to Kamui, but when they brought up the topic of emptying oneself, I completely got it. Kamui thinks being empty is the only way he'll be able to be the strongest, since he thinks lingering emotions hold a person back, but in reality, they only push a person to surpass their limits for the people attached to those emotions, and Gin could only learn this by feeling loss and emptiness firsthand, but getting it back with the help of odd jobs. Even when he can't break any more limits on his own, Kagura and Shinpachi come to help him from becoming empty again in his weakest moment like Kamui does. It's been forever since the last time we saw Yato being broken to the point they go off pure instinct, and it's just as frightening on Kamui as it was on Kagura. Possibly even more so considering the strength we've already witnessed from Kamui, and what it would take for him to reach a breaking point. That's what makes it even more so impressive when everyone calms him down, and Kagura lets him know she still accepts him as part of her family. Finally calming his rage and allowing him to stop his endless goal of strength, finally understanding what truly matters. The amount of development Kamui, Umibozu, and Kagura got in this short period was insane and really heartfelt, and though I was skeptical how they'd end the conflict, I don't think there could have been a better way. Takasugi faces off against Oboro, who reveals his former status as the first student of Shoyo. Up until this point, we've never really fully understood Oboro's fascination and attachment to Shoyo and his students, but it now all makes sense. He followed and constantly hunted them because he wanted to either die serving his master and by the hand of his lower classmen, or killing them off and removing all traces of Yoshida Shoyo. To explain, Utsuro burned down Oboro's village, but allowed him to survive with his Altana-infused blood, leading to the two forming a friendship that convinced him to leave his group and become Yoshida Shoyo, with Oboro as his first student. This is all important to note as Oboro went on to stay in the group to protect Shoyo and his ideals, thinking protecting that would be enough for him. But upon seeing Shoyo with Gen and Ko as students, he lets word slip and leads Shoyo to his death knowing that'll be the only way to see him again. It's never explicitly stated in the show, but I think it can be inferred that Oboro felt jealousy and resentment staying for so long in his group without Utsuro while trying to keep them away from him, to the point that upon seeing what he missed out on, he lashed out to get
get Utsuro back. Oboro saw this as his greatest betrayal, so using the extra life that the Master originally gave him, Oboro continued to fight on either to remove Shoyo's memory by killing his students, therefore getting rid of what he created, or allowing them to seek justice for Shoyo by killing him, accepting either in the process. It was hard for me to digest and understand the whole thing at first, but the story really does show the conflictedness of Oboro's character and why he chose to do what he did. It's sad to see the path he went down and the decisions that led to where he is, but with his defeat at Takasugi's hands, you can tell he's content, and that's really the best way his character could go out. If it wasn't clear enough, I really love this episode. As the battle concludes, another seems to begin as Utsuro betrays the Tendoshu, blowing up the Altana on planets they control to enrage those planet survivors so they come to Earth and possibly destroy it. This is because Utsuro will live as long as the planet exists to feed him Altana, so he wants it destroyed to allow him to die. More than that, however, the episode focuses on why exactly Utsuro and Shoyo are the way they are, and it's simpler than you might assume. Utsuro was persecuted for his immortality on a consistent basis, having no one to talk to as he was killed over and over, so he created various personalities that took over each time he died after he became the head of the Naraku. Of them, Shoyo was the one that resisted the hatred of his other personalities that hated humans and being alive, creating his school and teaching any of the others to fight against that darkness when he knew he'd pass away. These actions show that Shoyo wasn't just a personality, but his own fully formed person without a body to himself. He had his own wants, desires, and hopes for those he teached, and in the end, Gin and the others are doing exactly what he wanted by going against Utsuro who's now the only remaining personality. There's also the whole thing about protecting their home planet and friends at the time, but that's a given. <laughs> I'll admit, some of the episodes in this arc weren't nearly as up to snuff as the Shogun assassination arc or farewell Shinsengumi arcs, but the second half completely changed the game and set forth amazing stories for Kamui, Kagura, Umibozu, Oboro, and Shoyo slash Utsuro that more than make up for it, including this. As a finisher for the prelude to the, I'm assuming, final arc of the series, it's an amazing ending that satisfies multiple questions we've had about a mysterious serious character and gives both him and his counterpart extra depth as the conclusion to the series builds. All that's left is to watch and see how it all comes to an end. Okay, so never mind what I just said. Apparently before the big final arc, there's a 13 episode season about telling the one-off stories that hadn't been adapted yet. Might as well be that way to give us a break from the action for a little while. So anyway, Kagura gets a love letter from a boy when Umibozu comes to town, so he and Gen start freaking out about the whole thing. It's got all the classic tropes about meeting a new boyfriend amplified to the 10th extreme. The thought of Kagura getting a boyfriend already has limitless possibilities for how wrong it could go, and somehow Umibozu and Gen are able to make it even worse. The long arcs have been great, but I kind of miss these simpler concepts with only two or three episodes. It's a good palate cleanser to be ready for what comes next. Kagura's boyfriend turns out to be Attack on Titan Season 3, and tries to take her while destroying the Earth in the process. It's basically entirely comedy, but it does have something to say about the unwillingness of some partners to give their significant other space and be with their family, and vice versa on the family side. They do a good job at portraying how intimidating a seemingly bad boyfriend can be like for a parent using literal proportions to illustrate fears. It just so happens those themes are provided through two guys beating up a tribe of intergalactic hip-hop titans to get the girl back. Gin and Umibozu work fine as comedic foils to one another, and in this particular situation better so than average, but Gen has also had better foils in the past. What's really memorable about the episode is just the instant shift from meeting the boyfriend to Attack on Titan parody, and I'm glad it's not overly ham-fisted or dated like some other references to AOT have been in the past. Gen and Katsura hear about a man that came to visit the ramen store girl before her husband died, so they go to a homeless place to try finding him. The guy also turns out to be her dad. It's alright, I guess. The pacing is kind of slow and doesn't go very far along before ending, and most of the jokes aren't too memorable other than those relating to Katsura being an unironic cuck. Even Hasegawa wasn't all that memorable, and I didn't know that was possible with his character. The callbacks to the ramen girl's first episode with the same brother-in-law wanting revenge by killing the old man is kind of fun, but the mystery of who the guy is is pretty obvious. Obviously this guy. I'll stand corrected if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the father is this old fucker Hasegawa hangs out with. Even if that isn't the case, I'm just not really feeling this arc so far. Yeah, obvious twist is obvious, but it was handled better than I thought it would. Turns out the guy just lost his memory of being the father to the ramen shop owner, but still remembers sharing ramen with her, so the gang tries to bring them together for one last meal. The brother-in-law isn't really meant to be as much of a threat as just an instigator for conflict and exposition, so I don't mind that he didn't play a major role in the story. As a whole, not only was the emotion much better, but the comedy was the same, having many more memorable moments than the first part. The final interactions between the daughter and the old man were also touching despite his memory 
lost. And it was equally nice seeing the whole cast that helped find him subtly participate in it. It definitely had a shaky start, but this episode found its footing by the end and delivered a decent ending. Going back to a two-segmenter after so long, Hasegawa is trying to kill himself, but keeps running into assassins that complicate and keep him from doing it. The whole bit reminds me a lot of Beavs and Butthead, where the characters just ruin whatever serious plot is going on in front of them because they're either too stupid to realize or are just doing their own thing. Hasegawa is probably the best character to do this sort of plot with because he's both clueless and stupidly realistic at the same time. So the bit goes further with a shake-up in character type. The second section has a return for Sasaki, though I guess I should say flashback, maybe? Where he and the Shinsengumi try to deduce the death of a Japanese folklore character using police techniques, and hilarity ensues. I found it about as entertaining as the Hasegawa short, and it's always nice to see Sasaki back for a second just to goof off having another competition with the Shinsengumi over meaningless shit. Gin runs into an Amanto shaped like a sword that's been missing its scabbard wife, so he burrows inside Gin's ass. The scabbard turns out to belong to Okita, so he and Gin plan to have a duel whilst another mysterious sword Amanto is being carried by a murderer. How can someone not love the concept of Gin getting a sword stuck in his ass and walking around with it to try and find its scabbard? It's so absurd, yet so simple, that the comedy basically writes itself since the sword stays in Gin's ass because it's insecure about its own sharpness. This is also a rare opportunity to see two characters we wouldn't expect to fight do so over such a stupid thing, and everyone just kinda goes along with it. I'm sure the fight alone will be interesting, but what's really attention grabbing is the swordsman who will probably show up in the story at a real inopportune time. Even if the humor wasn't good, and it is, the charm of such a stupid episode makes it worth watching regardless. Gin gets his sword ready to fight as Okita encounters the murdering swordsman and takes his Amanto sword for the battle. Now, I'm not gonna lie, a large portion of this battle is dedicated to the two using their talking swords to fling technicolored shit at each other and use Naruto techniques to endlessly outsmart one another. Is that like I'm saying that's a bad thing? I expected nothing less than for the fight to be a complete shit show, though I don't know if I meant that in the literal sense. There is some actual serious shit with the murderer sword consuming whatever wielder it has, leaving Okita in a vulnerable position while he and Gin fight, but there is really only so much I can take a situation seriously when these are the kind of visuals I'm getting alongside those moments. Again, not like it's a minus for the episode in any way, shape, or form, I'm just pointing it out. The ending will probably be a bit more serious, but really, who knows at this point? I'll be pleased either way. How does one describe the pure madness that I just witnessed? Um, flaccid sword because the Viagra wore off, familial bonds between objects, ass Excalibur moment, actually touching ending, a bunch of weirdness in between? I legitimately have a hard time describing what just happened in this episode without explicitly stating the plot and nothing else because it's just that odd. I mean, I like it, it's pretty good, but I don't really have words to describe it. This episode is pure Gintama in all its forms, enough said. Anything more or anything less wouldn't be doing justice for the weird as fuck experience I just had. Otsu is looking for some new idols to compete with other group acts and settles on Kagura, leading to the two participating in their first event together. On average, I'm not much of a fan of Otsu episodes, but this breaks the trend by allowing Otsu to not have the somewhat annoying end of sentence random word shtick, and on the one occasion they do, it's used to mock the joke. Kagura does well in the role of an idol character, specifically because she's so incredibly bad at basic human interaction or forced happiness. There's nothing about her character that fits the idol archetype like other female characters in the cast might, and that's why it works. The mangaka even makes fun of this fact by having the other characters there to do nothing but background instruments. Gintoki also fits the manager role perfectly, but that goes without saying. A battle of the band should be good opportunity to make fun of idol groups as a whole like this did, and trust me, the bin for idol jokes is still way beyond full. The top idol group in the universe comes to take down Otsu in a meet and greet battle, so Gen and the others have to step in to help out as idols. Even more so than the last episode, this digs into the Japanese pop industry and commentates on how the environment as a whole is incredibly fragile. This is most exemplified in how idols being seen with men is considered scandalous, how performers need to use their sexuality to entice lonely virgins into coming to concerts, and just how easily pop figures can be interchanged between one another in the eyes of the fans because of how generic they are. It has plenty to pair in terms of the music industry, and a battle of trickery is much more fun to watch than just a regular battle of bitchiness. I don't know how much further they can go with the concept, but if Gintama has taught me anything, it's that I should never underestimate how dumb it can get. 
The two groups continue with their meet-and-greet battle, commenting further on the music industry as a whole by discussing how many idols create illusions of who they really are to get the attention of fans, and what that can do to an image when it's revealed they're human. It has an interesting point to bring up that idols and idol culture center around seeing the person performing songs on stage as some kind of god that deserves worship, leading to fans being all the more disappointed upon learning the idols can make the same mistakes anyone else can. This could even be as trivial as not looking how they show themselves off to be because it's insincere something that the group Otsu and Ko are up against purely represents, whereas Otsu is bare and doesn't hold back her human side. There's also plenty of jokes about Dragon Quest and trying to get fans to shake hands with complete sociopaths, but that really comes with the territory of this show. Two-ish stories. The majority has to do with Gen and Co. hijacking Bandai Namco to mess with their own game and make it more like Dragon Quest. The vibe reminds me a lot of that one episode of The Simpsons where Homer is given the chance to make a car the way he wants and it just turns out to be a huge pile of shit. They don't just parody RPGs either. They do shooters, zombie games, strategy games, platformers. There's a lot more than you'd originally expect based on the concept. I feel like if Tama had gotten the chance to put in some of her own adjustments, that would have really made the skip perfect, but it's still good as is. The second the second part is actually the first of a two-episode story about Shinpachi getting glasses from a ghost shop that lets him see other guardian spirits, finding really odd ones for Gen and Kagura before a race. It has its own weird ideas set up, but that's really all it is, set up for the race that apparently takes place next episode. It still works fine on its own though. Shinpachi and the others involve themselves with the sports event, having everyone else's spirit tripping them up along the way. There's pretty much nothing else, and I'm completely fine with that. Every spirit is so incredibly specific to the person that it is attached to, and almost none of them make any sense or reason, yet also have good reason for why people are the way they are. I wouldn't even call it intentionally dumb because of how meticulously crafted each idea is, but rather just fascinating for how different each one is from one another. Of course, Shinpachi's only spirit is in his glasses, but Hasegawa as a spirit was definitely the highlights. Pretty odd spot to be starting the final arc of the series, since these arcs I just looked at are all in retrospect, but hey, now I can watch whatever conclusion arc is coming up while imagining what all the various guardian spirits look like, internally cracking up to myself. An Amanto army made up of forces against the Tendoshu from the planets destroyed arrive on Earth, saying that they're going to liberate the Earthlings from them while they just sort of laze around and terrorize Edo, mirroring what happened ten years ago and making everyone crave hope for the odd jobs to return. There's quite a bit of figurative imagery involved in this. Most notably, Hasegawa is used as an obvious metaphor for Edo as a whole waiting for the odd jobs to return. He goes around, collecting small coins from the smallest imaginable places and brings it all together as an offering for the odd jobs, showing that Everyone in Edo has a little hope to get out from under the foot of the Amanto, but needs odd jobs to light the fuse. In a way, it's also used as foreshadowing, since right when the odd jobs return to help fight, everyone else in Edo springs up and starts revolting for their city, almost like a beacon of light that they were missing that returns to guide them down the path of freedom. And when I say everyone, I do mean everyone. The fan service in this arc already is probably gonna end up eclipsing the battle itself. There's the four devas, idiot prince, Hasegawa in his original uniform because he had that at one point, Gengai, Kyubei, Sachan, Skuyo, even Sakamoto, Katsura, and Nobunobu get a little bit of time on screen. Everything is falling into place to see Earth fight for its own freedom from both the Tendoshu and other Amanto, and I'm loving it so far. Nobunobu chooses to help the gang negotiate with the Liberation Force as everyone else prepares for an incoming attack. Besides Nobunobu's development in showing how he can work with Sakamoto and Katsura on a similar level, the whole message is permeated on the idea that Nobunobu has nukes pointed at the Force's fleet when he just has to take a shit. It goes on for a while, but somehow the joke never really gets old, and having the Admiral of the Forces do the same and accidentally shit himself, leading to the two making a pact, adds on to the joke well. I guess I shouldn't have expected negotiations to go any other way. The Admiral from before, Shijaku, understands the setup as Utsuro intentionally attacks Amanto to get the war started, but another character, Insho, also understands this but wants to continue the fight, serving as a representation for one of the two explored upon themes here, those being the ethics of war and discrimination faced by certain people during said war. Insho is a broken character from the loss of his family and knows the pain other Amanto of the army feel just as well, so to relieve their hatred for what happened, he wants to kill the Earthlings to satisfy their own needs and benefit from the war 
war in their own way, showing the double standard behind saying people want peace when the government may not, specifically seeming to draw some parallels to the Iraq War in light of 9-11. Kagar and Catherine are used similarly to portray how nationalistic people will show aggression to those that happen to be from the same place as those they're fighting out of pure rage. What's scary about it all is, though it's simplistic in its depictions, both examples of these kinds of actions are realistic to what people do to one another when faced with a war. Ulterior motives can be all that spurs some people on so that they can have a bad guy to fight and claim victory over, and that commentary is surprisingly complex for how easy to understand the concepts are that are presented. Even when blown up to an intergalactic scale with an immortal as one of the parties trying to start up the war, it's amazing how it could all be thoroughly displayed and depicted in just one episode. It's another one of those times when I'm really impressed with what the show can do. After narrowly escaping Utsuro's immortal troops, the odd jobs in Nobume are faced with the new Shinsengumi, who are basically the exact same as the old Shinsengumi, but now they have cooler outfits and special moves that basically mean nothing. Yeah, their absence from the story was mostly used as a way to make fun of the fact that the mangaka just kind of wanted to give them a newer design, but nonetheless, it's still satisfying to see them banter with and fight alongside odd jobs again after so long. And their return spells a turning point for the war. Princess Soyo, Shige Shige's sister and Kagura's friend, gets some of her own moments as well by being the only person amongst the higher-ups to not yield at the enemy forces to protect what her brother wanted to, even if she technically isn't a princess anymore. Paired with the return of the Shinsengumi, it makes this installment an enjoyable midpoint. Coming together to help the gang for possibly one last time, Gingai pulls out an enlarged version of the Neo Armstrong Cyclone Jet Armstrong Cannon with the help of Tama and Kintoki to release nanobots disabling all machines, and that includes them. There's plenty of good action involved, but this one moment is indicative of both Tama's own character and Kintoki and Gingai's growth as characters. For Tama, she always saw herself as a robot that wanted to help people in any way that she could, even if that meant the end of her own life, just like she did to her original body at the end of the arc they introduced in. For Kintoki, it's a sign that he's gotten over his grudge of not being the main character to instead play a crucial role in helping shape the future of the planet, whether he's involved afterwards or not. Gengai is also basically giving up all that he's worked on and cared about for a long time to get a chance at beating their foes, so he's saddened at the prospect because he's made them with the love that his son would have wanted to see before he died. We don't know what happens to them after this, but the sentiment and motion alone is enough to score this episode some serious points. Not to mention this emotional moment comes to us thanks to the Neo Armstrong Cyclone Jet Armstrong Cannon with a high quality finish and nanobots inside. Gengai and the robots disable the surrounding ships as the Kabukicho district gets ready to fight, implying even more characters are going to show up as the space pirates invade with other warrior species. Meanwhile in space, Katsura's crew gets captured by idiot prince on his Noah's Ark of Animals, while Sakamoto and crew are imprisoned by the Liberation Force. As far as the shutting down robots and continuing to get ready section goes, it carries the same emotion as previous episodes, along with it continuing the hype, and seeing the good old idiot prince again was a treat, but that's really all there is to it. I do want to see how Katsura Katsura and crew decide to handle using the Idiot Prince's ship, but that's probably for later. Okay, um... Okay, so like... Um... Uh... The imprisoned admiral turns out to be the long-lost older brother of the Idiot Prince, but also... Elizabeth turns out to be the two's other long-lost sibling and has a gigantic dick... presumably on his head? With a mouth? Convincing the Idiot Prince's forces to help Earth after he retains some of his memories. Uh, yeah, I'm at about as much of a loss of words as you are. But that's what happened. It's still cool how, from the Renho arc, Elizabeth has accepted his role as a person on Earth who wants to protect it rather than be whatever the fuck it was we saw in a flashback. But you know, I can't get over just how fucking out there this is. It's pure insanity that I can't find the words for as it takes up the whole episode. But yeah, Elizabeth is actually a guy from the Idiot Idiot Prince's planet that has a gigantic, nine-headed, talking dick on his head. <laughs> what more can I really say? Gin and Co. fight the race that Hetero belongs to, though I'm a bit surprised Hetero himself didn't really show up to help in any way. I guess with that cute face, he'd be no help on the battlefield. I mean, just look at him. Pure innocence incarnate. In all seriousness, the battle has only just started, but we've already been treated to a few pretty interesting team-ups and strategies implemented while fighting. Some are more jokey than others, such as ripping off the enemy's balls, but that really only adds on to the charm of the fights. All I'm wondering about now is who's gonna be joining the fray next? 
As the fighting continues and the race the Gambling Queen was a part of starts coming at full force, who other than Pirako and Jirocho show up to help out in a battle? Their appearance here gives a look into how the two have grown since they went on a journey together, the dynamic kind of being flipped where Jirocho is now the one who's willing to do whatever his daughter asks, but in more of a cute family way rather than an abusive father way, and Pirako is much more open to showing her emotions rather than putting on a face of deceit. The combo of Gin and Jirocho is openly welcomed, and there's even a flashback to Jirocho's past showing how he and Otose's old husband used to fight in a similar way to how him and Gin did, kind of passing the torch of understanding between the two so that they can protect Kabukicho and the world at large together. Aside from their whole reunion, I really like the whole I'm Spartacus moment where everyone says they're the person that made the canon to keep Gengai safe. Really shows a moment where the whole community comes together and shows how much they care about each other just like Gin and Jirocho care for Otose and the others. The battle rages on with Hetero and the Ketsunoana tribe both joining in to help out. The most exhibited theme in this case are those having to do with fear and carrying on the wishes of others. Like the last episode had a flashback to show how Jirocho is carrying on Otose's husband's will, this has the distinction of showing how he looks over them in a thankful manner for keeping the district safe. Just a small moment I feel is worth pointing out. The bit about fear is more so about showing a battle technique that's able to make enemy forces retreat based on the strength and intimidation factor of an army. That's what makes Hetero's appearance so great. He's the encapsulation of that idea. Man has eyes glowing like a demon and can box like he's about to go pro in Hajime no Ippo, but he's a pacifist at heart. On the same wavelength, the Ketsunos are strong, but no illusions are all that's needed to drive off the forces when they're already in a weak state. Just a bit of strategy mixed in with characterization that fits well together in the end product. Basically, calm before the storm the episode. Almost all of its runtime is about telling jokes while the gang celebrates their victory and gets ready for the next day. The looming threat of the Yato capturing Ginga is there, but for the most part the tone stays light and allows for the Gin to chillax and have fun, making Evangelion parodies and callbacks to earlier episodes. It serves well as a cooldown and brings the mood to a calm level. Gin and the others look for Gengai on Earth. Meanwhile, in space, the Idiot Prince faction and Katsura's crew are trying to break into Incho's ship before he fires an Earth-destroying death beam in six hours. Much of this deals with the idea of taking responsibility for one's actions and draws parallels between a few characters I only noticed upon this episode. I don't know how the interaction of Nobunobu and Princess Soyo was going to go, but it was probably handled the best way possible by giving them both emotional closure and a goal to strive towards for the sake of Shige Shige. I also understood how Prince Insho has goals similar to that of what Takasugi used to be. In many cases, he's manipulating the people around him to fulfill personal goals of destroying whatever's in front of him to get rid of the pain of losing a loved one. He's relatable in that sense, and so who better than Takasugi himself to come along and pop some sense into him along with possibly a few rounds of solid lead. We're running out of characters to pull from the various Gintama art catalogs, but the stakes are getting so high I barely noticed. Keep the advance pumping, boys. Entering the final home stretch of the anime with the last opening, since the last episode ended with Takasugi's arrival, it's only natural that the next would be about how he formed his fighting group and why he chose to help the others save Earth now. Up to this point, we've only really gotten broad hints as to why Takasugi's group follows him, but the flashback shows that he got to them through his kind actions despite his entire goal being to take down the world. It showed a more human side to him that the others decided had enough merit to be worth following because they themselves had lost plenty and wanted to fulfill the same goal. Now they have a place together and feel less of a need to destroy, so they want to protect the place in which they were able to find one another. In the end, everyone fighting are still rebels, just on a more intergalactic scale, so it isn't too different from back when Gin and the others were seen the same way by the government. In that way, everyone, including those from other planets or even people like Takasugi and Co, are able to band together under one flag, and that's pretty neat. Kamui and the Space Pirates get to Earth, and alongside Kagura start beating some Yato ass. I've described the episode to you. It's interesting how Kamui and Kagura fight like they're only having a petty sibling argument, and that same kind of sentiment goes when Gin and Co join the battle, but there's really only that fight and Utsuro showing up at the end to unveil he was waiting until all the allies were together to overload Earth Sultana and destroy it. How will the gang get out of this pickle, Scoob?
Takasugi and gang charge into the massive ship, about to fire their planet-destroying laser in an attempt to destroy it, basically going on a suicide mission by doing so. It really feels like a send-off to Takasugi's group, the Kihetai, for the last time, as they plan to die alongside Takasugi as they always planned, whether that means protecting the Earth or destroying it. They don't really care about the world, about the universe, about anything other than fighting alongside the man they chose to follow, even if that means blowing themselves up in the final stand or ramming their ship into another. Even if the Kihetai cast wasn't your favorite among the bunch, it's hard to not feel sympathetic for Takasugi as he charges forward, knowing his comrades are dying for him, also that he can protect his own friends on Earth who are counting on him. Those actions require a strong will that's commendable with all that is said and done. At the least, Takasugi and the Two Guns Girl are still alive right before the cannon is about to fire, so let's see what happens to him after such a somber end. With help, in part thanks to Banzai's sacrifice, the rest of Takasugi's crew and the Earth Force get the opportunity to charge in and face the remaining forces, including Incho, in a battle where they finally have the upper hand. This installment does a good job explaining more in-depth just how broken Incho is as a character and why he continues to go on like he does. He let his brother die to have his wife that died on Incho's home planet before their kid was born. He sacrificed everything to get what he wanted, and it was all blown away with one explosion. The man partially ruined his own life life by getting rid of some of those he held dear, so he goes on because the plan is all he has left. He ran from everything without a destination in mind, so all he can do is destroy everything around him. That's why a man like Takasugi had to put Insho out of his misery, not even as the leader of his group or a figure to look up to, but as a regular man with friends named Takasugi Shinsuke. He thought he lost everything with the death of his master, but he gained a following because he remained human after that, even in his own insanity, and after Gen was able to unlock Takasugi's self, he was afraid to embrace, he just became another guy with a sword. Unlike Incho, he never cheated to get the people who worked beside him, but rather gained their loyalty through his actions, and therefore he has the humanity to kill Incho while having something to stand up for, giving him the conviction Incho lacked. This could very well be the end for Takasugi, and if that's the case, what a way to let him die, atoning for his past and helping another lost soul. Takasugi is able to stay alive, but Insho and Nobunobu are both fatally shot, whereas on Earth, the Shrine Girls from like 300 episodes ago finally have something to do along with Sadaharu by closing the big Altana portals as the gang looks for a way to stop it. On Earth, there's only really fighting going on, but it's some good action, immortal zombies created by Utsuro against odd jobs and all that, so yeah, satisfactory. Nobunobu's death was surely unexpected, but he was still able to use that sacrifice to get both sides to stop fighting. From the beginning, Nobunobu was a conflicted character that had a hard time shaking off his status as nothing but a puppet that helped destruction. But with his death, he did the one thing he wanted to make sure happened while he was still Shogun, inspire hope based on his words. He used his own death to rally both sides to stop their battle, and so, even if it was just for a little bit, he was happy to have mended some of the hurt he helped spread beforehand. It's sad seeing him have to go, but it does also really feel like he can finally rest in peace. Umibozu makes it to Earth with some otherworldly Altana, the only thing capable of killing Utsuro, while Hasegawa and the Idiot Prince try to save the massive ship full of their allies from falling to Earth. This really is just an excuse to give Hasegawa a badass moment. God knows the man deserves one for all the shit he's had to put up with throughout the series. It's simple, too. The guy uses all of the Idiot Prince's forces to help stop the ship, containing both comrades and enemies, so the other factions that were part of the Liberation Force gain a respect for the Earthlings and join to stop it as well. It's all because Hasegawa decided to be confident in the choices he made that led up to the situation, and believed that his actions could help. Obviously one of his best moments. Well... Shit do be going down right now. Everyone from around gathers to fight Utsuro, coming at him full force in all directions as Sadaharu tries to control the Altana in the Earth. The whole of the Shinsengumi goes down, Umibozu goes down, Kamui goes down. Every attack thrown at Utsuro goes right off him as he reflects on all the times he spent getting used to being beaten and stabbed to the point he can dodge it all. Ironically, what starts hurting him is the small seedlings Gin left in him with a singular attack and Sadaharu holding back the Altana. And with everyone else down, only the spirit of the odd jobs themselves remains to take him on. The climax of the final battle is reaching its height with the buildup of so many people taken down or killed. Show me what you fucking got next. 
With everyone joining their life energy to give to Sadaharu so that he can keep Utsuro from staying immortal, the remaining forces all come together to take him down together. Utsuro gets some great development in witnessing and understanding his own fear for what humanity can do, exemplified in Gin and the others coming together to do something he could never do on his own. As a family, they stand together to protect something Utsuro never had, but Shoyo did, and in that way, you can see how he contemplates if Shoyo is still a part of him to be feeling emotions of sympathy for them. It's a great interaction. Now, up up to this point, this was giving me major deja vu because it's got some major similarities to the fairy tale ending. All the characters from across the series come together to keep the lonely, powerful, demon like character in check so the remaining cast can defeat him. The main character and their friends represent the themes and bonds humanity shares, which the villain chose to fear instead of accept. And that villain looks back on what he feared as the characters are able to exploit his weakness to defeat him. I will say, I think the fairy tale ending is alright in its own way while upholding the themes of its series, despite what some people may say, but we all should know up to this point the Gintama twists our perceptions and makes us question the world. So the ship from before presumably crashes into the earth as Utsuro presumably dies and or disappears after falling into the core of the earth, all before a two year time skip. Yeah, I don't know what's going on either, but god damn it do I want to know. This was a great episode with an even greater, more mind boggling twist that completely changed the mood and confuses the audience in an intentional way. Whatever the ending is, I really do need to know if it can somehow top the potential ending we were just shown, but got snatched from us. Okay, things turned out a bit more positively than on upon first glance. The ship was actually stopped before it crashed, and everyone is fine, other than Sadaharu, who's stuck as a small ball fetus type thing. Gin decides to close up odd jobs soon after, because the gang all have different things to do, and the two-year time skip occurs. As happens with every time skip, there are plenty of changes that happen, but most of them are meant to parody anime endings in general, and I mean, who'd expect Gintama to have a completely serious ending all the way to the end? I'm glad that this is the way things are going. I love I love the show when it gets serious, but it's just as nice for them to get back to basics telling jokes after a massive arc has just happened. So far we've only followed Shinpachi and seen how the Shinsengumi have changed, Tama has a little bot to store memories on while she's getting fixed, Hasegawa has taken the fame, Katsura has made it to become the first prime minister, and so on. So I'm gonna take a guess and assume we're gonna get to see how the others are doing after all this is done as well. Who knows, maybe they'll come back as Super Saiyans. Oh, also, Sakamoto has a moment where he's in a Situation parody in Kaiji Ultimate Survivor. I don't I didn't know that was gonna be here, but yeah, watch Kaiji. Shinpachi accidentally gets involved with Matsudaira's plan to kill Prime Minister Katsura using the child Kagura apparently barfed out like King Piccolo. Meanwhile, out in the sticks, Gen tries to meet with Takasugi but runs into a demoted Hijikata and robot Yamazaki. Did a single word I just say make any lick of sense? I'm gonna guess not. Somewhere in there is foreshadowing, a semblance of a plot, and actual sentiment, but it's more just a descent into madness as every character re reveals himself as someone almost completely different, other than Okita, who became an assassin, which seems like a pretty logical progression if you ask me. The stuff about the Tendoshu possibly being alive and Takasugi somehow being a part of that is interesting, but for now, I'm just watching to see how absolutely batshit insane everything can get by the end. Turns out Kagura was just using a technique to look young rather than actually being a clone or copy, and Gin gets some of the Naraku after him because he somehow got a hold of Utsuro's heart. On the bit about Kagura, I believe the implication is that she came in a younger state because she was ashamed to have not made any progress fixing Sadaharu, and if so, it's good to see that Shin still supports her despite that, though I don't think we would have expected anything less. The greater focus on her section is just messing around with Okita, and what's not to love about that? Takasugi and Gin still have of their ever turbulent relationship that becomes only more complicated with the presence of the heart of Utsuro. There are so many possibilities for why he might have that. He could be intending to destroy it so Utsuro can't regenerate. He could be holding onto it to try and save the shoyo that might still be in him. It's a good setup. So then, why does he have it and why does Takasugi want it? Man, quite a lot to take in from one episode, but handled very well. The story of why Gen has Utsuro's heart is discovered, as well as why Takasugi has similar abilities. Both have major significance in character and plot for completely different reasons, which is admirable in its own right. Gen's story of raising a version of Shoyo by finding the heart still beating lets us see Gen get into the mindset of a teacher as he tries to help save Shoyo, but ends up losing his body to the Naraku and carrying on his heart to kill him to let both him and Utsuro rest in peace. 
The dilemma is created in that Gen may have trouble committing the same act that's been ingrained in him for so long after he originally killed his master and getting to see him again, if only for a second. And in this case, we also have to take into account all the time Gen spent with the child version of Shoyo looking for help. Takasugi's story is just as interesting. Knowing Utsuro's blood and Shoyo's body are out there and being used by the Tendoshu to start a suicidal immortality religion, he wants to destroy all that blood to let his master rest. So he took in some of Oboro's old ashes to survive slightly longer. It's a great way of foreshadowing how far Takasugi has come, laying down his own life and even extending his own pain for the sake of purging an evil from the world. Not to mention the commentary on opportunistic religious extremism, something I was not expecting this show would tackle but was pleasantly surprised they did. Wherever all these concepts go next, it's already been used to a highly effective extent and whatever it is they're going to do with these concepts, it'll probably continue being epic. Gen and Takasugi split up and try to sneak around Ida while Hijikata tries to do the same thing as he follows Gen. It's really just some classic Gintama humor of Gen pretending to be a mannequin or Takasugi or whatever and having to deal with stupid or insane people finding and using him for weird purposes. It's kind of nice to see an episode with almost no plot relevance that ends with the main character shitting himself and dressing up like this to try and hide. We're so close to the ending of the series but Gen still gets into these kind of situations two years in the future and that's absolutely hilarious. His impression of Takasugi is so wrong, yet also so right, it's amazing. The same idea applies with Hijikata, who gets some just as good skits with him involved. This episode is quite the anomaly when put out of context since there are two more episodes after it, but when you know those two episodes came out three or so years later to promote the movie, it all makes sense. The first segment is continuing with the regular story, having been punished by the woman of Yoshiwara in a comedic fashion. It's good, it's funny, the second segment though, was supposed to serve as the last thing to ever be produced for the anime. Though the story wasn't finished yet, the crew made an anime original segment entirely so the staff could piss on Hideaki Sorachi, the original mangaka. You see, the the manga has a long problem of trying to end, but right as it was going to end, he introduced new things and characters and twists that had to be explored, and the anime staff had to keep up with that ever since 2015. Reminder, the manga ended in 2019. So this half episode is dedicated to shitting on and making fun of Sorachi for not ending the manga sooner and making the anime end on a weird note. Also, I just want to point out, you may notice by watching the anime that whenever Sorachi's gorilla persona shows up, the anime crew reuse a line where he says he wants to be a cheese bun, and that's because Sorachi didn't want to use his actual voice, but was tricked into saying the line back in 2006. So the staff continually used it even now as just a big joke to mock him. If this were the actual ending, leaving some things unresolved so that you'd have to read the manga, I think Gintama fans would have either been incredibly pissed or moved to tears by the sheer trolling factor. But don't worry, this ain't the end. There's still two episodes from 2021 and the final movie to wrap everything up, so let's see how the story was actually meant to end. These two semi-finale episodes were also never released in the US for some reason, so excuse the poor quality. I couldn't find good footage anywhere. Even looking for Japanese Netflix and Hulu, it didn't return any results, so yeah, sorry. Gin continues going under his different aliases to not be noticed by the crew, meeting a few familiar faces and witnessing another terror attack from the immortality religion. It's mostly used for humor relating to the same kind of weird interactions Gin would have dressing as someone else, but unlike the last few episodes, this does try to have some sentiment at the end by showing the former Shin Sengumi and everyone else joining together, wanting to help Odd Jobs again and help him do whatever he's trying to accomplish as their final job. There's only one episode left in the anime after this, and since the final movie wrapping everything up hasn't come to America yet as of the writing of the script, I'm just gonna have to read the remaining six manga chapters and tell you what I think of it so that this can have some sort of conclusion. Well, here it is, the final episode of the Gintama anime. Of course, this series would end with an episode number including 69. There's still a little left to cover, which I'll do in a small section after this, but yeah, how's the episode? Well, it's about Kondo marrying and subsequently misinterpreting the apes from way back in the Yagyu arc and accidentally crashing to Earth along with the Immortality Cult to fight alongside everyone else. What more could you really ask for? It's pure Gintama and Gin isn't even in the episode. Kondo is as funny as ever, and the shit with gorillas is probably never gonna stop being comedy gold to me. Now then, how did the manga end it all? What can I even say? 
It had basically everything to be a truly exceptional ending to an exceptional franchise. Dealing with the themes of control of oneself and the meaning behind why someone chooses to do something at all, Gin and everyone else rush into the ship of the Tendoshu, carrying Shoyo's heart to kill the body and save Earth from destruction. The best part of this finale slash climax section has to be the interaction between Gin, Shoyo, Takasugi, Oboro, and Utsuro. To explain, Takasugi reaches the body first, which has regenerated some thanks to the Alta given, but it's also shown to be Shoyo rather than Utsuro. Takasugi, on the other hand, seems to be controlled by Utsuro, who's supposedly taken over thanks to Takasugi ingesting the ashes that contained his blood. So Utsuro believes he's won by getting the Tendoshu to revive Shoyo in a mortal form so that Utsuro can kill him using Takasugi's body, plunging Gin into despair over having to kill his friend now after his master has already been slain. That's not what happens, though. In the context of the narrative, the first people we're told were controlled by Utsuro from the start were the Tendoshu, from this religion to the revival, and so on, because they had the blood within them. This raises the question of who truly has free will, and who's being controlled by Utsuro to fit his demands. To him, it seems obvious that everyone, including Takasugi, would be just like that, but as is shown in previous episodes, Utsuro is unable to or chooses not to understand the human heart and will, fearing their ability to band together under a common cause to support one another. He doesn't grasp that Takasugi and the others aren't just puppets that he can mess with as he pleases, absorbing them like food, but rather, they're their own people who have help from those that care about them, something Utsuro has never experienced constantly being tortured. And Takasugi in the end was helped to control himself by Oboro, who also existed in the ashes Takasugi consumed. Instead deciding to mortally wound himself then attack Shoyo as Utsuro wanted, Takasugi chose to use his own free will to let himself die so the others could live, killing Utsuro after, at around the same time, his immortal heart was destroyed. The same kind of decision occurs with Shoyo, who uses uses his remaining power to stop the Earth from being destroyed by the raging Altana, letting himself also die in the process, two wonderfully complex characters dying for noble reasons in the name of others. What better way could they have died? On the front about who people are and why they choose to do things, it's much more simple but just as profound as the complexity of the human will. Gin and the odd jobs were never just doing whatever for money because they had nothing to do, but because they wanted to. They knew from the start that everyone around them completed them and made them want to strive for more in life, so they stuck around. That can be applied to the main three, the supporting cast, really everyone that's banded together in their final moments to help save the world from destruction. Whether it's saving the planet or helping a woman cross the street, as long as they're all together to do it, the odd jobs will always feel like they have a place to belong. And that's how Sadaharu comes back. He was just waiting for that home, which had split two years ago, to come back together as a family. It's little things like that which really show just how great Gintama as a whole really is. The coziness. The simplicity. The feeling like a family can come from anywhere. The heartache. The loss. The sorrow felt from losing someone important in an instant. The gaining of something new you never thought was there. The new self those new things help to form. The home to come back to. The ability to make half of your final chapter serious and gritty and the other half joking about how everyone is ruining the finale and making it worse. That's Gintama, a show that builds on its own narrative over and over again, never losing steam but rather gaining new depths and insights as it keeps going. I'm really impressed by just how consistently great Gintama is from start to finish, and how it's evolved to be something so much more than I ever could have thought it would when I started this marathon, while also still remaining the same as it ever was. If you haven't watched Gintama, well, I guess in a way you just watch through the whole thing in a condensed way, but really, it's an experience that changes your entire perception of anime in general, and all covered in a ton of shit and dick jokes. There really is no series quite like it. Well, at this point, there's only really one thing left to do after all is said and done. Rank that shit! Without further ado, every episode ranked from best to worst across 369 episodes. Gintama is known for their episodes having exceedingly long titles, so please pray for me. Entering the final chapter, nothing lasts forever, including parents, money, youth, your room, dress shirts, me, you, and the Gintama anime. The other side of the other side of the other side would be the other side. Countdown begins. Love is often played out in sudden death. Don't complain about your job at home, do it somewhere else. A life without gambling is like sushi without wasabi. When nagging goes too far, it becomes intimidating. When sleeping under a kotatsu, make sure you don't burn your balls. Keep an eye on the chief for the day. That Matsutake soup stuff tastes better than the real deal. A bowl of ramen. We're sorry. 
Even a hero has issues. Adults only. We wouldn't want anyone immature in here. Are there still people who go to the ocean and yell out, Bakiyaro? It's your house. You build it. Love is unconditional. Two is better than one. Two people are better than one. The claws of a crab can snap through a friendship. You guys, do you even have a Gintama? Part 1. Responsible owners should clean up after their pets. New Year's envelopes are perfect for dirty jokes. Love is a roach motel. Cooking is about guts. A phoenix rises from the ashes over and over. Before worrying about the earth, think about the even more endangered future of Gintaman. Make characters so anybody can tell who they are just by their silhouettes. Don't panic, there's a return policy. A sizzle summer. You don't stand in line for the ramen, you stand in line for the self-satisfaction. People forget to return stuff all the time without even realizing it. Kids don't understand how their parents feel. Look, overly sticky sweet dumplings are not real dumplings, you idiot. If a friend gets injured, take him to the hospital, stat. Be a person who can see people's strong points and not their weak points. What happens twice can happen thrice. Don't be shy, just raise your hand and say it. An inspector's love begins with an inspection. From a foreigner's perspective, you're the foreigner. From an alien's perspective, you're the alien. Beware of food you pick up off the ground. They say soy sauce on pudding tastes like sea urchin, but soy sauce on pudding only tastes like pudding in soy sauce. Rules are made to be broken. Being a leader is tough. A shared soup pot is a microcosm of life. Pets resemble their owners. Why is the sea so salty? Because your city folk pee whenever you go swimming. One editor is enough, slash the G-pin is capricious and the Maru-pin is stubborn. You guys, do you even have a Gintama? Part 2. Even mummy hunters sometimes turn into mummies. I'm a failure as a leader, and he's also a failure as a leader. People with dark pasts can't shut up. When breaking a Chubert in half, the end with the knob should be better. It's also tasty to drink from there. Eat something sour when you're tired. When looking for things you've lost, remember what you were doing on the day you lost it. Good things never come in twos, but bad things do. Eating Maibo can make you full in no time. Hometowns and boobs are best fought from afar. Love doesn't require a manual. Continued. Hard-boiled eggs on a man's heart. Keep your promise even if it kills you. You only gotta wash under your armpits. Just the armpits. You'll get sued if all you do is copy others. Presents are meant to be given early. When you're in a fix, keep on laughing, laughing. Any place with a bunch of men gathered around will turn into a battlefield. Mom's busy too, so quit complaining about what's for dinner. When riding a train, make sure you grab the straps with both hands. 99% of men aren't confident in confessing their love. A mirror provides a frozen reflection of both your beautiful and ugly sides, slash nobody likes the photo on their license. Laputa's still good after seeing it so many times. The more delicious the food, the nastier it is when it goes bad. Rhinoceros beetles teach boys that life is precious. Japanese restaurants abroad taste pretty much like school cafeteria lunches. Even teen idols act like you guys. Sleep helps a child grow, for the wind is the life. Whenever I hear Leviathan, I think of Sazai-san, stupid me. A reunion also brings to the surface things you don't want to remember. Summer vacation is the most fun right before it begins. Guys with big nostrils also have big imaginations, slash, you never accept a new Sentai series at the start, but by the final episode, you don't want it to end. Two in girl years is equal to ten in men years. Life is a test. Hard-boiled eggs don't crack. Some things are better left unsaid. People who say that Santa doesn't really exist actually want to believe in him. Give a thought to planned pregnancy. Curtison turns the tables. Dango over flowers. Mothers everywhere are all the same. Not losing to the rain. Farewell Shinsengumi Part 4, Prison Break. If you want to see something, make an oppo first. Fights often ensue during trips. You can never pause at the perfect time. It's what's on the inside that counts. A family. There is but a fine line between persistence and stubbornness. Walk your dog at an appropriate speed. Please help by separating your trash. Don't put your wallet in your back pocket. If you want to lose weight, then stop eating and start moving. Don't make munching noises when you eat. Not losing to the wind. The preview section in Jump is always unreliable. Gin and his excellency's good for nothings. So in the second season of Prison Break, they've already broken out of prison, but the name works once you realize that society is a prison. What happens twice, happens thrice. Briefs will unavoidably get skid marks. Even a Matsui stick can't handle some kinds of dirt. I can't remember a damn thing about the factory tour. Novices only need a flathead and a Phillips. Milk should be served at body temperature. You can't judge a movie by its title. When compared to Time in the Heavens, 50 years of human life resembles not but dreams and lottery tickets. Leave letter. Peace and destruction are two sides of the same coin. Odds or evens. Watch out, Weekly Shun Jump sometimes comes out on Saturdays. Definitely do not let your girlfriend and see the things you use for cross-dressing. Draw your life on the canvas we call manga. Stress makes you bald, but it's stressful to avoid stress, so you end up stressed out, so in the end there's nothing you can do. 3,000 leagues in search of a scabbard. We are all hosts, in capital letters. If one orange in the box is rotten, the rest of them will become rotten before you realize. Zip up your fly nice and slowly. The monster and the monster's child. Speaking of crossovers, don't forget about Alien vs. Predator. He's the sweet tooth and I'm the mayo guy. Always keep a screwdriver in your heart. Beware of those who use an umbrella on a 
sunny day. Jump and power creep go hand in hand. The most exciting part of a group date is before it starts. Forget dates, remember people, and you can hide your porn bags, but you can't hide your bleep. It takes a bit of courage to enter a street vendor stand. The Song of Samurai. Ogres are weak against tiny humans like the inch high samurai. 9 plus 1 equals Yagyu Jubei. It all depends on how you use the carrot and stick method. Like a haunted house, life is filled with horrors. Calories come back to bite you just when you've forgotten about them. Rank has nothing to do with it. People of all ages hate the dentist. Marriage is prolonging an illusion for your whole life. Too many cuties can make you sick. When looking for something, try using its perspective. Cute faces are always hiding something. That person looks different from usual during a birthday party. The super sadist and the super sadist. Afros of life and death. If you stop and think about it, your life's a lot longer as an old guy than a kid. Whoa, scary. The man's household situation is hard, his heart is soft. My bald dad, my light-haired dad, and my dad's glasses. Only children play in the snow. If you're a man, try the swordfish. Yesterday's enemy, after all is said and done, is still the enemy. Exaggerate the tales of your exploits by a third so everyone has a good time. The stairs to adulthood may not always lead up. The people you tend to forget tend to show up after you forget them. Bragging about your own heroic deeds will make people hate you, so make others do it for you. Butting into a fight is dangerous, not losing to the storm. People are all escapees of their own inner prisons. Nobody with naturally wavy hair can be that bad. In those situations, keep quiet and cook red rice with beans. Glasses prevent you from seeing certain things. Arriving late to a reunion makes it hard to enter. It's bad luck to see a spider at night. Changing the toilet cleanses the soul. Flavoring is best in small quantities. Think for a minute now, do Matsutake mushrooms really taste all that good? Do cherries come from cherry trees? Blue and red ecstasy. Glasses are part of the soul. Freedom means to live true to yourself, not without law. The human body is like a little universe. Always leave enough room for 50 million in your bag. The taste of drinking under broad daylight is something special. A lawless town tends to attract a bunch of hoo hooey folk. Imagination is nurtured in the 8th grade. Wash your hands before a handshake. Some things can only be conveyed through the written word. Inside the palace. It's too confusing when talking about the poster girl for a poster store, so call her a sandwich board. The sharpest sword and the dullest sword. Smooth polygons, smooth men's hearts too. Beware of foreshadows. It's good once a flag is set. Everybody loves pajamas. The two apes. If you're a man, don't give up. The black ships even make a scene when they sink. The line between godlike games and crappy games is paper thin, slash glasses are a part of the soul. Dog food doesn't have as much flavor as you'd think. Jugem. Bushido is found one second before death. People who make good first impressions usually suck. The older, the wiser. A conversation with a barber during a haircut is the most pointless thing in the world. The heavens create a con mage above man instead of another man. Meals should be balanced. Girls like Vegeta, guys like Piccolo. Play video games for only an hour a day. Some things can't be cut with a sword. Space Ururun Homestay. Rabbits sleep higher on moonlit nights. An idol's badge of honor. Farewell Shinsengumi Arc Part 3, Lost and Found. Don't spread the wrapping cloth without thinking ahead. Ramen shops with long menus never do well. Watch out for a set of women and a drink. Machines that pick up useless habits are called people. Even if your back is bent, go straight forward. People who are picky about food are picky about people too. Luck is a man who gets up and goes to work. If you're going to cosplay, go all out. Diamonds are unscratchable. Afro and Wolfro. Always leave enough room for pebbles in your bag. Screw popularity polls. Don't trust bedtime stories. Use a calligraphy pen for New Year's cards. Life moves on like a conveyor belt. Kabukicho Stray Cat Blues. Love doesn't require a manual. Try as you might to make a natural perm go away, it will always return. The evildoers who do good. Don't make up your mind right before the important decision. I'm Eurosia, and he's Shinsengumi. It would take too much effort to make this title sound like a text message subject. Popularity polls can burn in hell. Style goes out of fashion the moment it's put into words, slash, there are two types of people in this world, those who yell out their attack names and those who don't. Guardian spirits are also a part of the soul. 10 minus 1 equals? If you can't beat them, join them. Beauty is like a summer fruit. Those who stand on four legs are beasts. Those who stand on two legs, guts, and glory are men. The Reaper by day and the Reaper by night. Santa Claus red is blood red. Men must live not long nor thick, but hard. Popularity polls can... Spectre. The more you're alike, the more you fight. The line between tenacious and annoying is paper thin. Take the initial premise lightly, and it'll cost you. Life, death, and shades, slash, all the answers can be found in the field. Amen.
Watch out for conveyor belts. A dog's paws smell fragrant. Pending means pending, it's not final. The more something is disliked, the more lovely it is. Never losing that smile. Fighting should be done with fists. Sound of beam can pierce heart of everyone. Otaku are talkative. Check it out. All adults are instructors for all children. Love is neither plus nor minus. Be careful not to leave your umbrella somewhere. Piggy banks and trash cans. Make friends you can call by their nicknames, even when you're an old fart. Shogun Assassination Arc Part 1, Shoguns of Light and Shadow. It's often difficult to sleep when you're engrossed with counting sheep. Be very careful when using ghost stories. Nobody with naturally straight hair can be that bad, slash, nobody with straight blonde hair can be that good. The chosen idiots. That's how the end of the year goes. Human or demon. Kentoki and Gintoki. Cat lovers and dog lovers are mutually exclusive. Once you're entangled in a spider web, it's hard to get it off. It's all about the beat and timing. The name reveals the person and into the legend. The manga writer becomes a pro after doing a stock of manuscripts. Shogun Assassination Arc Part 2, Ninja Village. Min, be a Madao. Empty planet. Let's talk about the old days once in a while. Making it through love. 10 years. Croquette sandwiches are always the most popular food sold at the stalls. Countless Kings. The Two Fools. Shogun Assassination Arc Part 4, and then there were five. Farewell Shinsengumi Arc Part 2, heroes always arrive fashionably late. Sign. That's how I wish to be, beautiful and strong. Thorny and Rosie, strike when the sword and overlord are hot slash oil rain. Making a dull world interesting. The unemployed cannot be stained by anything, Zura. Please take me skiing. Shogun Assassination Arc Part 3, Ninja Soul. Geezers carve the things that they shouldn't forget into their wrinkles. Kinsan's Kintama, some data cannot be erased. With each box of cigarettes are one or two cigarettes that smell like horse dung. Don't say goodbye, Lionel. Everybody's a Santa. If it works once, it'll work over and over again. Sometimes you can't tell just by meeting someone. Everyone looks pretty grown up after summer break. Farewell Shinsengumi Arc Part 9, Farewell Shinsengumi. Oh yeah, our crib is number one. When you go to a funeral for the first time, you're surprised by how happy the people are. The sun will rise again. Keep your farewells short. The bathhouse, where you're naked in body and soul. Festival of Thornies. Mistaking someone's name is rude. Farewell Shinsengumi Arc Part 1. The day the demon cried. Everyone looks a little grown up after spring break. Master of Cohen. All mothers pack too much food into a lunchbox and ruin the shape. Farewell Shinsengumi Arc Part 5. Stray Dogs. A vacation in disorientation. Paths. Five pinkies. Sons only take after their father's negative attributes. Life is a series of choices. It's the irresponsible ones who's scary when pissed. Pinky swear. Always hold on to your trump cards. An observation journal should be seen through to the very end. Madao dog, Madao nair. You know what happens if you pee on a worm. You always remember the things that matter the least. Letter from Thorny. On a moonless night, insects are drawn to the light. Farewell, Reaper. Two brothers. Perform a German suplex on a woman who asks if she or the job is more important. Farewell, Shinsengumi Arc Part 7. Karma. Dun dun. Farewell Shinsengumi Arc Part 6, Undelivered Mail. A delinquent's kid has long neck hair. The color for each person's bond comes in various colors. Shogun Assassination Arc Part 6, Those Who Protect Against All Odds. Liquor and gasoline, smiles and tears, the meaning of a main character. There's a thin line between strength and weakness. Four heads are better than one. There are lines even villains can't cross. Iron Town. Shogun Assassination Arc Part 7, The Crow's Caw After the Battle Ends. Unsetting Moon. Important things are hard to see. When someone who wears glasses takes them off, it looks like something's missing. Salvation. Tis an honor. Ghosts aren't the only ones who run wild around gravestones. Life in video games are full of bugs. Shogun Assassination Arc Part 8. Farewell, buddy. Farewell Shinsengumi Arc Part 8. Nobume. The Lost Rabbit. Hope. Sometimes you must meet to understand. Do something uncharacteristic, and something uncharacteristic will happen. There are a few things you're not supposed to forget. A woman's best makeup is her smile. The more precious the burden, the heavier and more difficult it is to shoulder. Siblings. Chains of a warrior. Shogun Assassination Arc Part 6, Sworn Enemy. People can only live by forgetting the bad. The creatures known as humanity, and finally, first student. To continue the rankings just a little bit further, my top three characters are Gen, Hasegawa, and not to mention, my boy, the best boy. Katsura. My favorite opening is Tangenkyo Alien, and my favorite episode is episode 240. With all that said, if you made it this far, I guess all I can say now is, thanks for watching. If you like this, maybe I can do some more long form, though definitely not as long as this, type of videos. Or even just more Gintama videos, like covering the animated and live action movies or something. I don't know. Whatever I do next, I'll be sure to see you all in the next video, after I have a long, long sleep. Peace!